Welcome to the Autodromo Internacional do Algarve, where the second day of Winter Series action is about to kick off. It's our second weekend of the season. Uh, six weekends total this, our final event of January. And how exciting to be here at, at long last, a sunny Autodromo Internacional do Algarve. We didn't have much of that during the week in pre-event testing, but the race days have been blessed with perfect weather conditions. We have Lucas Gajewski and uh, Chris McCarthy alongside myself, Adam Weller, uh, for the broadcast this weekend. And uh, look at the circuit that we have for you. The 4.665 15-turn Autodromo Internacional do Algarve opened at the tail end of the 2008 racing season. Huge elevation change, ups and downs. We will have some clouds today, but in general, it is going to be a picturesque time to be down in the south of Portugal with racing cars on the circuit. Almost no wind. Uh, that means the drivers have no excuse for running wide into the first corner. They can't blame any tailwind. Uh, but we are excited to bring you five races in total today. The GT4s have a pair of races, a half-hour sprint, followed uh, by an hour-long enduro later in the day. Uh, the Winter Series, the GT Winter Series, with much the same uh, one 30-minute sprint, followed by a 55-minute enduro. And then the prototypes have their second and final race of the weekend as well. 50 minutes plus one lap. So we are very much looking forward to getting the cars out there on the circuit. Grid procedure for the first race of the weekend, or first race of Sunday, I should say, uh, will be ongoing shortly. That will be race two of three uh, for the GT4 Winter Series, a race category that has so far provided a, a lion's share of the highlights uh, in the 2024 Winter Series calendar. And as you can see, the cars are rolling just as the clock hits 9 a.m. local time here uh, at the Autodromo Internacional do Algarve. Uh, great to see another strong entry list in the class, another 16 starters confirmed for the this weekend, albeit with some new additions, some uh, subtractions and additions to the entry list, including uh, what is now a veritable armada of uh, Bavarian machines from BMW, uh, the Razoon More Than Racing and Speedy Motorsport cars uh, from last time being joined by uh, Gianni van der Kratz for this race in the FK Performance uh, 187 car, another of the M4 GT4s, and Hofer Racing by Bonk Motorsport uh, also entering a car. So there's... Uh, Plenty of uh, BMWs, of course, the Porsche Caymans, always popular, not just within the GT4 class, but also within the Cayman Trophy, which runs for the uh, VLN spec or the NLS spec uh, Caymans that are slightly sub uh, GT4 performance. We've got uh, lots of exciting talents as well. I shared a car with one of them this morning. Roberto Farrier took a little bit of a lift with the media team, and there he comes now uh, out of the pit. So we look forward to well welcoming everybody to pit lane of course once well what to the grid i should say and once uh, they are on the grid lucas gajewski will be there to talk us through uh, the grid for the first time talk to some of the drivers uh, for the first time in the broadcast i'll be up here in the commentary booth lucas gajewski will be your man on the ground Chris McCarthy will be providing podiums and uh, having a chat during the pit walk as well, I'm sure. It's going to be a fast and frenetic five races. And uh, a thank you to the Alpha Live team for uh, some of the wonderful stuff that we've had uh, on the stream so far this weekend. And I know that this camera point uh, is one of two uh, operated by the same man. So early in the day, I'm going to thank Daryl Bennett now uh, for running two cameras from the same same platform on the same weekend uh, the geography of Portimao allowing that to happen as well so thank you to the architects that built the circuit uh, but uh, Daryl Bennett putting in double shift I am I am told absolutely not for double pay uh, but uh, he is putting in a hell of a shift as everyone is uh, here in the Alpha Live and Giedlick Racing crews uh, to bring you this winter series package in full and in live living color for the very first time we've dabbled in live streaming before but this is by far the best and most consistent live streaming that this series has ever had and it's a joy to bring you this action 
So this will be a 30 minute race uh, in the GT4 Winter Series. A healthy mix of endurance and sprint racing to come today. But uh, we will now go uh, to the first sprint of the day for the GT4 Winter Series. From start and finish down here just as well. Great pleasure to have you along. We had a very nice crowd already yesterday for day one of action here at Portimao and we are ready for day two here at the Algarve. It's a lovely day for multiple reasons and especially for this. Look at it. It's spiced cookies, speculatius, as we say back in Germany, where the Gietlich Racing Organization are from, and myself just as well. And I can tell you these usually disappear from the shelves of the shop pretty much the day after Christmas. But it seems that here in Portugal, you can still get them in mid-January, which is absolutely fabulous. So there's one reason to join the uh, GT Winter Series. And of course, there are plenty of others. It's a fabulous day of racing coming up. We've got the GT Winter Series, the Prototype Winter Series, and of course, the new GT4 Winter Series for this year. So let's take the uh, spiced cookies on the first grid walk of the day and introduce you to the first time pole setters in the 2024 season. Mikey Porter aboard the Forsetti Motorsport Aston Martin yesterday, and today it's going to be Jamie Day driving the second sprint race of the weekend. Race director Van I still next to Jamie with a bit of a briefing before the uh, rolling start, of course, in case of the GT4 Winter Series. And then, of course, <laughs> we'd like to have a word with Jamie as well. Jamie, winner, of course, of the opening round, but now it's the first pole position for you and your team. What are your expectations for today, then? Uh, just looking to have a clean race and then uh, just see how it unfolds on lap one. And just from there on, just get my head down and see what we can do. Obviously, the aim is to win, but... Uh, We'll just take it lap by lap and see what happens, to be honest. And we've seen brilliant fights in the leading group yesterday. Can we expect more of that today? Uh, we'll see at the end of lap one and uh, see what happens, see where we come out. And if there needs to be a battle, there will be one. Cheers, Jamie. Best of luck. So there's your pole setter, the Forsetti Motorsport Aston Martin car number 19. Alongside is going to be yesterday's winning car, the uh, Schnitzel Arm Racing car of Joel Mash. That's now going to be driven by the uh, second driver of that team, Marcel Marshevitz. However, let's head down the grid. As you know, in GT4 Winter Series, there are various categories. We've got pro cars, we've got pro ams, we've got ams, and of course, the so called Cayman Trophy, just as as well, there is Leo Pichlis and Andreas Hofler's car, one of the Caymans, entered in pro class. Alongside is the uh, Wimmerwerk Cayman, so quite many Porsches. Uh, however, Johnny, let's speed this up a bit. As you know, in motorsport, it's always about timing, isn't it? And further down the order, we have one of the uh, FK performance BMW cars, as we've got three minutes left. We're still good, I'm afraid. So that's all right. And let's try to speak to their driver in the uh, FK Performance BMW because after you've seen Rihanna O'Meara, the Canadian racer, yesterday, today it's going to be Gianni van der Graatz, young Dutch racer, making his, I'm not sure if it's his debut in GT4 machinery, but he's definitely one of the young guns as we try to have a quick word. And it is the number 187 BMW. There we go. Goedemorgen, Johnny. Hope everything's going well. Is it your debut, I think, in GT4 machinery today? Yeah, it's uh, my first race in GT4. Um, yeah, just uh, happy to be here and uh, excited for the race. And what is your expectation? How much testing could you do over the past few days here in Portimao? Yeah, we had a few days of testing, but um, yeah, we will see how it goes and uh, I will try my best and then uh, we will see where we end up. 
best of luck, Johnny. Thank you very much. So there's your first time GT4 racer, Johnny van der Graat, uh, young Dutch driver, uh, used to race in BMW M2 machinery in various championships, and now it's going to be his first time in GT4 cars. We are very excited now. As many of you will know, there are some two driver pairings in GT4 Winter Series. We've seen driver one yesterday, and now it's either going to be driver two or driver one again and then we will have the second driver only in the uh, one hour endurance race later on today so this is definitely something to look forward to just as well as is coming up next race number two here's a short app break and then it's going to be adam weller in the commentary box for race number two of the gt4 winter series live from portimao So then two lights on top of the gantry means we are just moments away from rolling for the first time this weekend in the GT, or for the first time today, uh, in the GT4 Wind Series. Saturday did happen and I was there, I promise. Uh, but Sunday morning, first racing, about to get started and uh, very excited to see quite how this one works out it's a good looking grid in terms of uh, competitive drivers together in the same patch of tarmac jamie day starting from pole position the only driver in qualifying two yesterday to dip below the 150 barrier he's ahead of marcel marshavix in third place is leo pichler in the pro-am class porsche cayman alongside of course ivan ekelchik as uh, as lucas was showing us just now an all Porsche second row of the grid. Zach Meekin in the McLaren from Elite Motorsport, the 78 car starting from P5. This is one of his favorite tracks in the world. And he told me that earlier in the week. Roberto Faria starting from P6. Let's see if he picked up any tips from Emilio on the drive over to the circuit this morning. Emil Yerdrum starting from seventh place in the Pro-Am Mercedes AMG GT4. Enrico Ferdera starting from P8 as well. Keep an eye on the number 110 car. Ferdera is a very quick youngster. Alberto Di Martin, the AM pole sitter for NM Racing Team. He's alongside his teammate Max Huber on row five in the Mercedes AMG GT4s. Thomas Rackle is next in the uh, number 111, another of the Cayman Trophy cars. Richard Wolf in the Razoon BMW starting from 12th place. Gianni van der Kratz is next in the 187 car, the reigning BMW M2 Racing Cup. Benelux champion in his first GT4 race. Luis Liberal is next. He'll be looking to build upon a strong start to the season in AM uh, at Estoril. Franz Linden in just his second day of being a racing driver. He starts from 15th place and Martin Kroll rounding out our 16 car order for this one. So then we are going to go racing in just a few short moments and very excited to see quite how this one plays out. Marcel Martovic in his first race of the season after he was uh, unable to join us in Estoril. Travel uh, issues uh, scarpering his plans to compete at Estoril. He'll have a point to prove he is a GT Winter Series champion back when the GT4s and the Caymans were also on the main GT Winter Series grid. Of course, Leo Pichler always a force to be wet reckoned with. Vimmerwerk Motorsport come into this weekend with something of uh, a chip on the shoulder because they didn't have many great results uh, in the race uh, on uh, either of the days at Estoril. So fourth place for Ivan Ekelchik. He'll be looking uh, to make a point in this race. Roberto Faria feeling optimistic for a podium from row three. Zach Meekin loves this circuit as well. I think at a bare minimum, this race could go any of six ways in terms of the overall victory. And then, of course, the Pro-Am and battles, the Cayman Trophy battles. This race is going to be a spoil of riches, I think, when it comes to on-track action. 30 minutes of racing about to kick off. 
Winter Series Sunday is upon us at the Autodromo Internacional do Algarve. They will drive up this slight incline over the crest. Then green lights will alright them as we go racing for the first time. The lights are out in just a few moments. Now they are out and we are racing for the first time. We ride on board from the outside of the front row there with Marcel Martovic, but it's Jamie Day that leads them into the first corner. Jamie Day at the front of the pack. The Cayman still side by side for third. I think a little bit of tripping up from further back in the field. Uh, but a good start from everybody. Everybody's staying out of trouble through the first couple of corners. Marcel Martovic's trying to get to the inside at turn four. That wasn't quite going to work out for him. And I think as they come over the hill, Leo Pitchler will probably be looking for a way past at turn five. Yes, he is on the inside. He is in second place as they approach the hairpin for the first time. Pitchler up to P2. Ekelschik up to third place as well. Marcel Martovic side by side with the fast starting Roberto Faria, the NM Racing Team. Mercedes AMG GT4 using all the runoff in the world there on the first lap of the race. Farrier around the outside of Martovic, but Martovic braver on the brakes into turn eight, leaning on the young Brazilian and carbon fiber flying. Now that is probably an end plate off the Aston Martin, unfortunately, and that means a little bit less aero on these cars, and there's not a lot of aero to start with. So he might be a little bit hampered by that little moment there. A dramatic start then to the race as we get underway. We ride on board with Marcel Martovic now in fourth position behind Ivan Ekelczyk, behind the two Pro-Am class Caymans. Of course, if you're new to this style of racing, Pro, Pro-Am and Am, all three classes are GT4 spec cars, no spec difference. And both Leo Pichler and Ivan Ekelczyk are the pro drivers in their respective cars. So there's no shame at all in being behind them. However, everyone wants to be on that overall podium. So Marcel Martovic will no doubt come back into this one. We've got smoke billowing there from, is that potentially Martovic? Maybe some tire rub after the contact with Farrier earlier in the lap. Uh, both cars carrying a little bit of damage. You can see there's something loose there on the back uh, of the number 11 Schnitzelau Mercedes AMG GT4. Leo Pichler, meanwhile, closing in on the Aston Martin from Forsetti Motorsport. Forsetti Motorsport in just their second weekend as an active racing team on a racing weekend. Jamie Day, of course, responsible for winning their first ever race. Uh, in their first ever attempt, which was hugely impressive, and he leads once again. But Leo Pichler, the driver that started on pole in that famous first race at Estoril, will be looking to uh, try and really avenge what happened to him in that race at Estoril. He ended up finishing in, what, P4, P5, and uh, he did not really enjoy that from pole position. Here comes Marcel Martovic then. Clearly, if there was a little bit of tyre rub, it's not slowing him down at all. Ivan Ekelczyk might be, though, as they go through turns nine and ten the fast flowing section of this circuit Ekelchik just going defensive we ride on board with Marshevix then he's right on the boot lid of that Porsche Cayman the four liter GT4 RS CS the third generation Cayman GT4 car Marcel Marshevix trying to go to the outside here as they run through turn 14 of 15 can he carry the pace through the corner Oh, he's trying his best, but the Porsche's still there. And uh, Ekelczyk retains third position. Great close quarters racing between the two of them. Of course, they've got to be careful because Roberto Farrier is still there. Zach Meekin isn't far behind either. Seventh overall is Enrico Ferdera in the slightly sub-GT4 spec Cayman. So he's having a good run just ahead of Richard Wolf, the AM class leader. But it is Jamie Day from Hufler, uh, for Jamie Day from Leo Pischler from Ivan Ekelczyk at the front of the order. It is Leo Pischler in the 77 car. Close quarters, as we said, between Wimmer Werk and Schnitzelaum here in the early stages in this battle for third place. This, of course, is allowing Jamie Day and Leo Pischler to just disappear up the road while these guys scrap. I'm sure that uh, Vimmerwerk will be willing on their superstar, as they call him. Ivan Ekelczyk, they were very impressed with some of his performances 
uh, in Estoril. He's carried that form on to Portimao. Marshavik's a driver with plentiful experience, not just in the GT Winter Series, uh, but of course, that is where a number of us are most familiar with him. He's a regular in the NLS series with Schnitzel Alm, uh, often in a GT3 car in recent times. And of course, this 11 car has not finished off the podium so far in the 2023, uh, sorry, the 2024 GT Winter Series. So there's a little bit of pride at stake here, I would say. Looking to the inside line there as Leo Pichler, or rather as Ivan Ekelczyk, squeezes the number 11 car. It is Marcel Marshavix pressuring the back of the 24. Farrier and Meekin looking a little bit closer this time by. I just wonder uh, what it's going to take for it to become a four-car battle. I suspect that uh, one run through the likes of turn one side by side will turn it into a four-car scrum for that podium position in the overall standings. Jamie Day, meanwhile, managing at the front of the order. Leo Pichler 1.6 seconds back from him now. Fastest lap of the race was the previous lap from Jamie Day, so he is on good form here in the early going. The 11 car sizing up, and that was a good line through turn four from Marcel Martovic. He's going to have good momentum coming over the brow of this hill. Sure enough, he is on the inside line. He's not quite alongside the Porsche. He still lunges in, and he gets that third place, or does he? Because Ekelchik tries to hold on around the outside, but it's in vain. Martovic then up to third place, at least momentarily. They're still side by side. And <laughs> Martovic just about holds on to it. Great racing between the pair of them. Now it's Roberto Farrier looking to try and find a way past Ivan Ekelchik as they go uh, down now towards turn nine of this 15-turn lap. And it is now a four-car cluster as they drop downhill. Good battle on for seventh as well. Enrico Ferdera and Charles Dawson there in their Cayman and Pro-Am class cars, respectively. Dawson dives up the inside for P7 there. Very nicely done uh, by the Brit in the CV Performance Group Mercedes AMG GT4. You see in the back of shot there that he did in fact make it stick. So uh, up to seventh place goes Charles Dawson. It would be amazing if he could get onto the back of this queue of cars. Charles... Uh, well, actually, sorry, it's Emil Yerdrum at the wheel. My apologies, the uh, the TV graphics tripping me there. It's Emil Yerdrum at the wheel of the 85 car for this second race. So perhaps not a surprise that the young uh, Norwegian racer is making his way up the pack. Uh, he is the pro of that Pro-Am element, uh, of that Pro-Am entry. Let's see if he can get onto the back of this battle then and maybe bring Enrico Ferdera with him. We'll wait, see, watch and learn as this race progresses. 22 minutes and 15 seconds still left to run. And Zach Meekin, I think, is actually biding his time a little bit, given we're not yet a third of the way through the race. Something tells me he's just spectating right now, just keeping an eye on the situation from a close distance and waiting for the seas to part in front of him. That is not a bad strategy, uh, given some of the racing we've seen so far in the GT4 Winter Series. Uh, but now that uh, the 11 car is through, now that Marcel Martovic is through, uh, it does look as though he's starting to just get a car length or two over Ivan Ekelschik. So Ekelschik maybe not quite with the same kind of pace uh, that uh, we were expecting. He might be falling a little bit off the back of Martovic, but... Uh, well, the tell, I think the telling sign will be if uh, Farrier can get past. Of course, Farrier does have a little bit of front-end damage. I think some of the aerodynamic parts on the front of that Aston Martin have been severed. So if the Aston is still able to challenge the Porsche, then maybe the Porsche is not quite on song for Ekelschik in this stage of the race. Farrier did say he's got a good race car underneath him. He was feeling confident for the chances of a podium. But as you can see, that right front... Uh, uh, flare that end plate is uh, is missing. So then the cars go through the long turn 15 for what will be the fifth time in this race. They'll start lap six this time. That's a lot of understeer for Farrier. That did not look normal in the slightest. Now. 
Is something wrong with that number nine Aston Martin or was that just Farrier trying to go flat through a corner that wasn't having it? Looks to me like that uh, left front might be a little bit askew, but I could be mistaken. Certainly it looks okay through the first corner, but that was a very wide berth taken by the driver of the Rakar number nine into the final corner. Now that might be because of that front aero damage, or it might be because he is uh, just struggling generally. We'll have to wait and see. It does look though as if uh, Zach Meekin may soon find a way past Farrier. He's getting closer and closer to the back of the Aston Martin. Elite Motorsport would love to get uh, another podium uh, on the board in this weekend. Finished fourth, second and 13th at Estoril, the 78 Elite Motorsport McLaren Archura. The 13th place an outlier because they uh, rolled the dice on uh, the track drying up uh, in the wet conditions during the Sunday sprint race. And unfortunately, when it, oh, sorry, the Sunday endurance race, I should say, and uh, the drivers did very well. Meekin and Leben, uh, on, in conditions that were never really slick friendly, managed to keep the car on circuit and at least register a good finish. Meekin, though, looking in for a way into the top five here as it stands. And there's Emil Yerdrum just behind them as well. Uh, looking like he's on relative pace with the pro drivers. It's just taking a little while to get up there. Uh, so he's actually going faster than both uh, the Vantage and the McLaren ahead of him. So uh, Emil Yerdrum outpacing Farrier, outpacing Meekin as well. So maybe he will be there before the end of the race, scrapping for the top five. Yerdrum certainly pushing on in the gold and black car. Mercedes AMG GT4, one of the most popular uh, GT4 platforms out there. Of course, Mercedes very successful in both GT3 and GT4 level racing, having a crack at GT2 as well these days. And uh, I think the uh, the successes of uh, the now departed Raffaele Marciello, who of course has now moved to BMW, uh, Jules Gounon, Maro Engel, uh, it, it's all stacking up to uh, the uh, to the benefit of Mercedes AMG uh, with their customer clients and the GT4 program success a great example of that here are the BMW GT4 cars then the uh, 81 resume more than racing car of Richard Wolf uh, being pursued uh, by Gianni van der Kratz who we uh, t spoke to on the pre-grid uh, with Lucas Gajewski his first run in a race in a GT4 car. Here's the second place in AM class battle. Max Huber uh, has now fallen behind Alberto Di Martin. That has happened since the beginning of the lap. So Di Martin uh, just ahead of Huber right now. This is a good performance for Alberto Di Martin at uh, Estoril. It seemed as though Huber was a step ahead uh, of the Spanish racer at all times. However, uh, this is not proving to be the case currently in this, uh, in this sprint race. Of course, in the endurance later on, Alberto Di Martin shares with Neil Montserrat, who uh, is a newly downgraded bronze driver, which I think he's uh, using to his advantage and enjoying very much being a bronze. Uh, the FIA grading system does open up opportunities when you get downgraded uh, as a quick driver. Here comes Mikael Sander then in the Cayman Trophy lead battle. Sander has closed in on Enrico Ferdera. So Ferdera being pursued by a much more experienced driver here, identical SR Motorsport Caymans, uh, the weapons of choice for both drivers. Sander, the GT Wind Series champion of 2021 and 2022, alongside Marcel Marshevix uh, in third place in this race overall. So he knows what he's doing. And uh, he is really pressuring the 16-year-old Enrico Ferdera, a successful carter in Germany. And to the inside goes Sander. Nice move, but cutting back is Enrico Ferdera there. Ferdera managing to uh, stave that one off nicely. And of course, as they continue to scrap, the BMWs behind them lurk ever closer. Such a disparity between the cars in size as Richard Wolf tags the back of Mikael Sander. And I think both of them have just about gotten away with that 
uh, in terms of uh, damage, but that was a little bit of a kiss between the BMW and the Porsche. That's given Enrico Ferdera a few car lengths and a little bit of breathing room. Of course, Richard Wolfe is in an AM-class car. The two cars ahead are in Cayman Trophy, and the 187 FK Performance BMW uh, is uh, in the Pro-Am class, but uh, that is uh, little detail, little matter uh, to these drivers fighting for these overall positions. Ferdera, though, with a little bit of an advantage now, but Mikhail Sander can easily get back to the rear of that Cayman within the next 14 minutes and 54 seconds of this race. Of that, I am certain. Wolf running very wide there. Richard Wolf didn't get uh, much running in before the weekend. I think he was only confirmed to enter the race on either Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, but, of course, most of the team's weekday running uh, here at the race test on Tuesday and Wednesday in the Winter Series uh, pre-event test on Thursday and Friday was sort of consigned to the day to scrap heat because, well, it was wet and then we arrived on race day and it was dry. Uh, so Richard Wolf may not be at quite the disadvantage that one would expect for not being here as much as those around him. Great drone shot here as we have another move for the Cayman Trophy lead. We saw them side by side, and it is once again the 111 car back ahead, isn't it? Yes, it is. And they're side by side, and my apologies to Thomas Rackle, because it's Thomas Rackle at the wheel, and uh, the 110 car of Enrico Ferdera just getting back through Thomas Rackle. Uh, it is not Mikhail Sander in the 111 car, so my apologies for that. Got conflicting information in front of me, but it is uh, Thomas Rackle at the wheel. And Rackle is challenging Ferdera around the outside. That is a full commitment move around the outside. This young man is also making his uh, car racing debut, much like Ferdera uh, in the early stages of his car racing career. And they're both scrapping hard. And oh, goodness me, a little too close for comfort there with Richard Wolfe, the 111 car being turned in on him there. Thomas Rackle uh, just uh, cutting uh, the nose off the BMW and a, a bit of the quarter panel as well, I think, there. But uh, all four cars continue on, albeit with a change for 10th place because uh, Gianni van der Kratz has gotten through. So then the cars coming across the start line. We're on lap 10 of the race now. At the front of the order, it is all somewhat stabilized, which is why we're following this great battle between the Porters and the BMWs. Richard Wolf very wide there at turn one. Uh, at the front of the pack, it is Jamie Day leading by some 4.3 seconds. Uh, then about three seconds further back from Leo Pichler in second place is our third place man, Marcel Marcevic. In fourth place uh, is Ivan Ekelschik uh, in the Wimmerwerk Motorsport car. Fifth place, Roberto Farrier uh, in the Rakar Motorsport machine. Still about 1.6 seconds clear of Zach Meekin in the McLaren Artura. Uh, although they are both being closed in, it must be said by Emil Yerdrum, who is now within a second of the McLaren Artura. So Yerdrum is on a mission uh, in the 85 car. Emil Yerdrum on a mission in that machine. So then the two Porsche Caymans at very, very close quarters through turn 11 and into 12. Now, last time these two were close, it got a bit feisty with the BMW behind them. Of course, that was Richard Wolf. So let's see what uh, this man, Van der Kratz, can do. He's got a lot of experience uh, at wheel-to-wheel -wheel action. The M2 Racing Cup categories tend to be fairly intensive on that front. And sure enough, he's picked his spot magnificently there. He's got a little bit, little bit more power in the BMW, and he's utilized that well to get between the two Caymans. Well, good luck uh, to Thomas Rackle then. Thomas Rackle uh, is now going to have to try and get back past the big BMW, which is probably the most imposing GT4 car of all. And you see them there 
just now through turn two and three. There's a lot of track limit warnings at turn one. You'll be hopefully unsurprised to hear because it is a, a Portimao tradition. I don't think anybody has been actively penalized for that, though, which is, uh, which is a good sign. They're somewhat keeping their P's and Q's in check. The only two warnings have gone out to Richard Wolfe uh, and Alberto Di Martin. Uh, so they are not, uh, not at all uh, being too far on the track limits, although mm, looking at that run through turn five, I don't know if I agree, uh, but uh, they are uh, at, to an extent keeping themselves on the straights and narrow. And let's see then what uh, we now have with Enrico Ferdera, because Enrico uh, again has a little bit more experience than the 111 driver Thomas Rackel. He has uh, been running in GT60, the, the German category, uh, kind of sub-GT Masters level national German championship uh, in a GT4 car. Uh, and he's uh, quite an impressive youngster by all accounts. Uh, ran some GT Winter Series last year as well. Uh, so he's got a bit more information as a, as, a, as a GT racer than the 111 car, the other SR Motorsport White Cayman. The 187 between the two of them. Now it should have a bit of a straight line speed advantage in theory. The Cayman a little bit sub GT4 level in terms of uh, power. Uh, but of course the BMW is a much bigger car. It cuts a, a big hole through the air. Whereas the Cayman, sleek, small, uh, it can maybe hit a bit of a higher speed towards the end of the straight where the, uh, where the wind really starts to slow you down. Sure enough, really not much between these Caymans and the uh, the full-on, full-fat GT4. Sometimes semi-skimmed milk is all you need, and the white SR Motorsport cars are making that point. Now let's see if they are side-by-side side over the hill. Often they are. No. I uh, thought that the 187 car maybe had the run required. Uh, through the corner that time, but that's not the case. And I note that Richard Wolfe is coming back into this as well. He's just maybe inching ever so slightly closer. Uh, what was his last lap time? It was about a tenth quicker than those ahead of him, so not, uh, not massively so. But uh, if these start to knock a few shades out of each other once again, well, let's wait and see. There's also a good battle developing for sixth overall. Uh, I did mention Emil Yerdrum earlier on doing some good lap times, and he's now within half a second of the back of the elite motorsport McLaren. So Charles Dawson uh, will be watching on with a smile, I'm sure, in the CV Performance Group pit lane, uh, because uh, his young pro Emil Yerdrum is on it right now in the battle for sixth overall. And, uh, of course, those Pro and Pro-Am entries, respectively, so not in the same class, but having a good scrap nonetheless. In fact, four tenths of a second now as they cross the line this time. So that is a gap that is closing readily. And uh, let's see what Yerdrum can do into the first corner. That was very bold. Uh, I tensed up a little bit there, as I'm sure CV Performance Group did as well. Uh, Meekin swept around the outside there to make sure that position stayed with him. But the 85 car is uh, having a very... Uh, a very good run of it with Emil Yerdrum. He started a little bit further back than anticipated. Uh, he started in seventh place, but I think he dropped back to maybe eighth or ninth in the first lap, just trying to avoid uh, any unnecessary incidents. And now he's back up to that seventh place, and uh, he is right on the back of Zach Meekin. We'll see uh, whether he can now close back in. He had his first shot. Uh, at uh, trying to get past the McLaren, and he readily took it. He's now got to close in enough to try and have another go uh, at the McLaren. So that's going to be uh, maybe the work of one or two laps before we see that car right uh, on the rear wing of the Archura once again. Heading into the final half dozen minutes of this race, and Roberto Farri is still very much there as well in in P5. But uh, 
The top four have really cleared off from everybody else in this race. Uh, Jamie Day, Leo Pichler, uh, Marcel Marshevix and Ivan Ekelschik uh, have really driven an incredible race to this point. Uh, Jamie Day's last lap time, though, was some six tenths slower uh, than Leo Pichler's. So whether that's a symptom of maybe the tyres being slightly off song at this phase of the race or uh, whether it's just uh, Jamie managing at this stage. We'll have to wait and see. Remember how I said everyone had been a relatively good person in regard to the uh, to the track limits? Well, we have our first penalty uh, for track limits now, and it is for Richard Wolf actually, in the Resume More Than Racing 81 car. Five seconds track limits uh, for him, so plus five seconds to the end of his race time. How far ahead? Is he of the next car in air? Oh, 2.3 seconds. So Richard Wolf will need to get a move on in order to stave that penalty off. Oh, that's very deep into turn five from Meekin, but uh, manages to style it out. Gets a good run ultimately out of the uh, fifth corner. Up the hill through the kink at turn six, then seven and eight. Oh, goodness me. Emil Yertrum certainly trying his luck a little bit with the track limits there uh, through seven and eight. It is very easily done at that corner. Turn seven is one of those that deceives you into thinking, yeah, there's five kilometers of an hour extra if you push it. And then, uh, and then it very quickly proves not to be the case. The 187 FK performance car is... Uh, Looming large once again in the uh, rearview mirrors of Enrico Ferdera. Ferdera hasn't had an iota of peace during this race. He's just been hounded either by fellow Caymans, by BMW GT4 cars. Uh, he is, of course, leading uh, in Cayman Trophy, and that's where he'll be scoring points. But uh, an overall position is usually what a driver's focused on, and that's uh, that's definitely the case for Enrico Ferdera. I don't expect him to make it easy uh, for Gianni van der Kratz. I'm interested uh, in Gianni's progress as a GT4 driver because I really think that uh, he has got the tools uh, to do well in this type of race car, given his successes in the M2 Racing Cup Benelux. That's a good run out of the final corner as well, but I'm not sure he's quite going to be there into turn one. He's still got maybe a car length between himself and the white Cayman. And sure enough, he's not even trying to angle down into the first corner for a move. That uh, uh, would be unwise, probably end up losing more than he gains from it. But turn three might open up. No, I thought for a minute he was uh, looking for the inside line there. Goes further to the right at turn three into turn four. So trying to get a good launch over the crest of this hill and into turn five. But again, I'm not sure he's quite going to be there. Ferdinand are doing a great job of covering off uh, any advances uh, that uh, the Dutchman can make here. Ferdinand, at just 16 years old, has uh, got a long and uh, blossoming career in front of him. I'm sure of that. And uh, each passing weekend, it becomes more obvious that we're we're going to be talking about this guy for a while. Uh, a little bit of a tap there between the two of them. Gianni van der Kratz may be running out of patience with this a little bit uh, following the youngster. We've got two minutes and 15 seconds left on the clock. Uh, Jamie Day, therefore, has just crossed the line to start the penultimate lap. So two and a half laps for these guys to contest this battle for eighth overall. The two SR Motorsport cars... Uh, appropriately the white bread in this BMW sandwich and uh, going around the outside there is the 187 car and that actually might cost Gianni because here once again uh, comes Thomas Rakel around the outside now where is Thomas he's still behind uh, the BMW I thought he might have a good run through 14 there but uh, now that we are in these dry conditions of course those moves around the outside a lot less frequent this isn't the Gran Turismo movie after all the 187 car in the slipstream again and I think again just too far back into the first corner but Ferdera interestingly they're just leaning a little bit right as if to say the corner is mine do you agree and uh, on this occasion the 187 did agree but uh, running very wide at turn one that could be an opportunity for Thomas Rakel. not 
quite close enough on this occasion. The two SR Motorsport Caymans just lurking there. Up over the hill they go with 55 seconds left on the clock. This will be the penultimate lap of this race. There's the second place car. Leo Pischler has been uh, closing in just slightly uh, on the on the Jamie Day Aston Martin, the Facetti Motorsport car. Uh, we have an investigation. We had an investigation pending uh, 15 and 10 cars. The two NM Racing Team uh, Mercedes for outside overtake at turn five, uh, overtaking outside the track. Uh, so that's uh, an investigation that is ongoing. We'll see what develops there. That, of course, is the battle for second in the AM class. And Farrier still under pressure here from Zach Meekin and uh, Emil Yerdrum in the battle for fifth place overall. Meekin running out of opportunities then. Final lap of the race at uh, one of his favourite tracks. Can he break into the top five up against uh, Roberto Farrier? Farrier in the number nine machine uh, has had a mixed run of things so far. They, of course, secured third in the endurance race, albeit uh, with a short pit stop. Uh, they had to serve a drive through on their way to third place. It certainly looked like Farrier might be uh, coming under increasing pressure from Meekin uh, as we cut away there. But Jamie Day is going to be our cameraman here for the final few corners of the lap as we tip down once again. Uh, through turns eight and then into nine, which is almost blind at that point, at this point of the morning. Sun very much uh, proving to be an obstacle through 11 and into 12. Of course, I'm sure that uh, Jamie Day, uh, well, I was gonna say that he's running, probably running a tinted lens, but I note that the, uh, the, the helmet is open, so perhaps not. And uh, the top two cars head through the last couple of corners for what will be the last time, Jamie Day for the second time is going to bring victory to Forsetti Motorsport. The team based at the Snetterton circuit in the United Kingdom have had a very, very good start to their GT4 Winter Series campaign. Win number two for Jamie Day and for Forsetti Motorsport in the inaugural GT4 Winter Series. Leo Pischler takes second and first among the Pro-Am runners. Then it's uh, the oh, and Roberto Farrier uh, side by side with a bat marker there. I thought there was a move on at the very end of the race, but it wasn't quite to be. We've had Marcel Martovic across the line for third overall ahead of Ivan Ekelchik. Uh, fifth place for Farrier, sixth place for Meekin and Emil Yerdrum. Uh, did a good job closing in, but couldn't do any better than seventh place once he got to the rear of Zach Meekin. Then it's going to be Enrico Ferderer across the line, or is it? Because here's Thomas Ruckel with a late bid at the Cayman Trophy win. It's going to take a mighty run through the final corner. He does close in as they go through the final corner. Is it going to be a drag race? Yes, it is. The SR Motorsport car is going to be side by side, but it will be Ferderer just that wins it in the Cayman Trophy. Eighth overall for the 110 SR Motorsport car just ahead of the 111 uh, its team car it was very very close just behind them the 81 of Richard Wolf uh, should take the AM class win although of course there is that five second penalty to deal with so I think by the time the five second penalty for trap limits is implied uh, applied Richard Wolf won't be 10th overall, he will be 12th overall, and your AM win may well go to Alberto Di Martin uh, in the NM Racing Team car. So that's a huge result uh, for uh, Alberto Di Martin, an AM win for him. And uh, Gianni van der Kratz will uh, have a top 10 overall finish because of Richard Wolf's penalty uh, in his first run at the uh, GT4 class racing, the first run in the GT4 Winter Series. But it's victory again for Jamie Day, the UAE flag driver in the Forsetti Motorsport car, who was third in the 2022 British GT4 Championship. He secured two race wins there, and he's already secured two race wins in the GT4 Winter Series. And we're not even... Uh, well, a third of the way through the season yet. Uh, we'll be at one third distance in the championship by the time we drive away from Portimao.
spent last year plying his trade in mainland Europe and uh, in the United States as well. He'll be familiar with this Portimao circuit from uh, previous encounters with it. And uh, certainly looks like he's uh, gelling with the track nicely. Of course, his next task after celebrating with the team will be a chat with Lukas Gajewski. Uh, so Gajewski will be uh, there and ready to have a chat with our race winner, Jamie Day. Jamie uh, does a lot of his talking on the track, but I'm sure he'll have some uh, happy words to say after that race. Good performances all round, but I think uh, the likes of Emil Yerdrum with how he closed in uh, on the top half dozen, that was certainly a great performance, but uh, uh, the real headline makers are the real stars of the show in that race were Enrico Ferderer and Thomas Ruckel. Right until the end, <laughs> they were having an absolutely fabulous scrap in the identical uh, lack of liveried uh, Porsche Cayman GT4 CS machines. Into the Scroot Bay goes the number 19 car then. The 81 machine. Joining him there as well, Richard Wolfe, who should end up with a five second penalty uh, applied. He uh, gained a five second penalty for track limits. In fact, there were two consecutive ones on the timing screen, but I think that might have been uh, uh, more of a typo type thing but uh, so Jamie Day having a, a chat then with his Forsetti crew and uh, Mikey Porter looking happy with that one as well. There's a lot of driving talent in that shot there, I must say, but uh, Jamie Day, the star of the show uh, in that race, uh, just managed everything. Uh, Pitchler was quicker towards the end of the race, but I think that was more uh, Jamie just uh, keeping things in check, although he did surge back up the, uh, the pace charts, as it were, uh, towards the end of the race. So Fossetti Motorsport celebrating race win Nuro Dos uh, of the season. And that will be something that, uh, uh, that they look to build upon in the 60-minute endurance race, which we'll see later on. Uh, there will be a pit window from the 25th to the 35th minute, and potentially there will be some driver changes uh, on the way during that one. Quite surprised to see that uh, Luis Liberal wasn't uh, on the pace uh, in that race. I wonder if he's not quite comfortable with the Speedy Motorsport uh, M4 GT4 because, of course, he was kind of there with the likes of Alberto Di Martin in the previous uh, races. But this time around doesn't seem uh, to quite be uh, on the level that, uh, that he was in in Estoril, maybe uh, Portimao not quite as familiar of a circuit, but I know he does a lot of his racing in Iberia, so uh, maybe that's not it. Jamie Day's done a little bit of racing in Iberia, but you'd think he's been here for years. He's won the race, and he's down with Lukas Gajewski. Jamie Day, congratulations. A second victory for the Fossetti Motorsport formation. What a start of the campaign it's been. Yeah, it's been good. We've now got two wins. We've had a pole position, I think. Uh, it's just going from strength to strength each weekend, and uh, we'll see what we can do in the endurance later, but hopefully uh, same repeat of race two this morning. And it was very commanding in the end. However, as we expected and as we wanted to see a good scrap in uh, the beginning of the race early on. Yeah, early on it was a bit of a battle for the first few corners, but then once I settled into it, I think I just stayed a little bit more chilled, a bit more relaxed, and then uh, just started to pull away a little bit. Enjoy the podium. Cheers, Jamie. Thank you very much. So then Jamie Day having a chat there with Lukas Gajewski. Uh, Richard Wolf still listed as 10th uh, place uh, overall, but uh, he is supposed to be uh, receiving a five second penalty for track limits. And I don't think that penalty has been applied yet. No, it hasn't. Uh, so quite what's happened there, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but uh, Richard Wolf 
for Razoon more than racing is is more than likely going to lose out on his current provisional uh, am class win Di Martin and Hubert second and third place in the am class for the nm racing team and again another good performance for uh, speedworks automotives franz linden uh, we alluded to Luis liberal being a little bit off the pace he was 15th uh, overall fourth in the am class uh, actually just behind uh, franz linden and again franz in his uh, first weekend of of racing receiving tuition from uh, arnie hofmeister uh, as he moves up from the endless summer track days, which is another uh, Giedlick Racing property. And uh, it has been good to see uh, Franz Linden finally making that step. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of track day competitors are just a little bit hesitant about making that move into racing. Of course, it's more of a high pressure environment. Uh, but uh, more often than not, a talented track day driver or a talented amateur level racing driver uh, is genuinely a, a good bronze. I think we're discovering that as well with uh, Demir Hot in the GT Winter Series. Uh, Stefan Radzinski, his driver coach, rates him incredibly highly. And obviously we've seen Demir racing the GT3 cars in both the wet and dry conditions uh, already here at uh, Estoril and Portimao respectively. Uh, so definitely, uh, if you're a quick track day driver and you've got the... Uh, the capital to do it, uh, maybe have a little bit of a go uh, at this racing lark. You might find you're quite talented. And uh, if you are if in that particular camp, particularly if you're already a part of endless summer track days, then why not come along to the Wind Series weekends uh, and get yourself involved in the racing here? Uh, the four categories as it now is that uh, Giedlick Racing operate in the Winter Series weekends, the fourth of them of course being the Formula Wind Series uh, which we will see next month. Certainly a gorgeous morning here at Portimao, we've still got four races to come and uh, we're going to scare the birds out of these trees in a few minutes with the uh, rumbling 5.6 litre Nissan V8s of the LMP3 class. And uh, that will be a spectacle, I am sure. But uh, for now, the marshals just picking up some carbon fiber. You see one of the marshals there, uh, I think, carrying a little bit of something. I imagine it's a bit of Roberto Farrier's splitter, uh, because, of course, turn eight was where the uh, collision happened between Farrier uh, and Meekin. Uh, in the early stages of the race. Uh, so that is, oh, sorry, it was Farrier and Marshavix, wasn't it? Uh, but. Uh, there have been a couple of collisions, a little bit of carbon fiber shed in our first race of the weekend. But what is a GT4 race without a, a little bit of contact? It's, it's not advised, it's not encouraged. It is sometimes a reality, though, uh, with the GT4 cars, these young chargers looking to make their step maybe towards GT3 racing. And of course, these days, if you make the step towards GT3 racing, it's a bigger step than ever towards the Le Mans 24 hours with the LM GT3 class appearing in the World Endurance Championship for the first time. So uh, GT3, I think, is going to hit a, a new halcyon period over the next few years. Not that it's ever really died down uh, in the last uh, 15 plus years. The GT3 class starting in 2006. GT4 followed just one year later in 2007. Those of you that remember those early days of GT4, it wasn't exactly big grids early doors, but uh, it did evolve. They, uh, the SRO persisted uh, with the GT4 concept, and as we went into the 2010s, GT4 really took on a life of its own and is now the home of uh, some of the most talented drivers with a roof over their head for sure. And uh, looking forward to seeing how the uh, how the GT4 Winter Series grid grows. Uh, this SRO license series a really big deal uh, for the SRO to uh, sign off on Giedlick Racing running their license championship over the course of the winter. And certainly we have had uh, spectacles galore thus far in this series. We can now head down though to Chris McCarthy, who has our first podium of Sunday.
Thank you very much, Adam. Yes, we're going to crack on with the podium for the first race of the day, the GT4 Winter Series. A second race, some great battles going on, particularly in the middle of the field. Uh, but out front, we were shown some absolute domination from our race leaders and some serious talent from all of our top three uh, as well. Let's get those top three uh, on to the podium, shall we? We're going to start uh, with the pro class, starting with third place, number nine, Rob Roberto Faria. Let's give him some support as he comes out. Well done, Roberto. We will be seeing these guys all in action later in the endurance race with their teammates. Finishing in second, just up the road, was number 11, Marcel Marshevich. Well done. You can head round to the podium, but a fantastic drive from a pole position. Cleared off up the road, taking the win for Forsetti Motorsport was number 19, Jamie Day. Well done, Jamie. We'll get Gidlick Racing now to present the trophies to the top three. Well done to uh, all the guys. We'll get some pictures with them. Um, we will be speaking to them later on, I'm sure. But for now, we will press on very quickly with the next classes as our next race is going to be coming up very, very shortly. But for now, let's uh, give one more round of applause to our top three overall uh, in the broadcast, guys. They put on a great show for us. Please, one more round of applause to the top three. Well done, guys. I'm sure we'll be speaking to all of them a little bit later on. Uh, okay, let's go uh, to uh, the top three uh, in Pro-Am next. Finishing uh, in third place was number 85, Emil Yerdrum. Well done, Emil. Great to see you again on the podium uh, once more. These three becoming regular visitors to it. Finishing in second place was number 24, Ivan Ekulshik. Well done, Ivan. And he's no stranger to the top step now, taking the win once more in Pro-Am was number 77, Leo Pischler. <laughs> Fighting right up the front of the order as well. Well done to uh, Leo. Absolutely fantastic job from Leo. Let's get the trophies uh, presented uh, to the uh, top three. Uh, the uh, Gidlick Racing guys now will come round to uh, present the uh, trophies to the top three. We'll uh, get some pictures uh, with all of our drivers. We'll get them all up on the top step and then we're gonna press on with getting our AM drivers up onto the podium. We'll see these guys in action in the endurance race later. For now though, well done to our top three in the Pro-Am class. Let's give them one more round of applause. Well done guys, we saw them fighting way up the top of the order, particularly our top three. Let's go to the AM category and next finishing in third place was number 10, Max Huber. Well done to Max. We did have a change to the top two after uh, a five second penalty. So finishing in second after that was applied was number 81, Richard Wolf. Did lead the field home, but uh, did get a track limits penalty. So that meant the win went to uh, number 15, Alberto Di Martin. Well done, Alberto, those two putting on a fantastic fight. I have to say, it was really great to watch them in action. Well done, Alberto. Drove very, very well. Close battling between all of our top three. Alberto picking up some great points in the championship there as well. Gidlick Racing come round to present the trophies and we'll get some pictures of uh, our top three. And I'm sure we're going to have a very close race between those three later on. Let's give them one more round of applause. The top three in the AM category. Well done, guys. Well done, Alberto. Another win in the bag. OK, let's go to uh, Cayman Trophy. Very, very close, particularly uh, between our top two. But uh, this man, a fantastic story, given the journey he's gone on to get to this point. He had a podium yesterday. He's got another one today. Number 66 in third, Franz Linden. Let's give him a round of applause as he comes out. Franz Linden, great to see you on here once more, sir. 
finishing in second place just behind the race leader for almost the entire race, the number 111, Thomas Rackel. Fantastic race to watch, I have to say. Looking forward to uh, the show you guys put on later. Almost inseparable for taking the race win in Cayman Trophy, number 110, Enrico Ferdera. Well done, well done, Enrico. Disturbing the other categories whilst you guys were at it as well. It was uh, really superb to watch. Right, Gidlick Racing now will come round to present the trophies. And we will get our pictures taken. We'll get you all up on the top step of the podium, guys. And then we will have one more round of applause for not just our top three in Cayman Trophy, but all our GT4 drivers. Give them one more round of applause for the top three in Cayman Trophy. Well done, guys. That, that was an absolutely fantastic race. Well done, guys. Well done. We'll see you later on. Okay. As you can hear, you might not be able to hear, we are being very, very rudely disrupted by the prototype Winter Series drivers. And that is where we are going to be going next. It's time for the second and the last race of the weekend already. A bit weird, isn't it? Early on Sunday morning. However, it's the last time out on the circuit for this weekend here in Portimao for the Prototype Winter Series. Another addition to this year's GT Winter Series package, mainly consisting of LMP3 machinery and the one very distinctive Nova just as well. Now, this is definitely one of the big stories of the weekend so far because we are joined this weekend in prototype winter series by the inter europol competition outfit it's a polish team winner in last year's 24 hours of le mans as far as the lmp2 class is concerned however they've got a good bunch of lmp3 cars as well which they run in various prototype championships around the globe and one of them is the prototype winter series the car was on course for Paul position for race one had an accident in the closing stages of the weekend and sadly had to be uh, withdrawn from the race yesterday however today albeit starting in p8 on the grid it can take part now guys could you help me with uh, opening the door anyone can I just speak to the driver? Thank you very much. I'm always very careful not to destroy these very expensive LMP3 cars. Thank you very much. There is Sebastian Gravelin, your driver for the first part of the race today. What a story this weekend has been, Sebastian, so far. Yeah, it's been a bit tricky at the moment. Uh, we were quite unlucky yesterday with a braking failure for Petro, but uh, thankfully he's okay now. So now we are ready to, to try again. So how much running have you done in the car so far? Well, when I came here on Thursday, it was the first time ever in the car. So it has been a bit limited, but I think I found a good rhythm and got on with it, yeah. And how do you like Portimao in an LMP3 car? Well, it's, it's a very good combination. I really like it, I must say. Very Sebastian, thank you very much and all the best for the race. That's going to be well deserved in case Inter Europol is able to finish high up. You can close the door. Thank you very much. Uh, however, uh, some of you who are very familiar to see Inter Europol cars will see the lack of color. Uh, you can see it's just carbon. And normally the cars are running in uh, this outfit in bright yellow and green. I think I've got something. Let me check. What about these? Do you think they match? Let's have a look. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They, they, do. they look nice, huh? What do you mind? <laughs> I'll leave it as it is. Maybe later on. Anyway, great to have the uh, Inter Europol team on the grid. Now let's head down towards the front end of the grid. There is yesterday's winning car, the number 42 ANS Motorsport machine. A bit of an interesting way how all of that got together. Uh, let's speak to Julien Lemoy, who is one of the two drivers in yesterday's winning outfit congratulations didn't speak to you uh, yesterday after the race a bit of a, a bit of a surprise there yesterday wasn't it yes we are very happy we were not really expecting to to be first 
We have not the opportunity to train on the dry setup. We had a, a crash early in the morning. So it's a big way to, and the best way to finish the day, for sure. When it starts, not the best way. So it was a big positive surprise yesterday. Now, we know we have people tuned in from all over Europe, all over the world, maybe. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, quelques mots en français? Merci et très content d'être uh, ici au Portugal sous le soleil uh, et on espère une belle course. Merci bien. Thank you very much and of course all the best to you. Uh, this is going to be one of the big talking points of course in today's race. The handicap regulations depending on the uh, driver classifications. Uh, some of you will know that in um, prototype and indeed in sports car racing there are various categories for the drivers and depending on uh, your driver status whether it's gold or silver or bronze there are some penalty times put into place. Same, of course, applies for this. This is the only Nova car on the grid. Now, in earlier days, the uh, Nova used to be an old Vauxhall driven by juveniles. However, nowadays, it's a very, very sophisticated, great-looking prototype, especially, I think, if you look at it from the back, that almost looks a bit hypercar-esque, doesn't it? It's a great addition to the this grid it's also sounding properly with its v8 engine and uh, it's definitely going to be a handful for all the other drivers and teams to keep behind now on the front of the grid it's an interesting story as well because it's going to be the uh, number three dkr car uh, yesterday they were a bit compromised after a bit of a spin for one of their drivers for uh, chris short however today it's going to be his teammate right brickacek starting the car from pole position uh, just over a minute to go until the uh, start of the formation lap. So here is one last quick at break and then it's time to kick off the last prototype winter series race here in Portimao. Enjoy. So the prototypes are up next for their two formation laps. Uh, you may remember yesterday, I rather caught out by the two formation laps, but I understand uh, that uh, two formation laps is the case. Once again for the prototype win series, I think a couple of teams requesting a bit more time to get some temperature into the tyres, into uh, the car. Uh, so we're expecting two formation laps. If they start to uh, form up two by two at the conclusion of the first, uh, then we know that something has changed overnight. So then the cars are now running once again. It's an all Duquesne front row uh, of that grid. As, uh, as we've already heard from Lukas Gajewski, it is Wyatt Brikacek starting uh, the car from pole position. The DKR engineering machine starting from pole position. Then it is Sandro Holtzum. He's a solo driver, of course, but Wyatt Brikacek uh, is sharing with Chris Short. Daniel Karlwitz is next third overall. He'll be sharing with Steve Paro. Danny Sufi is a solo driver. He starts from fourth place uh, in the Conrad Motorsport Ligier. Row three is all ANS Motorsport. Clement Moreno in the winning car from yesterday. Uh, the safety car and the handicap system all falling into ANS Motorsport's favour. Let's see what Kevin Rabin can do in the sister ANS car as well. That is the No Proto that uh, Lucas Gajewski was showing us earlier on. Molna Motorsport with their pair of Portuguese racers, Rodrigo Almeida and Bernardo Pinheiro, starting from seventh place. Sebastian Gravelin from eighth on the grid. He will make up places. Of course, not able to qualify uh, yesterday after the break failure for Pedro Perino. Those two will be ones to watch. Charles Del Brassine uh, rounding out the nine cars that take the start. He'll hand over to Via Mauer. They'll have Simba in the headset. Although I am noting the racing experience car doesn't appear to be in the uh, grid sequence there. It looked like we were down a car, which is a big shame if that is the case for the Racing Experience crew. 
uh, who are always immensely hard working. Maybe a pit lane start. There's only uh, eight cars on that grid. No Duquesne from racing experience at the back of the pack. Uh, although, uh, that could be could be just a sign of a pit lane start, but it would be a shame not to have the racing experience Duquesne on the grid. We'll wait and see. Is the car there? No, it's not there at pit entry, so pit exit. So I suspect uh, that uh, we are going to be down a car for this race, unfortunately. The truck is still there at the end of the garages, so uh, they're evidently still on site, but maybe a slight issue uh, with the racing experience number 12. They all concertina up at turn three there on the formation lap. That's, uh, that's never something you want to see, but uh, everybody gets through that cleanly. Wyatt Brikacek, the American racer then, will be starting this one from pole position. He's done a season in Europe already. 23-year-old uh, American racer will be looking to uh, beat some of the all-stars that are behind him. Guys like Sandro Holtzum, guys like Daniel Karlwitz are uh, always big names to kind of uh, claim the scalp of in racing conditions and we'll see what White Brikacek can do. Uh, but Sebastian Gravland is going to be looking to make up places early doors in that 88 car. And then of course there's Danny Sufi who was having a great race uh, until he had some electrical issues yesterday here at Portimao. I'm sure the Conrad Motorsport team have uh, worked to ensure uh, that that uh, isn't likely to happen again and hopefully we will see uh, the uh, Danny Sufi car out there. Charles Del Brassine is there. Uh, I just saw him coming over the crest of the hill at turn 10. He's uh, keeping his distance it seems from the rest of the pack as the race gets going and to be honest uh, given the way turn one sometimes goes here at Portimao that could be a very wise decision uh, from the uh, 62 year old racer came into the prototype win series as a novice outside of go-karts and we'll see how he performs alongside Liam Mauer. but at the front of the pack uh, we are getting ready for the action it is Wyatt Brikacek in the DKR Engineering Duquesne starting from pole position Sandra Holtzum on the outside will be looking uh, to right the wrongs of yesterday you may remember his spin uh, during the pit window yesterday. He'll be looking to have a clearer run of things this time around. The cars head towards the red lights that have been held for a little while over the last uh, couple of races of the weekend. So I'm not expecting those lights to go green for a couple more seconds. But as soon as they do, the thunder really does start to roll through the hills of Portimao. Still red lights, still red lights. But the race has, it seems, begun despite no the green lights there not going out. We are underway. It is the DKR Engineering number three car that leads and uh, Gravland already getting in amongst it uh, in the bare carbon fibre into Europol car around the outside there of the 18. Uh, that is at Rodrigo Almeida uh, who gets uh, overtaken there in the early stages. But it is the two Duquesnes at the front of Danny Sufi has managed to get up to third place just ahead of what should be Daniel Kalvitz uh, in fourth position. Through the first few corners they go, turn seven, turn eight, now downhill into the ninth corner of the lap. These cars absolutely spectacular through corners like turn nine, absolutely flat, full commitment and uh, mountains of downforce to help you. Of course, that doesn't help you in the slightest when you get to corners like turn three and turn five, the sharp hairpins, but... Uh, it is uh, a, a very much downforce dependent car, an LMP3 machine. The top four, uh, all LMP3 cars. Then the outlier, the fifth place car, Kevin Rabin in the Nova NP02. The two Duquesnes, cars three and 33, then are your leaders. And Sandro Holtzum 
uh, will be studying the rear of Wyatt Prikacek, trying to figure out in the early stages exactly where maybe he's a little bit stronger than the American racer. I think for Holtzum, he'll be keen to just reach the end of a prototype winter series race without dramas because obviously he had the little mistake yesterday uh, and in Estoril the car didn't start the second race and while it did get scored as the winner in the first race of course it ended up in the barriers after the contact with Danny Sufi. Over the hill they come once again then and Sufi leading the Ligier contingent then from third overall just ahead of Daniel Kalvitz who is uh, biding his time this 50 minute race will have a mandatory pit stop of course in the 20 to 30 minute mark of the race uh, so at minute thir uh, with 30 minutes to go the window will open it will shut with 20 minutes of the race to go and uh, numerous different lengths of pit stop for these drivers. Our current race leader, handing over to Chris Short, will have 30 seconds less to contend with. Meanwhile, side by side between yesterday's race winner, Clement Moreno, uh, and uh, Rodrigo Almeida, that's for seventh place. Graveland has already gotten past both of those drivers. So uh, Sebastian Graveland on the ascendancy here. His next target is the young Kevin Rabin, who would love to show his stuff by holding off uh, a driver of Graveland's caliber for just a little while. However, the Nova isn't quite as strong in a straight line as the LMP3s. We've seen that a couple of times already. And the 19-year-old Dane in the NT8 into Europol car might be looking for a move into the first corner. Kevin Rabin may well be under pressure there. Sufi in third place then goes through turn one and uh, is maybe just losing a, a couple of tenths a lap to the top two right now. Brikacek and Holtzum running nicely and there was indeed a move uh, for fifth place then. So uh, Sebastian Graveland has gotten through into B5 and he'll be looking to now try and pursue the top four. Uh, the domain of the young pro drivers. Oh, well, Danny Kalvitz, with respect, maybe not a young pro driver, uh, but the pros towards the front of the order will probably soon be joined by Sebastian Graveland if he has anything to do with it. There's Graveland fifth, then it's Rabin, then it's Moreno, and then uh, it is Almeida in the Molda Motorsport car. Molda Motorsport are going to have a, a kind of rolling feed of new young drivers each and every weekend uh, in the prototype winter series using it as an opportunity to test some drivers out and uh, the Portuguese uh, Bernardo Pinheiro and Rodrigo Almeida uh, relishing the opportunity to race around Portimao uh, in the Duquesne from Mulner Motorsport a team with a lot of pedigree of course running Porsches in GT racing for many years and uh, now uh, focusing their efforts on prototypes, particularly in the Prototype Cup Germany. This is a replay then of the race, the race winning battle, the race leading battle uh, in the first stint of the race from Estoril with Danny Sufi being pursued by Daniel Karlwitz. And uh, that is third and fourth place running in tandem. Karlwitz is... Uh, Former champion, of course, in, in GT cars, as we've as we've alluded to several times so far this season. And uh, interesting to see the parity between Sufi and Kalvitz in these identical cars. Does look as though at the front of the order, Wyatt Brikacek is just maybe getting a car length or two extra over Sandra Holtzum at this phase of the race. 1.1 seconds clear now. And uh, fastest lap of the race last time by going to Brikacek. Karlwitz is looking feisty though behind our third place man Danny Sufi. It's Conrad versus Rinaldi then in that battle for P3. Then in fifth place there is Sebastian Graveland. Uh, now that he's in the clear air we'll start to pay a little bit more attention to his lap times and uh, see where he is. He's not done his first full lap uh, behind uh, full f first full lap in clean air just yet. Kevin Rabin has dropped from 6th to 8th on this lap as well. So Rabin in the Nova falling back a little bit there. I'm not sure whether he may have made an error. It would certainly seem that is the case. 
Uh, so Rabin has some work to do now to get himself back up there. And of course, in the case of Rabin, he is a silver driver driving solo. Therefore, he's going to have to have a pit in to pit out time of 151 seconds. So he's going to have one of the longer pit stops as well. Uh, that is also the case for Grabland and Perino in the 88 car for uh, three of the top four as well. Wyatt Brickercheck and Chris Short have a 120-second uh, stop. The rest of the top four all with 151 seconds. A pair of cars with 89-second stops. That is uh, Charles Del Brassine and Leah Mauer, uh, as well as Moreno and Lemoyne. And as we saw yesterday, if there's a safety car out, that can really mess with the handicap system's effect on the race. Oh, and Danny Sufi going very defensive on the run to turn five. Daniel Karlwitz tries to go around the outside and uh, decides that uh, he can't quite get it done just yet. Although, is he deciding that? Because certainly there's a lot of aggression coming out of that 66 car. Up and over the crest at uh, turn eight, he will go. Ah, now we are missing a car. ANS Motorsports' Clement Moreno uh, doesn't appear to have crossed the line on this lap. So what's happened there? Kalvitz, though, up the inside for third place, going through turn 10, turn 11. And has, how do they emerge? They emerge side by side. Sufi still on the inside line. Sufi still in third place, but Kalvitz is making life very difficult for him. Lunges up the inside at turn 14. They have thankfully do emerge, and they emerge with Kalvitz with a nose ahead. But Sufi, oh, hit check between the two of them. A little bit of uh, a little bit of tight, an iota of contact, I think. But Sufi has to yield there to Kalvitz, who gets through into third place. They thunder past my commentary position, and it is. Kalvitz then up to third place. Kalvitz in third, Sufi in fourth place. Conrad Motorsport number seven car. So while this is going on between those two Ligiers, the Ligier that won yesterday of Clement Moreno has indeed gone missing in the final sector uh, just about a lap and a half ago. So we're not quite sure what happened to Clement Moreno, but that car uh, never completed lap three of the race. So something amiss with Moreno for sure. And if that car is indeed missing and it isn't just a transponder issue, which uh, is a possibility, uh, then that uh, that is a very sad way for them to end their weekend, really, after a race win uh, on the Saturday, of course, in the prototype winter series. Uh, Moreno and Lemoyne had a lot to celebrate uh, after the Saturday race. Kalvitz building a gap then over Danny Sufi now that he's gotten through. Will he now try and run interference on Sandra Holtzum? and Wyatt Brikacek, the two parts of the Duquesne stranglehold at the front of the order? Gravelin's pace is uh, pretty good in fifth position as well. He's about six tenths quicker than Sufi ahead of him, uh, but he's only on par or slightly behind the pace of uh, the rest of the top four. So Gravelin not doing anything that the cars in front of him are not doing, uh, but he is still about on par with the rest of the fast pros in the LMP3 class here. Top five within... 11 seconds and one of those top five of course starting from the back of the field fastest lap of the race last time by as charles del brassine gets uh, lapped for the first time by white bricker check uh, but the fastest lap of the race last time by for that red and black car the rinaldi racing 66 so daniel Karlwitz means business at the moment just hearing now that uh, the ans motorsport car never did stop it was transponder related the car has now been picked back up by the live timing uh, albeit a couple of laps further down the order than it truly is so ANS Motorsports Moreno and Lemoyne having a transponder issue rather than a car issue which is good news but just for Steve Parrow he'll be watching on with some glee uh, as Daniel Kalvitz continues to work his way uh, towards the sharp end of the field. Kalvitz and Paro with a 122-second stop due. 
the only team with 122 seconds specifically uh, scheduled for their stop. Which will give them 29 seconds less in the pit lane uh, than the likes of Sandra Holtzman and Danny Sufi. But Kalvitz is absolutely on it right now. Another 138. He was 1.3 seconds faster than Sandra Holtzman on the previous lap. So Daniel Kalvitz means business in this race right now. Kalvitz is on something of a mission uh, in the Ligier. You see him there fighting the car through turn three. There's no easy way to get these uh, downforce dependent cars through those uh, slow corners. Any LMP car, any single seater, you see the drivers hustling the wheel usually uh, through low speed corners. I'm sure someone would correct me on this, but uh, as far as I know, uh, there's never been a, an LMP3 car at a street race, and that's probably for the best, because I wouldn't want to fight something that twitchy through an abundance of low-speed corners without any runoff area. Uh, these uh, LMP3 machines are uh, certainly quite the beast. It is fascinating that so many drivers use this as a first step in racing, the likes of uh, Charles Del Brassine, certainly not alone uh, in that approach. And... Uh, these cars do strike me as very difficult machines to drive, so I've always been uh, quite surprised by that. But of course, if you're att if you're attempting to go into sports car racing, why not start uh, in the uh, LMP3 cars, the kind of bottom rung of the ACO prototype ladder? A lot of drivers maybe started something like Radicals first. That was the case for Chris Short, who is due to take over the leading car after the pit stop window which incidentally opens in six minutes and at 40 seconds time and by then i wouldn't be surprised if daniel Kalvitz is uh, right on the rear of sandra holtzum at a bare minimum once again outpacing uh, the youngster of course uh, holtzum in last year's dtm championship has shared cars numerous times uh, with twin brother Juliano Holtzen, uh, including in the GT4 ranks. And uh, unfortunately, Juliano not uh, feeling particularly great at the moment. He's uh, a bit poorly, so he is uh, staying away from track for the time being. But I'm sure we'll see him back out there soon. Holtzen, meanwhile, it's Holtzen Sandro, to be clear, uh, is uh, still holding off. Uh, Daniel Karlwitz, but I do feel there's a whiff of inevitability to it. Of course, as the cars become more downforce dependent, following another car becomes more and more, uh, more and more fast or more and more difficult. And uh, Karlwitz, though, does seem to be able to gainfully hold on to the back of uh, the number 33 Rinaldi racing car of course lest we forget these are two teammates in Rinaldi racing easy to forget that given they are two different chassis manufacturers but they are run from the same stable so this battle for second place is probably causing uh, Astrid from Rinaldi a, a little bit of uh, anxiety at the moment because those are the two cars that she is looking after and uh, well She's just going to hope that it's a clean fight and a fair fight and a fight without any repair bills required uh, as Daniel Karlwitz closes in on Sandra Holtzum. A little bit of a twitch into the first corner there for Karlwitz. These cars now running through turn four then and over the crest of the hill they will go. There's your race leader, White Brikacek, having a Fairly lonely race at the front of the order, but I don't think he'll complain for the lack of company. Chris Short uh, will be gearing himself up at the moment to uh, take the start, maybe towards the middle or the end of the window. Short is uh, going to be the beneficiary of a, a shorter pit stop when that time comes as well. Last time by for uh, Sandro Holtzim, it was the fastest lap of the race. However, it was the fastest lap of the race, still uh, two-tenths slower than Daniel Carvitz. So even though 
Holtzum set his personal best of the race. Carlwitz is still outpacing him, so Holtzum giving everything he's got, and Carlwitz answering with that little bit more, which is certainly probably going to give Sandra Holtzum a lot to think about as they run through turn 15 of the lap. Bikacek crosses the line once again. He's just starting to pull the taps up as well. 138.825 uh, for Wyatt Brikacek, so he's moving up on, in terms of pace and also on a very quick lap is uh, Rodrigo Almeida in the Molna Motorsport car. He seems to be finding his feet uh, in the LMP3 as the weekend goes on, which is great to see. Setting pace that would put him in the top four if he'd started in amongst the front of the field. Holtzum and Karlwitz continue on at the front of the order in second and third place. About three and a half seconds back from uh, Wyatt Brikacek, our race leader. They haven't been losing any time to Brikacek over the last couple of laps, but uh, as long as they're uh, fighting each other at close quarters, I don't think we're going to see them get any closer to the back of the number three car. Uh, both of these cars have a slightly longer stop than Brikacek and Short as well, so things are really lining up nicely for Wyatt. And oh, a big dive up the inside from Daniel Karvitz into turn 10. Carried a lot of speed out of eight and through turn nine into 10 and 11. It is a move for Karlwitz and the car almost gets away from him at turn 12 as well. Daniel Karlwitz, full commitment there uh, through turn 12. Gets himself up into second place, but now Sandra Holtzum will try and make a run back at him. Or perhaps he will decide to try and tuck in behind and uh, both of them can go hunting for Wyatt Brikacek. I'm not sure uh, quite how much loyalty there is across the two different chassis types, uh, the two different uh, Rinaldi teams. Sandro Holtzum, though, already two or, two or three car lengths further back. Kalvitz has been patiently waiting for his opportunity to break free from Sandro Holtzum. And now he has managed to uh, break the dam. And his next target is Wyatt Brikacek. So let's see uh, what happens now. Four seconds is the gap between Brikacek and Karlwitz. Your order at this stage of the race, Wyatt Brikacek, your race leader by four seconds, just behind uh, Daniel Karlwitz in second place is Sandra Holtzum, as you can see on screen. So that's our top three. Fourth place is Danny Sufi, who's fallen back about three and a half seconds from this second and third place scrap. Sebastian Gravland is a further seven seconds behind Sufi in fifth place overall. Rodrigo Almeida uh, outpacing Sebastian Gravland in the Inter-Europol car at the moment in uh, P6. So Almeida, uh, the young Portuguese racer, really starting to find his footing in the Molna Motorsport car. Clement Moreno is in seventh place, so after those a uh, brief lapse of transponder day to the car is there in seventh place as it should be 35 seconds uh, off the race lead it's kevin rabin eighth overall uh, in the ans motorsport car and in ninth place a lap off most of the field is at uh, charles del brassine in the duquesne d08 So then pit window is about to open. 30 minutes of the race remaining, and that is the point uh, where the pit window uh, is open. Uh, so the drivers can now take the opportunity uh, to get their pit stops underway. And I suspect that a lot of our pro drivers will uh, initially at least uh, stay out there, maybe until the middle phase of the window. Some of the AM drivers tell their pros, no, I want my fair share, I want my half of this race. Other pro drivers say, mm, actually, uh, oh, other AM drivers say, well, actually, I want the best chance I can of winning. I'll get out of the car as quickly as I can, and I'll send my uh, talented teenager off to try and claim some trophies on behalf of us both. Uh, I'll tell you what, Daniel Karlwitz is not a teenager. I think he'll admit to that. Uh, but uh, three and a half seconds is now the gap between himself and young Wyatt Brikacek. That gap is coming down, a 138.719 uh, on the previous lap uh, for Daniel Kalvitz. Kalvitz 
uh, is on the hunt then. Wyatt Brickercheck uh, will perhaps be looking in those rear view mirrors and going, that is probably going to be a problem before too long. Uh, the numerous time GT racing champion Daniel Karlwitz, of course, handing over to Steve Parrow uh, in the pit stop window. He'll be looking for his uh, opportunity to uh, uh, to try and uh, claim a, a nice cushion for Paro uh, as the race goes on. So then Brikacek uh, is there in this uh, race lead. It's now 2.7 seconds. Look at the pace from Daniel Carver. It's a 138.441. Uh, 138.441 uh, for uh, Karlwitz last time by. That is a serious, serious lap time. A 139.2 last time by uh, for Wyatt Brickercheck. So uh, eight tenths the gap between uh, the gap reduction between the two of them on that lap. And uh, Brickercheck will be ever more aware of the car that's appearing behind him. Uh, I've been joined at this juncture of the race by Chris McCarthy, who is a uh, podium host, social media manager, and now for the first time, co-commentator, <laughs> uh, also professional juggler. He's going to be the Luke Littler of the juggling championships, I promise you that. How are you doing so far? Oh, fantastic. It's uh, brilliant to be here. I mean, my first time at this circuit, uh, and what a beautiful circuit it is. Uh, I was blown away um, by the elevation changes that the circuit provides. Um, I got to have a, a, a wander around with Emilio. I say a wander around. Uh, it was almost like doing a flying lap whilst we were going around to get some footage, which I'm sure uh, will be released uh, very, very soon. Um, and. It wasn't for the prototype uh, session, it was for the GT Winter Series session. The prototypes were wrapped up by that point, but uh, just seeing the cars come uh, round was absolutely fantastic. And uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's a shame I haven't really been here before, to be honest. It's uh, one of those circuits when you get here, you almost think, why haven't I been to this sooner? <laughs> and when am I next coming back? <laughs> exactly right. No, it's my first time here too. Uh, it's a pit stop, meanwhile, for Rinaldi Racing Sandro Holtzum. So Holtzum is in, of course, he's a solo driver. He's going to have to wait 151 seconds as a solo silver driver uh, with the pit stop handicaps in play. Uh, that will also be the case uh, for our third place man, Danny Sufi, uh, is soloist in the Conrad Motorsport car. About the same length of pit stop for both of the cars in the lead battle, though. Wyatt Brickercheck uh, and Chris Short with 120 seconds of pit stop, 122 for Kulvitz and Paro. That's because Kulvitz isn't to silver. He is the only gold-rated driver on this grid. Uh, one of the marshals then getting his uh, arm stuck in there to try and clear what I assume is some debris uh, from uh, the Moreno and Le Moyne car, yesterday's winner. And of course, this only has 89 seconds worth of pit stop from pit in to pit out so a significantly shorter pit stop and well yesterday especially with the safety car coming in that really came up trumps for yeah them. this is where it makes uh, these races very interesting doesn't it the safety car uh, came out at a time where it just played into these guys favor but you have to take advantage of that and get back on the track keep it on the road uh, and also build on that gap keep that gap and that's exactly uh, what they did but as you said they seem to be getting to work to the uh, right front there but they've done the driver swap and hopefully there's uh, no problems that they need to fix and they can get out going again overall it's been a, a really good weekend for the ANS motorsport team and a really good start to the season for them so far I must say he's got faith in the air jacks he had his whole leg under that car as well it must be a warm that was very as well. <laughs> when you're down there it, it is and you see them coming in at the speed they do uh, Johnny down there uh, who's doing the camera operating does a fantastic job because they come in at some speed I've got to say all the uh, crew that uh, work on all these cars uh, do a really great job uh, it's absolutely uh, fantastic to watch when you are uh, track side and uh, big thanks to uh, Johnny our camera op uh, as part of the Alpha Live team uh, who's down there often has Ryan with him just to spot to uh, uh, make sure he's all okay and yeah. gives you a sense of how quickly uh, they come in and we're seeing uh, another driver swap going on here. Yep, so that's uh, the 18 car Rodrigo Almeida out Bernardo Pinheiro in uh, Almeida was quite a late addition to the entry list actually uh, he wasn't on my uh, on my sheets uh, 
uh, unfortunately, uh, my uh, my research sheet, he wasn't there because I think he got added on Thursday or maybe Wednesday. <laughs> uh, but uh, that is often the way with the prototype wind series and wind series in general. Uh, teams will uh, spot a, a young pro and say, you know what, we want to give you a shot. Come down to wind series and have a go at it. Yeah. And it is two Portuguese drivers here, Almeida and Pinheiro. And uh, Portimao uh, is really the jewel in the crown of the, of the Portuguese racing scene. I've heard that from a lot of people including significant staff members at Estoril, uh, so you know it's true. And uh, I'm sure they're taking great pleasure uh, in driving this circuit in an MP3 car for what I believe is the first time. As this car gets uh, prepared to head back off, Danny Sufi uh, is coming in as well in the number seven uh, Conrad Motorsport Ligier JSP320. Of course, we saw him have mechanical issues, electrical issues, uh, he confirmed to me last night. Um, so Danny Sufi will be looking uh, to try and get a, at least a podium out of this one. But of course, he and all of the Silver Plus uh, entries are all going to have to uh, have that 151 second in the second stop in the pits. And that's going to skew things a bit for them. Yeah, this is the point in the race, isn't it, Adam? As you, you know very well, where we just wait to find out what yeah. the actual situation is. And, <laughs> and then the chase begins, so yeah. to speak, uh, which makes these races very exciting to watch uh, as the clock ticks down and we see uh, the drivers chasing that and I think they I think that they enjoy that the, the pro drivers don't they if they get in no right you've got a 10 second gap to chase down and you've got 22 minutes to do it uh, yeah. go after go after a race win I think drivers like Danny CP love a challenge like all hunting dogs like chasing <laughs> rabbits at the end of the day. Um, two minutes and ten seconds left of the pit window then, so uh, they could do another lap just as long as they don't make an error or something. I've seen that happen before, missing the pit window because of a spin. Oh dear. Uh, but Brigacek and Daniel Karlwitz are both uh, due a stop. One of them comes past my pit window, the other does not. Karlwitz is in. Wyatt Brigacek and DKR Engineering willing to uh, push it right to the limit of the window. So Chris Short obviously has been rather magnanimous and said, no, let the youngster take the entirety of the stint that he can. Although I must say, Chris Short is quite a quick bronze. Uh, so I think he might be underselling himself a little bit uh, with the team strategy. Uh, Karlwitz in though, and the gold rated numerous time GT driver uh, driving, ch driving champion, I should say, will now hand over to Steve Paro, or Sparrow, as it says on the side of the car. You'll be unsurprised <laughs> to hear that's not his actual name, but uh, Paro always, uh, always good for a laugh, along with his uh, buddy Christian Hook. And uh, it, it's interesting to see, isn't it? Rinaldi Racing running two separate chassis, this being the second of them, the Duquesne. It, it, are they using this as a, as a chance to test the two chassis at all? A team like Rinaldi Racing, they're a very big outfit, do you think? Or is that just the ones that the drivers went for? I think, I think it's the case that Paro owns the Ligier chassis, so right. I think they're just running the car that the bronze has brought to the party. Uh, Danny Sufi heads out on his outlap, and I think he's come out ahead, if I'm not mistaken, of Sandra Holtzam. Yes, he has. Uh, so that is, I think, going to work out as being for third and fourth place, maybe, but the timing screen still uh, in the midst of trying to figure it all out for us. Uh, so that's really interesting. And actually, if you were watching that pit stop close, Mostly uh, for uh, the number 33 Rinaldi car, Sandra Holtzen, it was quite a prolonged gap between the mechanic lifting the lollipop and saying go for it and the car actually moving away. So maybe there was a little bit of problems getting that car into gear for Sandra Holtzen. That would maybe explain uh, why Danny Sufi uh, has got out of there ahead of uh, Sandra Holtzen because, of course, in theory, both of them have 151 second stops attributed to their uh, name. So in theory, they shouldn't really gain or lose too much during the window, but that hasn't proven no. to be the case. No, no. Uh, as uh, we see Kevin Rabin come back out, uh, still blown away that he is peddling round in that uh, when he was in karting. Uh, yellow flag there, Adam, as you're pointing to the screen. Yeah, yellow flag out at turn eight, but for what we don't know, it's not a safety car. There's still green flags uh, showing on the timing screen and everywhere else, but there may well be a car awry or some bodywork or something like that uh, awry around the circuit uh, just over the crest of that hill at turn eight. 
Uh, this is already the green flags by turn nine, but the previous corner there may be something going on. I do note that Julian Lemoyne in the ANS Motorsport car is not registered as having crossed the line last time by. However, that car's already had transponder issues yeah. in this race, so I hesitate to say <laughs> yes. that that's what's happened. Good point. This is when the crests uh, of Portimao uh, are, can be a bit of a nuisance, I guess. Now, is that is that a problem for DKR? I think it might be all right, but uh, certainly the car's been a little bit toasty, and obviously what that could be is something like some tyre build-up there, caught in the air intake, uh, maybe just uh, getting very, very hot uh, in the in the canals as the uh, as the car continues to run. Of course, that 5.6 litre in this MV8 is going to be searing hot, so if there is some tyre build-up that's got stuck in the vent, then that's going to be... Uh, that's going to be an issue, but it should be okay. The car is running. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens with the yellow flag. I did went, I, I did go to point at the screen there, but I realised we are on ah. pit stops, aren't we? So yes. there's going to be some very long lap times. Yes. Uh, so yes, that's not going to be problems for those drivers. That's just going to be a normal pit stop. Not too sure what's uh, happened. I guess we'll wait and find out. Right, so then, uh, the current leader on your timing screens are, is Wyatt Brickercheck, or uh, rather I should say Chris Short, of course, the, uh, the car has now got Chris Short at the wheel, however, he is not leading the race, the current leader, I believe, will be Steve Paro in the 66 Rinaldi racing car with his shorter pit stop. Uh, ah, there we now go. that is the 42 ANS Motorsport car, uh, and I believe that is the inside of turn 7 and 8, so that is... Uh, where that car has come to a rest, uh, but it's well out of the firing line, so uh, yellow flags can easily cover it. Meanwhile, Sufi and Holtzum have found each other again. I don't think they've been separated from each other this weekend or indeed all season, uh, for better or worse so far. Uh, so Sufi and Holtzum running in tandem, but the safety car has been put out wow. onto the circuit. And what this, of course, does is it once again uh, nullifies almost the safety car handicap system uh, sorry the handicap system from the pit stops um which if you're danny sufi if you're sandra holtzum if you're pedro perino uh, to name just three of them that is a big advantage because the the handicap that has put you further back down the order is now nullified but if you're a chris short if you're a steve paro uh, that means suddenly the young pros are going to be all over your rear wing this is going to make for a very interesting last <laughs> really is. 10 to 15 minutes now, isn't it, all of a sudden? Yes, it is. So safety car out then for the first time in this race. And uh, this is definitely, as you said, going to be very, very <laughs> intriguing. Uh, I think for Chris Short, I think he's going to be hoping that Steve Paro gets those elbows out in the early stages, yes. um, sometimes known as gentleman drivers, but he'll be uh, encouraging Steve Paro to be something of a lout in the battle for second place. If that gives you an idea of the gap he did have. There's, mm. He's all by himself with the safety car. There you can see absolutely no one behind him, but they are going to now close up uh, behind that safety car. And some pretty quick drivers behind are going to close up and be right on the back of him in the likes of Danny Sufi, a winner this season, mm. Sandra Holtzim, who was uh, leading yesterday and will be desperate to make up for that spin he had uh, as well, Adam. Yeah, of course, and uh, I did say that I thought uh, Steve Parrow would be past Chris Short, but actually Short did have a slightly short pit stop. Uh, <laughs> oh, <man>. um, <laughs> but uh, it is the DKR engineering car in the lead then. There's your top four all in the same picture. Uh, Pedro Perino is, of course, going to be looking to uh, try and get involved in that as well once we go back to green flag. And I can only imagine the challenge of that this weekend now, this race for Pedro Perino, because, of course, in qualifying the brakes failed going into turn one or at least that's what the team suspect car went straight on i understand he got even you know stretched off he was okay but as a precautionary measure they wanted to make sure that uh, they didn't uh, do anything too harsh with his back or anything like that um, and now 24 hours later he's not only in the car but he's now faced with the opportunity to go for an overall podium uh, i know that in addition to commentary of course you have uh, you do a, quite the kart racer in your in your younger days yeah how does one deal with that if you have a big accident one day and then just go, OK, I've got to suck it up now because there's a win on the cards? Yeah, mentally, that's going to be very tough for him, isn't it, to uh, to come back? But uh, I think it, it's going to be even 
as weird as it sounds, even extra motivation yeah, to, to go for that win because he's seen his team go hard to work on that car to get it fixed. He might not have seen that himself. I know he had to go and do some voluntary uh, x-rays, but uh, he would have definitely heard about all the work that's gone on. He would have seen a lot of the work that's gone on as well. And I think it won't just be for himself now. He'll want to do this for his team, for his teammates uh, as well. Uh, and uh, this will mean a lot to him uh, as a victory or even just a podium. We, we, we're talking about a victory, you know, fifth to thirst in the space of just over 10 minutes would be quite, a, quite an achievement. But if he can go a couple places and get himself on the podium, uh, that would be a, a huge, huge achievement for him. And I, I think, yeah, as a driver, you put the crash behind you very quickly and uh, a focus on making up for that, not just for yourself, but, but for the guys around you. All three of our uh, broadcast team are putting a shift in right now. Lukas Gajewski has strolled down the pits and found himself a driver to talk to. Let's go down to him. Thank you, guys. I thought the uh, safety car period might be a good point of time to introduce you to one of our local heroes this weekend. Uh, Adam, you spoke about him earlier, Rodrigo Almeida, this time part of the uh, Müller Motorsport LMP3 outfit. And I think, Rodrigo, it was quite a late call, wasn't it? Yeah, it was quite a late call on Friday night. I received a call from my manager. And at least on Fibratix 1. But in Freebatix 1 we have an uh, issue, so I go directly to Quali and then in Quali it goes a little bit wrong, not wrong, but yeah, not so good. But now in race we have some really good pace, we have purple sector 1 and we can fight now with a safety car for the front positions. You are very familiar with GT4 cars. How much running have you already done in LMP3 machinery then? Yeah, it is my first race in a LMP3 uh, car. Uh, the past two years I done in GT4 ADAC and DTM Trophy. Uh, this is my first race and I think it's going really well. I really enjoy it and I love it. So it's one of the most demanding and challenging circuits we have in Europe and you are in an LMP3 car for the first time. What an experience. Yeah, it's an amazing experience. I really like the track also. It's an amazing track, especially on this car. It's really high aero car and it, that's amazing. Now, do you already have your plans sorted for the rest of the season? Will you do more programs in LMP3 cars as well? Yeah, still in process. I, I still don't know what to do this season. I'm testing some classes and and then I decide to do. Now, speaking about the race itself, safety car is out. Do you think this has worked in your favor or against you? I think it's working in our favor because we start from the back. We had a problem in quali and we gained some places, but now with safety car, it's all together. So my teammate can go more to the front. Safety cars back in a second. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Thank you. And just in the nick of time, we go back to green flag racing, we go back to pictures of the cars, and we go back to Danny Sufi. He can't overtake before the safety car line. He has overtaken before the safety car line. Um, unfortunately, I think that one might be fairly clear cut, unfortunately. It's three wide down into the first corner for third place as uh, Steve Parrow gets overtaken now by Sandro Holtzum as well. So Holtzum gets through into third place. Fourth place then for Paro, side by side as, as uh, the 18 car of Bernardo Pinheiro uh, gets past the 66 as well. So Steve Paro falling through the order. It is the number three of Chris Short that leads then from Danny Sufi, from Sandro Holtzum, from Pedro Perino, your top four. Four very quick drivers. The one at the front of the queue, though, is a uh, fast bronze rather than a super silver. And we're going to have to see how he manages to bend these three off. Sufi, the first to approach the rear of the car. He powers out of turn eight. Around the outside, he's going to try and go short. May try and uh, get to, to, to lean on him, but he doesn't. And Sufi moves into the race lead. Holtzum follows him through into second place. And Perino is going to try and make it three from three as they run through turn 12. Third and fourth place will be very close as they come through 12. Short trying to hold it off, of course. Chris was expecting to have that, uh, have that cushion as now diving to the inside uh, goes Pedro Perino. That should be good for third place for him. Yes, Perino is through into P3. My colleague Chris McCarthy is headed off to go and get the... Uh, 
uh, podiums ready uh, for us. So it's back to just myself in the commentary box, but we've still got a Chris in the action, that being Chris Shorts, who's under so much pressure. Bernardo Pinheiro uh, is next up then. He's now trying to get by for fourth place in the Molna Motorsport car, and he succeeds at doing so. Both drivers, Pinheiro uh, and a Rodrigo Almeida, who we heard from just a few moments ago in the pit lane, both seem to have really come on since yesterday. Uh, the progression curve has been spectacular across the weekend from these two youngsters. So Pedro Perino is uh, up into, well, sorry, up into third, fourth place, I should say. Uh, nope, third place. You're right the first time, Adam. And then Bernardo Pinheiro is in P4. Now, can either of them challenge Sufi and Holtzen? The safety car restart is under investigation. Drive-through penalty for Danny Sufi, unfortunately. Uh, so, car seven with a drive-through penalty uh, for the safety car restart overtaking under the safety car restart. So unfortunately for Danny Sufi, uh, that is going to be a drive-through penalty. Conrad Motorsport car will have to idle through the pit lane, and that's going to cost Sufi about 30 seconds. And of course, uh, 30 seconds uh, after a safety car is effectively going to drop Sufi down to the back of the pack. He comes in for the drive-through penalty now, gets the car stopped and will now have to trundle through the pit lane at an agonising low number of kilometres an hour. I think it's 80 kilometres an hour. That is uh, certainly not enough to get a rush of speed and adrenaline and certainly enough to drop him down to the back of the pack. I also hear from Lukas Gajewski that Kevin Rabin has been into the pit lane. Some bodywork repairs going on uh, to the front of the ANS Motorsport 71 car. So the only ANS car left standing uh, was walking wounded for a little while. Sandro Holtzum, though, has inherited the race lead, of course, with Danny Sufi having to run through the pit lane. Uh, it is now Holtzum that has the lead of this race, but he also has Pedro Perino and Bernardo Pinheiro just behind him. And uh, certainly for P Perino, as he uh, starts to build some confidence, tries to rediscover his faith in the car after the big impact uh, on Saturday in qualifying. He may well just be able to challenge Holzer before the end of this race. There are six and a half minutes of the race left to run. And the uh, number 88 Ligier, uh, driven by the former Formula 4 racer, Pedro Perino. He raced in the Italian in the ADAC championships before uh, moving into uh, Prototype Cup journey in Germany and the European Le Mans Series last year. Now making his first effort in the Prototype Winter Series this weekend. Of course, they didn't get to race yesterday. The car still being repaired after the qualifying smash. So this is into Europol's chance to uh, come out of this race with some silverware. And they're going to take it with both hands, as will their young driver. And no doubt that Perino has the confidence in the car because a 138.732 was the previous lap. It was only a few hundredths quicker uh, than Sandro Holtzen. But nonetheless, it's testament to the fact that Pedro Perino is pushing uh, just under two seconds back from Sandro Holtzum in the 33 car. So the top two run through the fifth corner of the lap, the tight hairpin overlooked by the impressive tower here at the Autodromo Internacional do Algarve. And I think that uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Holtzman and Perino are pretty much equidistant. I say un unfortunately because it would be very good to see the two of them duke it out, but they seem to be strong, admittedly, in different areas of the circuit, which is interesting. That may be a legacy of the two different cars, of course. A 30.996 in the first sector for Holtzman. That was two tenths quicker than Perino. Perino was then two tenths quicker through the middle sector of the lap. You saw Holtzman there locking the car, locking the brake into turn 13 uh, so Holtzum struggling a little bit through that corner but in general these two seem to be about equal although we'll see what the third sector brings for Perino he certainly looks 
maybe a couple of tenths closer as he comes through the final corner of the lap. And indeed, he has uh, shaved another tenth off the gap. 1.8 seconds then between Holtzam and Perino. Uh, Danny Sufi has rejoined the race, incidentally, in sixth position. Let's run through the order at this stage of the race. It is Sandra Holtzam leading from Pedro Perino. There's Bernardo Pinheiro, third overall in the Molna Motorsport car. Chris Short is next for DKR Engineering in a fourth position. Then it's Steve Paro. Uh, who is coming under increasing pressure from Danny Sufi. Danny Sufi is 3.3 seconds back, but he's five seconds a lap faster than Steve Paro. So I suspect that Danny Sufi is soon going to be looking for his way past into fifth position. And uh, Sufi will be looking to try and salvage some points, of course, after that uh, drive through penalty uh, served at the end. Uh, of that safety car period uh, just overtook Steve Paro a little bit too early. And now, ironically, it's Steve Paro that he's hunting down uh, for that uh, fifth position. They head through turn seven and eight at the moment as we overlook uh, the Autodroma Internationale de Algarve. There is Sufi lapping Leah Mauer, but then just ahead of him uh, is Steve Paro. And again, that gap was 3.3 uh, seconds at the line it's already down to something like two seconds if not less uh, as they go through turns 11 and 12 so i think it could be a matter of when not if here uh, in this scrap between paro and sufi but steve paro would no doubt like a top five finish he can if he can possibly hold off the young american racer sufi in his first full season running a ligier with conrad motorsport uh, certainly has his grip on the car. Unfortunately, that drive-through penalty costing him a shot at victory. He will be most uh, aggrieved with that, I'm sure. But he's now in the wheel tracks of Paro. Paro is surely not going to be able to hold off that momentum out of the final turn from Danny Sufi. Sufi to the inside of Paro. And that was very, very academic from uh, Danny Sufi. Just got the job done. Slingshotted past Paro. And Danny Sufi is up into fifth place. His next target is Chris Short, some 8.8 .8 seconds uh, further up the road. It isn't quite doable, I don't think, in the minute and 35 seconds plus one lap we've got. Although, well, that is three laps, actually. So maybe, maybe, maybe he can get there. But it is going to be a close run thing for fourth place on the final lap of the race. Uh, Pedro Perino has taken another few tenths out of the race leader. So Sandro Holtzum uh, is, is starting to see the all-carbon into Europe old car a little bit closer uh, in the rear view mirror, which I'm sure will be stealing his attention away uh, a little bit as they continue on around the Autodroma Internacional do Algarve. You see Leah Mauer setting a good pace there as well in the racing experience car, but of course she is a couple of laps down, so she's not a factor in this battle. The gap between the top two is down again, 1.169 seconds the gap, so Perino has taken three tenths out of Holtzum on the last two laps. Uh, so uh, over the course of the last two laps, he's uh, gained six tenths on our race leader. So Sandro Holtzum uh, is under pressure here. He's got uh, one lap and two thirds left to go. The clock will hit zero this time. And then we have the plus one lap at the end of the race. Uh, so uh, one and a half laps, Pedro Perino with his eye in. Of course, Perino, before the brakes failed in yesterday's qualifying session, he'd already set a time good enough for pole position in that qualifying session. So Perino has been our quickest driver here this weekend. So it's absolutely in the realm of possibility that he could do this, but he is running out of time with which to do it. And Sandro Holtzum, uh, a very experienced driver, not in the business of making too many unforced errors. We did see one yesterday, but he's in a strong position here from the race lead. But Pedro Perino would love to end the weekend on a high. Certainly a tricky weekend uh, for Pedro. They head now through turn 14 of the lap then. And then 15 will follow. And Pedro Perino 
Athens may be going to find a way in this final lap to at least challenge. I think the gap is down again. Yes, it is. 0.6 of a second. OK, uh, so that is getting uh, very, very close indeed. We'll keep an eye on that uh, fourth to fifth delta as well as they come across the line next time because uh, that is also going to be close on the final lap of the race but it's the battle for the lead that we're going to focus on on this final lap of course and Pedro Perino uh, is looking to make it a bit of a race uh, to the line Holtzum leads him into turn five and look at Perino he was later on the brakes there into turn five uh, certainly uh, has absolute faith in what's going on under his left foot. 1.7 seconds between Short and Sufi as well, so don't be surprised if Danny Sufi emerges in fourth place at the end of this race. However, Pedro Perino is looking at any chance he can to emerge in the lead. He's got a couple of strong breaking zones between himself and the chequered flag. Can he get past Sandro Holtzum? He takes a wide berth at turn 11 to try and line up turn 12. They sweep down and now back uphill towards 12 and 13. Perino not able to get it done there. Turn 14 is a very difficult place to get a move done, but he might try and dive up the inside. He does not. Turn 15, well, if your driver ahead of you gets it wrong, you could maybe get a good run up to the finish line, but I think Sandro Holtzum has done enough. Holtzum in the Rinaldi Racing, Duquesne D08 takes the last quarter perfectly. He will win the prototype Winter Series race number two at Portimao. Perino, half a second back. Pinheiro will take third. Now, what about Chris Short and Danny Sufi in the battle for fourth place? Which order will they come out in? Uh, because Chris Short was being closed up by Danny Sufi. Who will come across the line in fourth? There is Sufi. He's ahead of Chris Short. So Danny Sufi recovers to fourth place. But a disappointing weekend. The drive through in this race, the electrical gremlins in race one. Sad to see that Sufi didn't manage to. Uh, act on his potential within that race but he takes fourth place ahead of Chris Short in fifth sixth place will go to Steve Parrow of course along with Daniel Karlwitz across the line behind him is Leah Maurer taking eighth position uh, and the only other car left across the line is Kevin Rabin in the Nova Proto and that car is a way further back about 45 seconds behind those two uh, after Kevin Rabin visited pit lane so a uh, Kevin Rabin uh, not due across the line for a little while he will eventually finish seventh place and of course he'll win the uh, Nova class he's the only one out there uh, on the grid but great success uh, for Sandro Holtzum in that race the Rinaldi racing 33 car is our winner there's Rabin across the line in seventh position Liam Maurer a lap down behind him but a great performance then from Pedro Perino in the final stage of that race. He couldn't quite reward his team with a race victory for repairing that into Europol this year. He does, however, secure second place in that race. The Rinaldi Racing 33 is our race winner, Sandro Holtzum, uh, with Rinaldi Racing. Another success for him. A solid weekend in general uh, for the Rinaldi racing driver. Uh, of course, the pro drivers this time, uh, these are the ones that were in the second phase of the race. Uh, this time around, the, uh, the safety car that came, uh, came in a manner that uh, actually helped them. Yesterday, it certainly hindered them. Uh, the safety car coming out before the pit window, nullifying any advantage that, uh, that they gained in the first phase of the race. Uh, with the pit stop handicaps in place. But Sandro Holtzum, uh, a deserving winner of that race. And uh, even though Perino was coming on strong, he did manage to stave off those advances. Of course, the fastest lap of the race uh, came from Danny Sufi, ultimately. Sufi, a 138.397, the fastest lap of the race, uh, just a few hundredths quicker than Daniel Kalvitz, who was uh, on form early on in the Rinaldi Racing 66 car. Good work then from this young man, Sandra Holtzum, who uh, will be turning some heads maybe among the prototype teams. Um, here in the prototype win series has of course uh, 
in racing GTs recently. And uh, we'll see what his plans are going forward, but certainly currently doing a fabulous job in the prototype winter series. Race win number two of the season uh, for him. And that is because, of course, uh, the race win was given to the car uh, after the red flag in race number one. There's Lukas Gajewski pursuing Sandra Holtzum. Uh, media duties, sir, please come back to us. And I'm sure that uh, we'll hear from uh, Lucas and Sandro uh, within the next couple of minutes, if at all possible. And uh, then we will, of course, have the podium ceremonies once again with Chris McCarthy uh, before, the, uh, before the switching of focus towards the GT cars, our next race. Two races already in the books. This morning is uh, flying by, just gone 10 past 11 local time uh, here at the Autodromo Internacional do Algarve. And uh, the safety crews just uh, doing a bit of a check lap then to make sure that uh, everything is A-OK -okay around the circuit. It just looked like the ANS Motorsport car of uh, Julian Lemoyne pulled up. Uh, so I don't think there was any uh, particular carbon fiber to collect uh, from that one. But in general, the crews uh, making sure that the track is clear, safe and ready to go uh, for our next race, which is, of course, a 30-minute sprint uh, in the GT Winter Series. The second prototype Winter Series race, 50 minutes plus one lap, and it was down to six-tenths of a second at the end of the race. Certainly an entertaining one, and one that Sandra Holtzum came out on top of. The Rinaldi Racing 33 crew, uh, who of course had to work so hard to repair that car uh, after the collision with Danny Sufi on Saturday in Estoril. Uh, unfortunately, the car still had a drive shaft issue and couldn't take the start on Sunday. Uh, however, uh, here at Portimao, the running has been clean. The car has been faultless. And uh, Sandro Holtzum we is now ready to chat with Lukas Gajewski. So let's go down there. Thank you very much, Adam Weller. Sandro Holzem, your winner in the second race of the Prototype Winter Series here in Portimao. Congratulations. That was a very, very exciting finale, wasn't it? Yeah, it was uh, very tight at the end. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, looking for the track limits because I had all uh, four and uh, one more than we had to drive through. So uh, I took a little bit out on turn one and everything. And then in the end was a little bit tight, but uh, yeah, at the end we win and uh, that's uh, what all about. Huh? And you jumped out of the car. It actually took some time for the rest of the team to appear to celebrate with you because, of course, they've got a busy day ahead of them, ahead of them as well. Yeah, we have also a GT3 here, so uh, the team has uh, really much work to do. So, um, but uh, yeah, really big thank to the team, Rinaldi Racing. Um, yeah. I'm really happy for the result. You've had a fantastic journey last year with your first appearances in DTM. Where do you see your future in 2024? Is it going to be a bit of GT3, a bit of LMP3, a bit of both? I think it's going to be a bit of both. Uh, the LMP3 car is really nice to drive. It's like a formal car. Um, a lot of aerodynamics and everything. Um, but uh, for sure, we will uh, see uh, me again in the GT3 this year. And uh, we're looking forward for this year. We've got quite many viewers tuning in from uh, Germany. Let's say hi in Pavota auf Deutsch nach Hause. Um, yeah, wie gesagt, ich danke meinen Sponsoren, Cologne Watch und Rodopi und äh, großen Dank an Renaldi Racing, die das hier alles ermöglicht haben. Um, yeah, wir werden in der Zukunft sehen, was was noch wird. Aber ich denke beides LMP3 und GT3. Um, aber wie gesagt, es ist schön neue Erfahrungen zusammen im LMP Sport. Um, Aber ich denke trotzdem, dass der Weg weiter im GT3 auf jeden Fall gehen wird. Der Sieger, your winner, Sandro Holzem. Thank you very much. Thank you. There you go. A multilingual interviewer is a great thing to have. Lukas Gajewski uh, having a chat in two languages there with Sandro Holzem. Uh, the young German claiming a win in the prototype winter series for the second time this year. He will be up on the podium in a few short minutes uh, with Chris McCarthy and the rest of our podium finishers. The prototype winter series race 
again very compelling and the prototype winter series will now take a little bit of a sabbatical uh, from the winter series weekends uh, to avoid clashes with the Asian Le Mans series uh, the cars will skip February and we'll see them again at Aragon uh, in the first weekend of March so we look forward to seeing the prototype wind series cars back out there at Aragon uh, Jerez and uh, and Valencia uh, the slot filled uh, will be filled by the Formula Wind Series cars and then of course all four categories are there for uh, Aragon and Barcelona so that's going to be a very full paddock probably some bedlam down at Mick Food as everyone tries to get their, their lunch in at hospitality uh, but uh, they're well equipped for that and uh, it will be uh, it will be a very good end to the season with all four of the Giedlich Racing categories concluding their champion Championships, and I think Sandra Holtzman will be well positioned in that championship uh, at the conclusion of uh, of this weekend. Uh, he was second in the championship, first of the drivers here this weekend in the championship at the conclusion uh, of Estoril. And uh, with the results he's had this weekend, I suspect he will work out as the championship leader. Uh, so that will be a huge positive for him as well uh, in the prototype winter series. Less than six tenths of a second between us at the end of the race, which was uh, absolutely fabulous to see. And I'm sure that Sandra and Pedro Perino are currently uh, debriefing, having a little chat uh, about the race that was, and uh, I'm sure smiles all round uh, as they do so. These uh, young drivers with an amount of camaraderie, that much is for certain, uh, albeit, of course, uh, sometimes things can go a little bit awry. Uh, and I understand... We do have a few replays that we can cut to. A few moments from the second prototype win series race at Portimao. So then uh, we had some very uh, feisty racing early on uh, as the Muller Motorsport car was making up positions. Danny Sufi and Daniel Karlwitz were at it again uh, as they were last time out at Estoril. Two very fun sparring partners to watch, it must be said. Karlwitz, though, getting past Sufi this time around and he would charge up towards Sandra Holtzum. He got past Sandra Holtzum as well with a big flick of the tail through turn 12. Uh, but then... Uh, Danny Sufi, I think this is, uh, yes, getting past Steve Paro uh, towards the end of the race. That is, of course, because uh, Danny Sufi had a drive-through penalty. Kalvitz uh, handed over to Steve Paro. And uh, Paro, unfortunately, with the safety car, eating away at the advantage that Daniel Kalvitz had left for him. Uh, that ultimately meant uh, that Sufi could get back up to fourth place in spite of that drive-through penalty. Uh, but he'll be disappointed. I'm sure he'll uh, come back. Uh, rallying uh, with uh, with a, uh, an eye on some more race victories uh, when we head to Aragon on the first weekend of March. Understand that the uh, the fast lane is open for the GT Winter Series, so I imagine uh, that as Chris is uh, getting everyone rounded up for the podium, he's probably starting to have to shout over some GT cars, and that problem is only going to get worse as the podium ceremony goes on. Thankfully, just one of the podiums this time around, of course, for the LMP3 cars, and Kevin Rabin usually hops on there as well as the Nova Proto class winner, so he's not going to have to try and conduct too many podium ceremonies uh, as the GTs warm them themselves up uh, but he will be ready to go in the next couple of minutes great to see spectators in the stands once again here at the Autodroma Internacional do Algarve yes uh, not uh, the fullest grandstand it is a mighty big grandstand to try and fill but a lot of uh, our uh, a lot of our local fans here at Portimao looking coming along having a look at the winter series package uh, since tickets since spectator access is free and uh, they will be treated in a few moments' time to a full uh, grid of numerous different types of GT car. The GT Winter Series, always a highlight of a Winter Series weekend. We're expecting well in excess of 20 cars to take the start of that race uh, within the next few moments. And uh, I'm braced and ready. I hope you are too. Uh, it's always dramatic when those cars head out onto the circuit. There's a little bit of everything uh, in the Winter Series weekend. The, the prototypes will shake your teeth out. The GT4 guys will uh, 
showcase some of the very best racing you're going to find at this time of year. And uh, the GT Winter Series is just the ultimate variety show in terms of uh, in terms of big GT3 cars. Of course, the GT3s are out there, but you've also got a lot of the single make cup cars as well. Chris McCarthy will now be down there at the podium. So let's go down to him now. Thank you, Adam. Uh, great to have the prototype Winter Series back out there again. What a thrilling end to the race that was. Uh, once again, a safety car, and that led to a cracking end to the race. Great job uh, on the commentary once again to uh, Adam. Let's get uh, the podium underway because our GT Winter Series cars are just heading out uh, onto the track. So we're going to bring our top three uh, teams uh, out overall. Let's start with our third place team. They drove a brilliant race. Uh, that went to uh, Team number 18, Molna Motorsport, uh, Ber uh, Bernardo Pinera and Rodrigo Almeida. Come on, guys. Let's give a round of applause down and up in the grandstand, please, as well. Round of applause for third place. Well done, guys. It's going to get quite messy down here as well. You can spray that champagne uh, when we start celebrating. Uh, what a turnaround it was for this team. Uh, for those of you guys uh, in the grandstand, these guys had a big crash in qualifying. The team had to work really hard. Uh, one of the drivers, Pedro, still suffering with his back, had to go to the hospital yesterday, but came back. The team have worked very hard to get the car fixed. So, so close to taking the win, but nevertheless, a big turnaround. They've got themselves from not even racing yesterday to on the podium today. So a huge round of applause to second place into Europol, Sebastian Graveland and Pedro Pinero. Pedro Perino and Sebastian Graveland onto the podium. Well done, guys. Well done, Pedro. Well done. That was absolutely fantastic. But just just holding on uh, to the race win under huge pressure at the end. But put on a great defensive performance when required. The win going to the number 33, Rinaldi Racing, Sandro Holtzum. Well done, Sandro. And we also had our Class N winner, of course, as well. Let's get him onto the podium. That went to number 71, Kevin Rabin. Come on, Kevin. Well done, Kevin. 16 years old, Kevin. Let's go. Well done. Now, we've heard from our winners uh, uh, down there. So uh, I want to speak to Pedro uh, Perino uh, because, uh, uh, well, both of you guys, really. I want to speak to yourself as well, Sebastian. Uh, I'll just, uh, we'll make this as unawkward as possible. Uh, uh, Pedro, uh, I know uh, you're still feeling a little bit sore. Uh, tell us how it feels to have had that incident, what you've gone through and, and how it feels now to come back and get on the podium. I mean, uh, it's quite tough. Uh, yesterday I spent the entire day on the hospital. It's not fun at all. Uh, taking blood, a lot of tests. I don't enjoy it. I hate that. Uh, it was the biggest crash in my career so far, pulling 16 Gs. Uh, it's impressive that I'm okay. And yeah, it's uh, really good to do a podium, second uh, to the team. Thank you to the team for the hard work and thank you to my teammates as well for the nice job. And yeah, it's nice to do a podium at home always. Well, we may not be able to hear you so well down there, but we can hear you on the live stream, the camera just up there. Uh, Sebastian, yourself as well, of course, you're part of this team, played a big role in that. How does it feel to be on the podium? Yeah, it's great, it's uh, my first race ever in the car and uh, what a better way to end on the podium. So yeah, I'm happy. Great stuff. Uh, guys, great to have you on the podium. I'm sure once you're feeling 100% as well, can we, we push on and get that win, do you think? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, my back is a bit sore and T1 it was very, very difficult, but I always trust in myself and I think I should have got the win, but, you know. You're very, very close. We've made a fantastic race. Uh, well done, guys. Well done to our, our, our top three and our class in winner. Give them a round of applause, guys, up in the crowd and also down here as well. Uh, we'll get our trophies presented uh, to uh, our top three and our Class N winner uh, as well. We will get our pictures taken. Let's get you all up on the top step, please, guys. And we will get all our pictures taken. And now, guys, that is yours to do what you want with. Feel free to make as much mess as possible. No, it's not. 
We've got the cameras ready. Make some mess, guys. You put in a lot of hard work. Let's go for it. Look, the cameras are here ready. Make some noise for the guys as we spray the champagne on the podium for the first time today in the prototype winter series. <laughs> Fantastic job, guys. Pedro, Pedro's going after Sebastian Graveland around there. Uh, and with that, we are going to get ready for our next race because down below me, we are making a lot of noise on the grid. And that's because it is time for the second sprint race in the GT Winter Series. The second race of the weekend for the GT Winter Series coming up next live from Portimao. More than 20 cars, most of them GT3s. However, this championship has always been about many other classes, many other teams and many other drivers. One of them is Alex Hart. He's standing next to the lap time performance Porsche number two yesterday in great podium contention, Alex. And then it was heartbreak, wasn't it? Yes, it really was. So uh, I think the pace was good. The uh, car was ve very great. And for the first race, yeah, it would have meant a lot to me, but you're never into it. So, yeah. But what happened yesterday? Uh, the crankshaft uh, sensor died. So that was actually the problem. And then the engine shut down and yeah, that was it. However, that's one of the beauties of GT Winter Series, isn't it? You have a Porsche Cup car and you are still able to fight against GT3 spec cars. Yes, of course. For, uh, for the first race, I think we can be very happy. And uh, yeah, let's hope that it will continue like this. All the best for the endurance race later on, Alex, where, of course, he will be back in the car alongside Marco Dedelo, who is now in the car, accompanied there by uh, Oliver Reile, who is a racing driver himself on the uh, Nordschleifen, uh, on the Nürburgring Nordschleife. What must he here? Morgen, Oli. What are you doing here? Yeah, I'm just helping lap time performance uh, as well, as you know me from, from the Nürburgring Nordschleife as well. Yeah, uh, I do the team management here for lap time performance and, uh, yeah. It's a nice weather, better to be here uh, as, as in Germany. Much better than on the Nordschleife, we can definitely tell. Are you likely to be in a race car as well in GT Winter Series? No, 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 not me. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me, I have 100 kilos, uh, this is too much. Well, you say that, thanks Oli, I can tell you, he is a very, very rapid racing driver along the uh, Nürburgring Nordschleife in a Series 3 Renault Clio. That would be something as well for this package, wouldn't it? Uh, you can see uh, some of the cars missing, of course, that is what happens in multi-class racing over the course of the weekend. You can see various other cars from the Porsche Cup class around us. There is the uh, 911 car, of course, a former championship winning car. You can actually still see it on the front. There it is. Meister 2023. That's champion 2023. Of course, this being the uh, winning car last year. Not entered by this team. They had to buy this car after the accident last weekend in Estoril. There is another uh, very quick Porsche Cup car. The Pablo Brass driven 951 car, second place yesterday in Cup 2 and out front of course it's going to be the battle amongst the two GT3 Mercs with Kenneth Heyer and the number 11 SR racing car and young Finn Wiebelhaus who is using GT Winter Series to prepare himself for an ADAC GT Masters campaign. He's on pole position, that's your grid for the second race of the GT Winter Series. So then the GT Wind Series grid is already rolling for their 30 minute sprint race. This is their formation lap. We understand just one of them for the GTs. 
it is Finn Weibelhaus who will be on pole position in the Haupt Racing Team Mercedes AMG GT3. Kenneth Heyer is going to be alongside him in the 11 car. Uh, row th two of the grid will be Adrian Lewandowski. Uh, Lewandowski would be joined by Matthias Lizowski. However, uh, Matthias not taking the start in the PTT racing Porsche. Adrian Lewandowski then will be alone on row two of the grid. Row three is Good Speed Racing's Piotr Vera uh, in the uh, Mercedes AMG GT3. Villico Motorsports Pablo Brass alongside him on row three. Row four, Rakar Motorsports, the Andro Martins and the ex Cap Finger Porsche 992 car. Uh, is the SSR performance car out there in this one? I haven't seen it yet, but I might not have noticed it yet. Uh, Leandro, uh, Leonardo, sorry, set to take the start, but doesn't look like he's going to be there. Unfortunately, uh, row four of the grid, B, uh, row five of the grid, uh, BDR competition, uh, Alfredo Hernandez, alongside that time performances, uh, Marco Dedelov. Row six of the grid, Hubert Darmetko and Pierre Ellett. Row seven, lap time performances, Demir Hot alongside Helen Racing and Tor Haugen. Those two always seem to scrap. Morton Stromstead on row eight of the grid in his older Porsche Cup car alongside AF Corsa's John Dillon. Row nine, Autosport Racing's Milos Pavlovich alongside Uwe Lauer for the Biamaka Racing. Uh, row ten of the grid is AF Corsa, Motohiko Isazaki. Uh, at the wheel of that 488 alongside PTT Racing's Igor Klyer. Row 11 to Lil Shair in the AF Corsa 220 alongside Premislav Bienkowski in the 33. Row 12, Villico Mode Sports Pedro Brass alongside Pedro Silvero. And uh, we're expecting Benedict Seibt at the back of the order in the number 128 Porsche. So then yesterday it was Finn Weibelhaus and Kenneth Heyer, uh, sorry, and uh, Jamo Hartling that had a brilliant battle at the front of the pack. This time, the young Jamo Hartling, uh, rather inexperienced in GT3 cars, has been replaced by the vastly experienced number 11 driver, Kenneth Heyer. Uh, let's see what Heyer can do then up against young Finn Weibelhaus in his first weekend of GT3 racing. What can Weibelhaus do? And also keep an eye on uh, Lewandowski as well. We're expecting it to be Adrian again. Is he doing both of these uh, sprint races? Yes, he is. That's uh, quite a surprise. It seems as though Lewandowski is driving solo this weekend without the, far, the help of his father, Andre. He'll have the power of that Lamborghini Super Trofeo car off the line so he could play interference against the AMG GT3s. The lights will go out and we will be racing in the GT Winter Series. And it is a good start from the inside of the front row from Haupt Racing Team Finn Weibelhaus. He leads into the first corner. To the inside then goes Piotr Vera. Uh, but not being able to move up from fourth as everybody else scrambles to find some track space in the early stages of this one. Does seem like we've got a few gaps in the grid, but still a huge amount of GT racing power going through the first few corners of the lap. Tor Haugen going around the outside there of the number 30 in the hands of Alessio Ruffini. At least it should be Ruffini at the wheel. Milos Pavlovich was set to start the car according to the assigned drivers list, but I suspect that it will be Ruffini in the car for this second race. There is the Rakar Motorsport 911 car then, uh, in very familiar Huber colors, it must be said. Uh, he's pursuing Piotr Vera then uh, on board with him in the Rakar Motorsport car. Great to have these onboard shots. You can see uh, how uh, Leandro Martins is fighting away uh, with that car. Uh, on board with him, up through 10 and 11 we go. And you see the different approaches there to 10 and 11. Piotr Vera uh, taking a wider berth at the turn 10 apex. Others decide to uh, uh, go to the inside line and then drift outward for turn 11 turn in. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> a bit of uh, a late breaking moment there for Leandro Martins. Piotr Vera certainly breaking earlier just ahead of him. It looks to me as though we've already got one car home free at the front of the order. Finn Weibelhaus looks like he has absolutely disappeared up ahead of Kenneth Heyer uh, at the front of the pack. And sure enough, yes, uh, Finn Weibelhaus, uh, no less than 3.1 seconds clear at the conclusion of the first lap. So uh, Weibelhaus having a very good start to this race. 
Higher from Lewandowski, from Vera, from Leandro Martins, your top five. Then it's Padre Brass in sixth place. Marco Dedlov just behind him. So uh, that there, just going through shots, is your Porsche Cup class uh, leaders, uh, the Cup 2 class as it's known. John Dillon up there as well. Oh, and an intra-Ferrari battle as the GT3 of Torhaugen uh, sides past uh, the Japanese racer Motohiko Isozaki uh, in the Ferrari Challenge car. Uh, John Dillon under some pressure then from Demir Hot. Uh, we've seen them go to wheel to wheel a couple of times already this season, particularly at Estoril. Igor Playa and Hubert Darmetko equally have shared the track several times. Motohiko Isozaki there with a big sideways moment out of turn five, did a good job of catching that slide. Thor Haugen then in the GT3 car looking to use the potential of that GT3 machine and work his way through the order over the course of this 30 minute race. Sprint race of course, no pit stops to consider. This is a flat out sprint and at the moment sprinting definitely flat out is Finn Weibelhaus. He is uh, very, very fast indeed. The 33 car having a moment on the exit I think of turn eight there. Uh, that is uh, Premislav Bienkowski having a moment. There's Uwe Lauer, race winner. Last time out in Estoril in race two no less. This time around in race two he's a little way further down the order in 18th place. Tor Haugen looking to the inside there of Hubert Darmetko. Uh, Uwe Lauer then trying to get his way past Motohiko Isozaki, who's already somewhat shown his cards because, of course, Motohiko had a lot of uh, oversteer coming out of turn five, so maybe feeling a bit unsettled in the car. And that means that Uwe Lauer is going to perhaps sense an opportunity uh, as he continues to pursue. Uh, the Japanese racer in this intra-class battle. Battle for second, oh goodness me, four cars in one big scrum there. The 32 leading the way, the older 991.2 specification Carrera Cup car. This is the battle for 13th overall, and uh, Hubert Darmetko not able to find a way past him. Equally interesting scrap for 10th overall, John Dillon. Uh, just ahead there of Demir Hot. It's the battle for 12th place behind them uh, because already through on this lap has gone Morton Stromstead. So uh, Igor Klyer has fallen behind him on this lap in the battle for 12th overall. There is Stromstead who has uh, done some racing in F4 uh, along with his son actually. Uh, but Morton Stromstead uh, in the older 991 car proving uh, that you can still go very, very quickly in the older Porsche Cup machinery. It's great to see some of the older cars making an appearance as John Dillon uh, still going very defensive up against Demir Hot. What a brilliant scrap we've got between those two uh, this weekend. And uh, John Dillon, uh, I think, may have to give way. Yes, Demir Hot uh, gets through, but Dillon should have the power advantage down the main straight. So if he gets a good run through the last couple of corners, uh, he might well fire back. Meanwhile, Hubert Darmetko has gotten back past uh, Stromstead as well. Tor Haugen looking to try and find a way past Stromstead equally uh, in the uh, in the GT3 spec Ferrari 488. Look at all these different specifications of cars. Look at all this brilliant battling. This is GT Winter Series at its finest. Huge gaggle of cars coming down the main straight at the moment. John Dillon nowhere near close enough to Demir Hot. Tor Haugen now under some pressure from Igor Klaya. He's lost a couple of places recently, but he gets two of them back albeit with a healthy assist from the runoff area on the outside of turn one. Uh, he's now going to get re-overtaken by both parties. Tor Haugen gets through. Uwe Lauer having a look to the inside of Motohiko Isazaki. And we have an issue by the looks of it for Piotr Vera in the 14 car. He was running in fourth place, but he's now limping that car around the circuit. And that doesn't look like a recovery from a spin. That looks like a car that simply will not go, unfortunately. Hopefully he doesn't stop there. It looks as if he's really struggling to find any forward momentum at all. He's right there on the racing line as well. So hopefully everyone's had their morning coffee and uh, realizes that car is there. Tor Haugen, oh, into the rear of the 32 of Morton Stromstead. That looked very ambitious. I thought he was lunging to the inside. A carbon fiber flies. Igor Klyer flies off as they go over the crest at turn eight. 
and he's into the barrier by the looks of it. Looks like front end damage on Clyer's 741 car. I think tried to put the power down as they dropped down the hill and there was no chance of keeping that car in a straight line from there. Hubert Darmetko gets past John Dillon with a big flourish as well. Dillon tries to recover back at turn 14. There's the damaged car of Tor Haugen looking decidedly second hand after that collision uh, with the rear of Morton Stromstead. John Dillon did indeed get back past Hubert Darmetko as they now go around the final corner. Now let's see if the Ferrari has the straight line advantage that uh, it does on paper. Certainly looks like they're actually about equal in a straight line despite the uh, much vaunted power figures in the 488 challenge. Evo to the inside line goes Hubert Darmetko. Darmetko should have the inside for turn three. He has the inside for turn two. He gets it done before he even gets to the third corner, the next braking zone on the lap. Stromstead uh, just behind them. This is the battle for 10th, 11th and 12th position overall in this race. We have a, an interesting battle going on for second in Cup 2 as well. Fifth overall, the 951 and the 2 car as Stromstead gets the inside there of John Dillon. They go through past the scene of the accident and the safety car, rather unsurprisingly, has been called out. The safety car is out. So the safety car joins us on the circuit, unfortunately. I note that Christian Hook is now listed as being behind the wheel uh, of the 115 Rinaldi racing car, the Ferrari, for, uh, Ferrari 296 GT3. So maybe Pierre Ellett deciding not to take part in this race. Uh, all information aside from my paperwork suggests that uh, it is in fact Christian Hook at the wheel, so we'll go with that. Christian Hook uh, seemingly has taken that car over. Piotr Vera has got the car back to the pit lane. The limping Mercedes AMG GT3 is into pits. Um, hopefully that gets rectified because we're all very much looking forward to seeing what Vera's co-driver Dan Arrow can do uh, in the endurance race later on. He is one of several very fast co-drivers set to uh, be in the car post uh, pit stops in race three. There you see Tor Haugen's 23 car into the pit lane as well then. So then Finn Weibelhaus is into the race lead, has been in the race lead from the word go of course, but now his lead will diminish significantly. Kenneth Heyer uh, will be reattached to the rear of the Haupt Racing team. Mercedes AMG GT3. There's Adrian Lewandowski as well in third place. Leandro Martins fourth place and leading in Cup 2. Uh, he's just ahead of fellow Cup 2 competitor Pablo Brass. Next up, 6 overall and leading in, uh, in second in Cup 4 uh, is uh, the BDR competition by Grupo Prom entry of Alfredo Hernandez, the Mexican racer. Christian Hook is in uh, eighth place just behind Marco Daedalov. There is Christian Hook in the uh, Ferrari 296 GT3, absolutely gorgeous silhouette on that car. Demir Hot in ninth place. Hubert Darmetko uh, rounding out the top 10. He's also rounding out the top five within the Cup 2 class, the searingly competitive class for the very latest Porsche Carrera Cup cars. Unfortunately, one of them, as you see there, being recovered, Igor Klaier, uh, with a big incident. And of course, there is still a huge piece of carbon fiber from the Pelin Racing Ferrari that's going to need to be collected. I think uh, a few meters away uh, from, uh, still a few meters away from any Marshall post. So that's a uh, carbon fiber off the 488 car uh, is uh, clearly uh, a, uh, an obstacle that will need to be cleared as well. Uh, we have confirmation from down in the pits from Lukas Gajewski that the, uh, the timing screen uh, is giving us false information about Christian Hook. It is Pierre Ellett at the wheel as anticipated. I know Pierre has been looking forward to the sunshine all, all weekend and getting to drive a car in the dry conditions. So I was rather surprised that Pierre wouldn't take the start, but he has indeed taken the start of the race. So thank you to Lukas Gajewski uh, for confirming that uh, he is indeed in the car. Out racing teams, Finn Weibelhaus then leading us at this juncture in the race. 
And uh, we've talked you through the top 10. Let's also mention some of the class leaders further back. Cup three and 11th overall, Morton Stromstead. And of course, just before the pit window, he was in a battle uh, with the 488 Challenge Evo, the Cup one leader, that being John Dillon. So Leandro Martins, I think, might fancy a go at an overall podium here from fourth. He's already leading in Cup 2, and of course the car just ahead of him is Adrian Lewandowski in P3. So I could absolutely see uh, Leandro Martins having a go. And, um, well, you may remember that Leandro Martins was in the wall at Estoril. And uh, the reason was uh, a bit of a side-on-side -side collision from Adrian Lewandowski at the very start of the race. So on multiple fronts, I think Leandro Martins is going to be driving with purpose uh, as the race resumes later on. Lamborghini versus... Is Porsche Super Trofeo versus Cup and uh, Cup 2 versus Cup 4 in GT Winter Series parlance. The mechanics doing some system checks, doing some uh, checks on the struts of the 23 car, the uh, Ferrari 488 GT3. And I uh, think uh, that car won't go any further in this one, but Helen Racing. Just checking out the car, seeing how it is. Igor Klaya, I think, has been summoned back to his 741 car uh, to assist the marshals with uh, removing it uh, from its resting place. The carbon fibre at the top of Turn 8 has now been removed as well, so the marshals have sprung into action there too. Uh, great job from our Portimao marshals as we uh, get this race back underway, hopefully within the next couple of minutes, although... Certainly at least one more lap with the uh, Eagle Clyer car still there and uh, still uh, not moving at this juncture. Hopefully they don't have to crane and flatbed it, but it does rather look like that is going to be the process. And so that means it will probably be another few minutes before uh, the track is fully clear. So for Finn, Finn Weibelhaus, this is a, a bit of a test because, of course, uh, as a young driver, um, you know, every element of their, their game, if you will, does have to be checked. And, of course, any interruption in momentum, being it, be it a slight mistake, be it lap traffic, be it a safety car, um, it can be difficult for, for someone's eye to remain on the ball. So this is a good little, uh, a good little test of Finn Weibelhaus uh, from that perspective for the Haupt Racing team. Uh, it's well known, as Lukas Gajewski said earlier on, that uh, uh, Weibelhaus is uh, set to be within the Haupt Racing team's ADAC GT Masters efforts later in the season. And, uh, well, he could well uh, come into the GT Masters season with uh, some silverware from the GT Winter Series. He's already got a win to his name, of course. A mightily impressive performance as uh, Weibelhaus and Jamo Hartling uh, worked their way through the uh, through the Autodromo International Algarve at uh, record pace. And uh, my apologies, it was of course uh, Jamo Hartling who uh, won the race yesterday. I had a feeling that was wrong as soon as I said it. Uh, Finn Weibelhaus was uh, playing second gunner. Uh, as the two Mercedes AMG GT3s pounded around the circuits at a rate that no other driver could keep up with. Uh, Christian Hook in third place, who was a very solid bronze driver. The best he could do was be 35 seconds off the leaders uh, by the end of the race, which tells you all you need to know about Weibelhaus and, uh, and uh, Jamo Hartling's momentum and speed in that race. Ken Kaya will, I think, uh, relish the opportunity to maybe try and have another go at... Uh, Finn Weibelhaus. The gap had extended quite significantly uh, by the time the race uh, was put under safety car conditions. So I think Haya might try and uh, have a little go at Finn Weibelhaus if he possibly can. So then the four, the 11, the six, your top three. Weibelhaus, Haya and Lewandowski, your top three. There's the Villico Ferrari slowing as everybody concertinas up going through turn eight. That's the uh, one of three cars from uh, Villico Racing on the grid. The other two belonging to uh, Pedro Miguel Brass and Pablo Brass, respectively. Um, two Porsche Cup cars joined 
uh, by the Ferrari Challenge machine. Of course, the field slowing up there through uh, the scene of Igor Klaier's crash. We saw Igor Klaier out of the car and A-OK, -okay, which is, of course, the most important thing. Uh, but now it's the process of recovering the car. I suspect uh, that we are going to end up with something in the realm of 10 minutes of racing. So we're going to have a sprint within a sprint uh, by the end of this one. Uh, we haven't had a bulletin yet to suggest uh, any uh, resumption this time by. So one more lap under safety car looks to be uh, the chosen adventure. I do love that imposing all-carbon fibre number 30 Lamborghini that just went through shot. Alessio Ruffini, uh, brand, brand, brand new to racing, uh, I am told. And he is being uh, coached uh, by Milos Pavlovich, who is uh, anything but brand new to racing, has a lot uh, of experience, not just within uh, Super Trofeo, but elsewhere uh, as well. Milos Pavlovich, uh, a Serbian racer, uh, won in 2014 the Lamborghini Super Trofeo Europe Pro Class and also in the world final as well. Uh, had great success. Less of a successful day for good speed racing, but hopefully they'll come back uh, out in, in race number three. And I mean, look at that. They've got a spare ready to go uh, if that is what they need. Uh, Piotr Rivera and uh, Dan Arrow looking over the car, wondering what comes next. I'm sure we'll find out. Uh, within the next few moments. And uh, I'm understanding it was a, a loose uh, wheel nut on the uh, rear left of this 14 car uh, that caused the stoppage for Piotr Vera. Well, a good job that he realized that was happening underneath him in that case. Uh, just to circle back around to Milos Pavlovich, though, uh, beyond his resume as a, a Lamborghini driver, uh, also raced. Uh, single seaters for many years before that was the 2002 Italian F3 champion and then raced in uh, Formula Renault 3.5 uh, along with the likes of Sebastian Vettel in 2007 uh, third in the championship that year behind Alvaro Parenti, uh, Parente and uh, Ben Hanley uh, so uh, quite a class that year in 2007 of course Sebastian Vettel uh, got called up to Formula 1 halfway through 2007 so he didn't get to complete the full season still managed to finish fourth in that championship though so then the uh, cars are still circulating behind the safety car there is still no bulletin to suggest green flag this time by and well you can see why can't you this uh, this Porsche is proving to be quite the difficult uh, crane job by the looks of it, but they are hopefully going to get that car on the flatbed soon. And you can see the angles. I think that's the main thing that they're having to contend with, the fact that that car, uh, or that truck, I should say, is kind of at an angle uh, relative to the racetrack. And it, it does mean that the, the laws of physics are, are playing a, a difficult role in this uh, recovery uh, for the marshals who'll be looking to get this race back underway as quickly as they possibly can. So Finn Weibelhaus continues to lead them around the circuit. And uh, again, his first weekend in a GT3 machine and he's picked it up in a remarkably quick fashion. Uh, everyone has been searingly impressed uh, with the efforts of, uh, of Finn Weibelhaus to this point. Uwe Lauer looking to uh, go racing again, I think. He's there behind John Dillon. So Lauer's up to 13th position, having uh, won at Estoril uh, this time one week ago. Unlikely to uh, perform that again from uh, from here with nine minutes and 15 seconds left on the clock. However, anything's possible in GT Winter Series. Maybe not that, but almost anything. 13th the first does feel like a stretch, but Uwe Lauer and Francesco Lopez will certainly be an entertaining duo in the uh, endurance race later on. Lopez is a very fast driver, and uh, he is the pro to Uwe Lauer. And we'll see how that goes in the race later on. You see the veritable armada of uh, Porsche 992 Cup cars in amongst all the others. The 992 Cup car, of course, a very popular platform. Um, the 992s often race well outside of the parameters of Porsche Carrera Cup, of course, a very popular endurance racing car. We'll see a good number of them out in uh, 
the Creventic uh, 24 Hours of Dubai next weekend, for instance. And uh, the phenomenon of the Porsche Cup cars being used for endurance racing is certainly not new. You can go back to the 964s and the 993s being used uh, at the Nürburgring 24 hours, for example, uh, into the 90s and early 2000s. The 996s were very popular. There used to be a lot of them entered into the national class uh, of the Spa 24-hour race back when there was a, a multi-class element to that race. Of course, there is still a multi-class element to that race, but purely on driver categorization uh, as opposed to uh, the spec of cars and I think that is something that's sorely missing from a lot of major GT championships these days as much as I love uh, GT3 cars it is nice to have multi-class racing every now and then unfortunately uh, it is a red flag that has just been put out on the timing screen so red flag uh, to the race with 7 minutes and 31 seconds to go. I think that's because the uh, recovery uh, of the Igor Klaia car is proving to be very much a, uh, a Toy Story green alien situation. Uh, they're all going, oh, but there's not really any progress happening at the moment, unfortunately. Uh, we'll have to hopefully get this race back underway, but I suspect we might have uh, hit the threshold for race distance. So I do think this could be it for this race unfortunately we'll have to wait and see uh, Finn Weibelhaus uh, would not want to take a win his first win in a car in this fashion but uh, it does look like that might be the case for the youngster from uh, first uh, for this youngster on his first effort uh, outside of Formula 4 machinery but it does look like he's going to take potentially a race win uh, under red flag and uh, Weibel House, a win is a win, of course. Uh, but I think he might be hoping the race gets back underway and we see a chequered flag. We'll have to wait and see official confirmation as to exactly what the next moves are for our, uh, for our stewards. But... Uh, see now that uh, on the app that uh, Giedlik Racing operate. Uh, we have confirmation that the race will be restarted from Diogo Ferrao of the Race Ready organization, who is uh, uh, a part of the Giedlik Racing chain of command of the GT Wind Series. So that's great news. The race is going to be restarted. Um, often when you get past two thirds distance and there's a red flag, that's sort of it. However, uh, we are going to go racing again. So that is absolutely fabulous news. Uh, thank you to Lucas Gajewski, who had just imparted that was confirmed uh, on uh, the app. I have many screens in front of me. I need to get one of the app on it, clearly, because, uh, because uh, that is very useful information. But the race will be restarted. So that is great news, uh, not just for the drivers, but also for our fans. We are going to go racing again with the GT Wind Series Sprint Race. It will truly be a sprint within a sprint when we do return to racing action. And uh, I'm sure that will be very entertaining. So do strap in. We are going to go racing again, and it's going to be uh, very interesting as the uh, the Portimao 400-yard dash now takes place as the uh, mechanics make their way down to the uh, to the cars. If that was me, I'd be out of breath. I might need to uh, to go to medical center after that. But uh, Lucas Gajewski will also be hot-footing it down there. I'm sure he'll be earwigging, seeing what he can glean uh, from uh, any of the crews. Meanwhile, I understand we can take a look at uh, Igor Klyer's moment at the top of the hill. So let's have a look at that again. So there we saw Tor Haugen's bodywork flying off and Klaia then tried to put the foot down uh, through the over the crest at turn eight, nine. And that's the thing. You can't really mess with your throttle too much over the crest of a hill like that. He was offline. He, cornered, he was on a part of the circuit that was a little bit off camber. So he put the throttle down. And uh, well, that was, uh, that was all she wrote, unfortunately. Looped it into the barriers. And uh, now uh, we have this red flag. However, it's going to be a short red flag because the restart is confirmed for 12.04. So the cars will be rolling again at 12.04. Um, 
So in five minutes' time, four minutes' time, effectively, that is uh, that is very, very good work from uh, everybody. I assume that means that the recovery is complete down there at turn nine, and if so, mighty, mighty good job uh, from our uh, from our crews down there with the flatbed. I see Lukas Gajewski and Johnny walking with purpose down there. I'm sure they're going to uh, join us within the next few moments. And uh, already those engines will be firing into life uh, because, uh, yeah, we are going back to racing within a matter of minutes. Igor Klyer's car has been picked up and... Uh, uh, Barney on the drone has managed to find the car, I think. Uh, is that the drone shot? I think it is, yeah. Um, so that drone will follow it all the way back to the garage. Perhaps not all the way, but some of the way. As uh, Igor Klyer uh, will unfortunately, uh, I think, be in the passenger seat of the car or of the truck, uh, ruining the end of his race. And uh, the number four car is uh, awaiting the opportunity then to carry on uh, from the front of the field. And again, I'm very interested to see uh, whether or not Kenneth Heyer uh, has any answer for Finn Weibelhaus when we do go back to racing. Uh, we'll see whether or not uh, the number four Haupt Racing Team machine can uh, do anything uh, well, whether, I should say, whether the 11 SR Motorsport machine can do anything about uh, the Haupt Racing team and the youngster at the wheel because uh, he has been absolutely sensational uh, over the course of the last uh, few minutes. And uh, I see that the clock, uh, well, clock is running on my screen, but I think that might be because my... Uh, Connection to the circuit Wi-Fi has dropped rather than anything else. Uh, got it back up now. Six minutes and 44 left on the timing screen then. We'll see whether the clock starts running as the cars roll. One would suspect that is the case. Lukas Gajewski is down there. Let's pop down to him now. Thank you very much, Adam. And as you explained earlier, this is going to be a very quick dash. Now, in comparison to other championships, you can see team personnel attending the cars under red flag conditions. This is definitely okay. And although this is not Formula One, but GT Winter Series, there is, of course, an extensive driver's briefing on Friday night being held by our very experienced race director, Werner Eichinger. And of course, these procedures are also part of the briefing so that drivers and teams alike know what to do now. As does this team, it's the uh, Vileco car the 953 Ferrari always spectacular to stand next to these things with the uh, glass engine cover on a 488 challenge car just fabulous to have an own class for Ferrari challenge cars within the GT winter series and we might even see the newer generation of Ferrari challenge car in a bit in this championship because of course the uh, 296 GT3 car well been established uh, they will have a challenge version as well and guys i'm happy to report engines are being fired up once again same applies to the uh, very very nice looking art car 128 ms racing porsche that's the uh, second to last car here in pit lane so just a couple of seconds until the light down there at pit exit will switch from red to green and then we're going to kick the uh, gt winter series race number two into high gear again yeah race number two will be back underway then in just a few moments eight minutes uh, now on the clock so they've slightly updated that of course it was about mm, 13 14 minutes of the race left to go uh, when the race was put on hold uh, we are now under safety car conditions and the clock is now ticking, I assume, uh, just the one lap behind the safety car and then we will go back to racing. So I'd expect something in the region of uh, five and a half minutes left on the clock, maybe six if the safety car driver's feeling um, particularly fast um, and we will then go racing. So that will be... Uh, brilliant to see. I was a bit worried that we were having a bit of an anticlimactic conclusion to the race, but no, instead the field is compacted together and we are going to go racing once again. It will be Finn Weibelhaus then starting uh, at the front of the safety car snake. 
and then it'll be Kenneth Heyer uh, in second poor, uh, position. Uh, Kenneth Heyer, maybe, just maybe, uh, going to have a little bit of a go at Finn Weibelhaus as we go back to racing. Andrew Lewandowski with the straight line missile that is the Lamborghini Super Trofeo car of GT3 Poland. Uh, we'll see whether or not he can uh, maybe try and run interference and have a go at least second place on the run back to green flag. It's con confirmed as anticipated that the safety car is in this lap. And so we will go back to racing this time by Finn Weibelhaus will uh, have control over the field as we go back to racing conditions. It'll be Weibelhaus from higher from Lewandowski. Leandro Martins leading cup two just ahead of Pablo Brass, last year's Spanish GT champion. Alfredo Hernandez uh, in sixth position, the second of the cup two cars. Daedalov seventh, Christian Hook in eighth, Demir Hot and Hubert Darmetko rounding out our top ten. But it's Weibelhaus with the all-important job of getting this race back underway. I suspect he's going to punch it any moment uh, through the fast final corner. Of course, you've got to remember, no overtaking before the safety car line. We've already seen Danny Sufi fall foul of that uh, this morning. There is Leandro Martins. We're on board with him as Finn Weibelhaus pulls the pin and we go back to racing speeds and racing conditions with five minutes and 30 seconds left on the clock. The GT Winter Spreary Sprint Race number two is on and Lewandowski looking for any way he can past Kenneth Heyer. But that's not quite possible into the first corner. Heyer then down in uh, uh, second place. Oh, and Hubert Darmetko gets past two cars at one time. Both uh, Pierre Ellett uh, and Demir Hot get overtaken there by uh, by Hubert Darmetko. Very impressive start then from Darmetko. Took advantage there as everybody maybe struggled a little bit on cold tyres. It's Weibelhaus from Haya, from Lewandowski, from Leandro Martins, from Pablo Brass, from Adrian Hernandez. Your top six, Alfredo Hernandez, I should say, uh, rounding out your top six. And oh, John Dylan and Uwe Lauer have gotten into it together. Uwe Lauer to the inside there of John Dillon, and they met each other in the middle. That's given uh, Motohiko Isozaki an opportunity to potentially lead in Cup 1. Yes, the top three in Cup 1, all within your shot there. The class for Ferrari 488 Challenge Evo cars. And uh, Motohiko Isozaki is your leader in Cup 1 now. Uh, just behind Uwe Lauer in the GT3 spec 488. Uh, Isosaki would be loving it if he crosses the line to win that class. He's got just four minutes and eight seconds left to uh, to try and achieve that. There you see Weibel House clearing off at the front of the order. Then it is uh, the Kenneth Hire car in second place, but it's all kicking off in the mid pack as one would perhaps expect if you've seen GT Winter Series before. Looks like the 220 car is struggling a little bit there. That's Talal Shair uh, losing a couple of positions by the looks of it. Uh, Shair looking a little bit slow, but uh, hopefully that's just him getting back up to temperature as uh, Hernandez gets through there. That's uh, putting himself between the top two in Cup 2, as a matter of fact. Looked like he was deep, though, into the first corner. Yes, he was. And the 9-1-1, car gets through. Then Pablo Brass, and also looking for a way past is uh, Marco Daedalov in the number two. There's higher in second place. There's Lewandowski in third. Then it'll be Leandro Martins, still pursued by Pablo Brass. Uh, I think for a little while, uh, Leandro Martins was hoping he'd get some respite from uh, being pursued by his fellow Cup 2 car, but no chance of that uh, in this fast, frenetic race. Uwe Lauer running it a bit wide there through turn five in the uh, 488 GT3. He sits 12th overall. Demir Hot, meanwhile, just behind Hubert Darmetko. These two then scrapping once more for fourth in class, but Demir Hot overdoes it through turn eight. Oh, he's going to lose it, but thankfully he's going to keep it out of the barrier. Oh, but he needs to get the brakes on there. Oh, don't roll onto the circuit. That was uh, the most uncomfortable. He's got to keep that car at least stationary and not roll it backwards uh, as the car is on the hillside there. Quite easy for the car to roll backwards in that situation, but uh, thankfully Demir, I think, just about got it stopped and will hopefully be able to rejoin the race, albeit with some grass 
uh, in the cooling ducts of that uh, Porsche 992 Cup car. He does indeed, after uh, mowing down some of the daisies around the uh, Autodroma Internationale and Garve, he does rejoin the race. Here comes the Lamborghini once again then, interfering within the Cup 2 class. Uh, Alfredo Hernandez doing a really good job uh, in the uh, Group of Prom car, the BDR competition machine. The distinctive golden racer, uh, the Mexican competitor looking to try and uh, get an overall top five out of this race. He currently sits in P6, just behind the top two within the Cup 2 class, but uh, class honours are often thrown aside as we are seeing once again in this race. This will be the penultimate lap of the race, incidentally. Finn Weibelhaus uh, far enough through the lap that we are going to get one more uh, once the clock uh, hits zero. He will be across the line to begin his final lap in about 30 seconds. Meanwhile, uh, this battle for fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh overall is looking particularly feisty. And Marco Daedalov carrying a lot of speed, a lot of mustard uh, out of that corner. Turn eight of the lap. And again, you've got to be so careful uh, in that situation. You do not want to be sideways over that crest. Uh, as the, the, the tarmac drops away from you, you can quite easily lose control, as we've already seen. So then the 911 entry, the Porsche 911, the 992 Cup car of Leandro Martins. Again, new to driver, new to team after being purchased by uh, the team from uh, Johannes Kapfinger. Just a few days ago, the car stripped of its uh, cap finger decals on, uh, I think, Thursday. And the car is here and ready and racing. And potentially, Andrew Martins is headed uh, for first in class once again. The Andro, uh, so quick in these Cup 2 machines, these Porsche 992 Cup machines, as we are seeing once more. There, though, is our race leader, Finn Weibelhaus in the number four Haupt racing car has once again disappeared up the road, clear of Kenneth Heyer in second place, higher uh, around turn five. Then it's the Lewandowski car in P3. And then, of course, it's that scrum for fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh uh, that follows with Leandro Martin still just about heading the snake. Uh, or is he? Yes, he still is uh, at this stage with uh, Pablo Brass trying to find any which way he can to get past Hernandez, of course, with the straight line speed on that Lamborghini, he might try and set himself up for a run to try and get into fifth at the line. Uh, but we'll see if that works out. We await Finn Weibelhaus. We see Finn Weibelhaus. He will take a inaugural GT3 race victory in just two corners. Haupt Racing Team, I think, are going to be very optimistic about the future prospects of their new young charger after this race. Leandro Martins there looking, uh, getting almost overtaken by Pablo Brass. He remains in fourth place, but Finn Weibelhaus remains uncontested at the front. He crosses the line now to secure a victory in the GT Winter Series for the very first time. Kenneth Heyer will follow through in second place. Higher takes P2. Lewandowski, third place. He will cross the line. And then in Cup 2, and indeed for fourth overall, it is going to be Leandro Martins. We ride on board with him through the final corner of the lap. One last glance in the mirrors, I'm sure, and confirmation that he is the Cup 2 winner. Fourth overall ahead of Pablo Brass. Uh, sixth place to Hubert Darmetko at the end. Where is Hernandez? Hernandez has gone missing on the final lap of the race. Alfredo Hernandez in the golden Lamborghini now crosses the line in ninth position. So Hernandez clearly had an error of some sort out there on circuit at the end. Uwe Lauer crosses the line to be 10th place overall. So he rounds out the top 10. Christian Hook finishing between the Cup 2 scrum and the rest of the pack. He finishes in 8th place overall, except my apologies, it is Pierre Ellett at the wheel of the car, as confirmed by Rinaldi Racing. So Pierre Ellett taking 8th place. But uh, a great race all round uh, from our drivers. The uh, undisputed uh, King of Cup 2 then, Leandro Martins. That makes it 2 from 2 this weekend for him. He will be uh, really pleased. Uh, with how the new Rakar Motorsport 911 car is handling. Uh, Pablo Brass 
uh, a close second in class ahead of uh, Hubert Darmetko, who inherited third at the end there. I wonder if potentially uh, Daedalov and uh, Hernandez got into it somewhere because uh, both of them lost positions. That's another fabulous race in the GT Winter Series. It's often frenetic. There's often a lot going on all at once. Uh, but the Alpha Life crew doing a brilliant job of bringing us all of that action. And uh, we saw a lot of it over the course of that 30 minutes. Uh, albeit with a little bit of a half time forced by uh, Igor Klaia. Ah, and John Dillon has ended the race with a flat. John Dillon, he crossed the line second in class. He was only 1.7 seconds off of Motohiko Isazaki, but his tyre has gone down. Uh, one would assume that's more something to do with contact than a slow puncture, because it wouldn't deflate that quickly on a slow puncture. John Dillon's car then will have to be recovered uh, by the crew here at Portimao. He's gesticulating to the marshals by the looks of it, and uh, John Dillon uh, will, of course, share this car with Matt Griffin uh, in the endurance race later on. Nothing but a puncture by the looks of it, so that car will definitely be out there later. But Finn Weibelhaus is the man of the moment. He will uh, be celebrating with his team in the next few moments. Lukas Gajewski will be on hand to hopefully catch the young man and will hopefully hear his thoughts at the end of that race. Weibelhaus, incredibly impressive. Good to see uh, DKR Engineering getting involved there as well with the half racing team. And, uh, involved in the celebrations. Emilio getting his shots from pit lane as the 911 car uh, makes its way down uh, into the paddock area. So still an unfamiliar sight for everybody seeing the uh, cap finger signature colors on uh, Leandro Martin's car. That's, uh, that's a new thing and we're gonna have to get used to that uh, at least until they uh, get the decals applied. Finn Weibelhaus though doing about everything he needed to in that race. Uh, I feel like we're seeing the start of something here with this uh, this young Weibelhaus fellow. He's uh, very, very competent at the wheel of a GT3 car. That much is proving very clear. And, uh, you know what? Don't don't wrap the helmet, mate. It looks so good in carbon fiber. Uh, keep it that way. That looks absolutely phenomenal. Uh, young Finn Weibelhaus. Uh, debriefing with the team, um, making it look all fairly effortless, really. Just uh, feeling good, I'm sure, after that race. And we'll hear from Lukas Gajewski in a couple of minutes' time. Meanwhile, the flatbed is once again out there. They seem to be doing a, a drop-off one, pick-up one policy uh, in the GT Winter Series at the moment as the, uh, as the flatbed gets deployed once more. John Dillon uh, overlooking the uh, the 408 Challenge Evo, and uh, hopefully we'll see him uh, back out there for race number three. Uh, Motohiko Isazaki, incidentally, finishing 12th overall and taking uh, the Cup 1 win. Of course, John Dillon is meant to be on the second step of the podium uh, of the Cup 1 podium, but... Uh, uh, I don't know that he's going to make it down there, so I think we might be missing our second in the uh, Cup 1 class from our podium, unless he uh, uh, hitches a lift with a, a photographer or something of that nature. But, uh, I'm sure that uh, Motohiko Isazaki will have the energy and the celebrations for two. Uh, I only met him for the first time this weekend, but I get the feeling if there's one thing he, he will do with aplomb, it is celebrate. John Dillon's car raised up onto the flatbed, and uh, understandably, John wants to uh, observe this process, make sure that it's all done properly, and he'll then ride with his car back into the paddock. Meanwhile, at the Weybridge, uh, Finn Weibelhaus will still be debriefing with his team, and. Uh, of course, was second yesterday to uh, J-Mo Hartling. Today, he beats the SR Motorsport car. And we can hear from Lukas Gajewski now. 
Finn Wiebelhaus, your first victory there in GT Winter Series and I guess, Finn, in a GT3 car overall as well. Yeah, it was my first uh, GT re uh, race week in this week. Uh, yeah, finally managed to get the wi uh, victory. Uh, yeah, yesterday I was like P2, so today like finally get it, done. It was a long safety car, but the pace was brilliant. I could set like quality laps every lap, so it was perfect. Long safety car, you just mentioned it, a bit of a shame in terms of the racing, of course. However, for a young driver like you, that's part of the practice, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. It's uh, nice to have a, like, a practice start for the safety car as a leader, for sure. You can learn a lot from like a safety car start. It's nice to practice, so yeah, I don't mind. It's, like, it's part of the racing. And it's the same story with the uh, endurance race later on with pit stop windows and pit speed limiters and so on, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. It's a good practice for uh, endurance races. Of course, it's only five, 55 minutes, but it's good to have a practice like for, for bigger events like that. So, yeah, it's perfect. You have a uh, prominent supporter here with uh, Manuel Reuter, former DTM racer himself. A very successful career. How is it to work together with him? Brilliant. Uh, I learn a lot from him. He gives me on the track and outside of the track some advices to get faster and fitter. So it's perfect. Some uh, German fans back home tuning in as well. Let's say hi. Ein paar Worte auf Deutsch an die Fans. Ja, Grüße nach Deutschland. Ich hoffe, meine Freunde gucken zu und uh, genießt das Wochenende. Montag ist wieder Schule, gell? <laughs> Finn Wiebel, it's back to school on Monday, he was just saying. Congratulations. Thanks. GT3 racing on Sunday, maths test on Monday, huh? Okay. All in the day of the life of uh, Finn Weibelhaus then. Gra congratulations to him. He'll be up on the podium within a few minutes with Chris McCarthy along with our other class podiums. Uh, no overall podium in the GT Winter Series. So you'll see the GT3s, the Cup 4s, the Cup 2s, the Cup 1s, and indeed the one Cup 3 car uh, all having individual podiums. Morton Stromstead again doing a good job in the Porsche 991.2 uh, GT3 Cup car. So 11th overall uh, for that one. A good result uh, from Morton Stromstead. I reckon he could break the top 10 uh, over the course of the endurance race because, of course, he'll be a solo driver. And, of course, solo drivers, they don't have a drop in performance. Well, they might have a marginal drop in performance due to fatigue, uh, but there is no factor of a slower driver hopping into the car and changing the performance of the machine in any phase of the race. So I think Morton Stromstead could be very strong uh, when we go racing for 55 minutes uh, in the enduro later on. Between minute 25 and 35, there will be a pit window in that race. Uh, that is also the case for the 60-minute enduro uh, in the GT4 Winter Series. It is uh, nothing but enduros from here on out. Post-lunch break, two more endurance races to bring you uh, from our two GT grids be very compelling uh, in both categories of course the GT4s have once again been absolutely fabulous this weekend but let's have a look at the GTs and uh, take a look at some of the action from that race so then it was a fairly busy start a fairly hectic start to this half hour race everyone trying to pick their spot and find their piece of tarmac a little bit of a spin for Premislav Bienkowski, but he ultimately finished 14th, worked his way back up the order nicely. Igor Klayat was making some mighty moves uh, earlier on in the race. Unfortunately, uh, Piotr Vera didn't last too long, and this was the moment where things started to go south. Tor Haugen into the rear of Morton Stromstead. They come over the crest of the hill. Eagle Klai is trying to find somewhere to go. He tries to avoid the Ferrari's bodywork, and in the process... He spins out, and uh, that was the end of his race. That was also the cause of, ultimately, a red flag. But uh, thankfully, the race did resume uh, for Tor Haugen and uh, Pelin Racing, though. It was just checks to see that the car was still happy and healthy after the collision with the rear of Morton Stromstead. Uh, obviously rear-engine in those Porsche Cup cars. I was quite fortunate, really, that there was not much damage, seemingly, uh, to Stromstead's car as well. Igor Klaya, meanwhile, uh, returning to the paddock. As we went back to racing, Kenneth Heyer had his hands full with Adrian Lewandowski trying to find any way he could 
to find his way through. Uwe Lauer dove up the inside of John Dillon, and that was indeed the corner of the car where the tyre would ultimately go down. So it might have been a legacy of that for John Dillon. The puncture, Demir Hot had a big moment at turn nine. Thankfully, he uh, managed to stay uncontacted uh, after that, and John Dillon didn't get back to the paddock, unfortunately, with his uh, Ferrari 488 Challenge Evo uh, gaining a puncture. Uh, so Finn Weibelhaus will be on the top step of the GT3 podium. Uh, Adrian Lewandowski third overall behind Kenneth Heyer, uh, rounding out your overall podium in that race. And uh, Morton Stromstead, Cup 3 winner, Cup 2 winner Leandro Martins, uh, Cup 4, of course, going to Adrian Lewandowski and Cup 1 going to Motohiko Isazaki. And I'm very happy, I'm very interested to see uh, how Motohiko Isazaki uh, celebrates that podium because uh, he is a, a ball of energy in the paddock. Uh, brilliant speaking to him uh, yesterday or uh, on Friday, I think it was actually. Uh, this week has flown by. Uh, and he described the circuit to me. We talked a little bit about his past racing in single-seaters in Asia, including being a teammate to some bloke called Kamui Kobayashi uh, in uh, 2003 uh, in a Formula Renault racing at the Macau Grand Prix. Uh, so that's uh, Isozaki's claim to fame, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, came back to racing a couple of years ago as he retired from his day-to-day uh, -day business operations he decided he'd go back to racing and he's proven to be very quick uh, in Ferrari challenge machinery he loves racing Ferraris and uh, as he said Ferrari absolutely the best for me and uh, he won the copper shell am class within Ferrari challenge Europe uh, over the 2023 summer and great to have him with us and indeed have him winning in Cup 1 in the GT Winter Series. Uh, for Finn Wiebelhaus, though, you get the feeling that we're about to see him on the top step of the podium for the first time and certainly uh, not the last time because the, the youngster uh, with ADAC backing in his uh, Formula 4 career making this move into GT3s and it seems like one that suits him nicely. Uh, even though Jamo Hartling is only marginally more experienced in GT3s, he is a lot more experienced in tin top machines generally. Yesterday, he was matching Hartling every inch of the way, and today he was a lot better than the highly experienced uh, Kenneth Heyer in terms of lap to lap pace. Uh, so, it really is impressive stuff from Finn Weibelhaus, and we'll. Uh, uh, Wiebelhaus, sorry, and we will see uh, more of him perhaps in GT Winter Series, but certainly in general, we're going to see a lot more of him, I think, uh, on podiums in GT machinery. So we are in the midst of lunch break here uh, at the Autodromo Internacional do Algarve. I understand that we are going to see uh, Chris McCarthy and Lucas Gajewski uh, doing a bit of a pit lane wander uh, later on. And, uh, of course, that will have to come after uh, Chris hosts our podiums in the next couple of minutes. Uh, Lucas Gajewski, I'm sure, though, will be there to uh, initially find some drivers. He seems to have a very good a very good eye for where the drivers lurk. He always seems to be able to find someone to talk to. Uh, in this paddock, of course, it is a very German paddock, but uh, increasingly international, I'm noticing as well, with a few more of the uh, Iberian teams joining in. Uh, obviously, AF Corsa uh, joining in as well. More and more of an international feel uh, to the paddock here in the Winter Series. All three, or indeed all four championships, once the Formula 4 cars join us, uh, for Formula Winter Series in February. And that is exciting to see as well. I'm sure this championship is only going to continue, or this series of championships is only going to continue growing uh, over the next several years. And uh, I understand that Chris has managed to herd some of our drivers now, and he's ready for the podiums. So let's go to Chris McCarthy on the rostrum. 
Thank you very much, uh, Adam. A great last few minutes uh, to the race there, of course. Uh, we did have that red flag, uh, but the race really delivering for us uh, at the end there, didn't it? Uh, uh, we're going to crack on with our podium. I know plenty uh, of the spectators who were with us over in the grandstand now down in the pit lane. Thank you to all of us uh, who are over in the grandstand. Please do give the drivers plenty of support as they come out. And thank you to all of you who have gathered down at the end of pit lane for the celebrations. We are, of course, celebrating uh, the GT Winter Series second sprint race. We're going to have uh, one more race for the GT Winter Series for the second round here at Portimao. We have their endurance race coming up later on. Uh, we've got uh, five classes to go through. Let's go, uh, first of all, with the GT3 class. We're going to get our top three uh, on the podium, starting with third place, number 115, Pierre Ere. Let's give him lots of support, guys, as he comes out. He's, it's not Pierre, it's going to be collected by, by a mechanic. Uh, I mean, that, that wouldn't have been appropriate race wear, but there, there we go. Uh, let's go next uh, to uh, our top two, then uh, finishing uh, in second place was the number 11, Kenneth Heyer. Well done, Kenneth. Solid drive from the Schnitzelhelm team once again. And Finn just missing out on the win in race number one, but today taking a win by 7.5 seconds. So our winner for race number two in GT3, number four, Finn Wiebelhaus. Well done, Finn. Disappointed, I'm sure, just to have missed out on that win yesterday, but fights back to take the win uh, today. We'll get the trophies presented by the Gidlick Racing guys and we will get our pictures taken uh, by Danny and then we will move on to the next category. Closing, guys. And then we're going to move on to the Cup 1 class. Well done to our top three. I'm sure we're going to be speaking to all of you guys later on as well. For now, we're going to move on uh, to Cup 1. But for one more time, let's give a, a round, round of applause to uh, our top three uh, in GT3. Well done, guys. For, for now, we are going to press on, if that's OK. But uh, congratulations. Please give it up one more time for our top three overall in GT3. Well done. Well done, guys. Do you want to say some words? We got, I think we've got some time. It's the lunch break, isn't it? Finn, jump down. Jump, uh, I, yeah, I'll jump up to you. You are the winner overall. Uh, Finn, um, uh, you've got plenty of people gathered down here for you. Uh, uh, anyone you'd like to thank for, for this one? I know very close to the win yesterday. Any, yeah. Anyone you'd like to thank for this one? Uh, for sure, my team and my home fami uh, whole family uh, for getting me here, especially my, uh, my team. Obviously, okay, uh, we improved the car from yesterday to today. It was perfect. I could push all the way to the line and it was perfect. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah. Enjoying the battles you're having uh, up at the front? I mean, this looks like a brilliant circuit to race on. Yeah, could have been a quite a good battle, but uh, yeah, it was uh, a bit uh, too long for a safety car. So we were a bit bored, I guess, from the safety car. It was like four or five laps. So we were just wa waving, waving, braking, braking. You know, it was a bit boring, but uh, yeah, it was quite fi fun. Good stuff, Kenneth. Jump, jump back, jump back up onto the podium. Oh, I'll have a chat with you. Uh, I mean, how, how was it when you had the, the the safety car? Did you think you could could have a stab at, at the win, or happy to take second in the points? Oh, um, I was not really able to follow him so close, so <laughs> I, I do my, myself uh, improve a little bit after the safety car from the times. Uh, I changed a bit the line, so improved a bit on the time. But yeah, it was also the first time I see a truck close to to flip on the side uh, when he was loading the Porsche. It was really. It was more than 45 degrees or something. It was already <laughs> close to, to flip on the side. So, yeah, something new. After 20 years, still something uh, to improve in, <laughs> in seeing on the track. Looking forward to the endurance race later? Yeah, for sure. Jamo will push uh, after me. I will do the start. And then we will push him and make the life for him uh, as, uh, as uh, complicated as possible. Good stuff. Well done. Well done. Uh, let's give a, a round of applause to second place, <laughs> Kenneth I, one more time. Uh, and we've got to speak to Pierre Ede, who got changed for us uh, to look like a mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it was probably the first time you've been interviewed on a podium. Yes. Uh, introduce yes. yourself. Yeah, it's first time. I'm a mechanic, so. And your name? Uh, Borja. Ah, and uh, how does it feel to be up on the podium? Uh, it's good. Uh, uh, how is it working with the team? Yeah, good. Good? You yeah, just one word answers? Yeah, no. <laughs> Anyone you'd like to thank? <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> okay, we'll treasure this okay. and tell, tell him to turn up next. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
stuff. Well done. Uh, well done to our top three uh, overall, uh, including this man. He drove very, very well. Uh, well, well done to our top three overall. Give them one more round of applause as they leave the podium. Thank you for turning up to collect the trophy as well. Okay, we're going to move on with uh, the Cup 1 category next, the Ferraris. Uh, great racing uh, uh, in the Ferraris uh, overall. Changes for the lead uh, after the safety car as well. But let's get our top three out, starting with third place, number 220, Talal Cher. Well done, Talal. Good to see you again. We, we meet again on the podium, sir. Give him, give him a wave. Uh, and we had to wait a little while for him to get back. Problems on the in-lap, but uh, drove very well whilst the race was green to get yet another podium, finishing second, number 151, John Dillon. That's you, sir. Yes, <laughs> as it says on your suit. <laughs> Jump on the podium. Uh, and finishing in 12th overall on the circuit on a packed grid to take his first win in the GT Winter Series this season. Number 105, Motohiko Isosaki. Well, now Motohiko took the lead after the safety car as well with some fantastic racing as they came down through turns seven uh, and eight. And Motohiko taking advantage to take the lead as the cars came back up through turn number nine. Well done to the guys. I'm going to grab a word with uh, Motohiko before we go uh, to uh, the cup number two class because uh, it's been great to have Motohiko. Uh, Motohiko, don't run off. Don't run off. I want to grab a word with you uh, as our winner. How does it feel to take the win? I mean, uh, all changed after that safety car. Tell us how it feels to take a win. Ah, today is a really sunshine and the long safety car for me. Very nice day. <laughs> reckon, reckon we can get some more? Uh, yes, maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Promising, yes, promising. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> Anyone you'd like to thank? Yes, I like. Fun, very fun. Porsche, Lamborghini. And some many car, it's pass and pass. It's very nice, it's fantastic. <laughs> Loving the enthusiasm, and you're showing it on circuit as well. Well done to our top three in Cup One. Well done, guys. Congratulations. We will see you again later on, I'm sure. Uh, okay, let's go to Cup Two next. Those Porsches tearing round. They sound absolutely fantastic as they're doing it as well. Finishing in third place, number seven, Hubert Darmeco. <laughs> Thank you. Let's keep that going, please. Yes. What a race it was between our top two as well. Just 0.3 seconds uh, between them as well. It went all the way down to the last lap, last corner. Just missing out on the win this time. He, beat, he put on a fantastic race. Please give a huge round of applause to second place, number 951, Pablo Brass. We can do better than that, guys. So I just missed out within half a second of a race win. Well done. But holding on to take that win and finishing fourth overall in a grid of over 20 cars, your winner, number 911, Leandro Martins. Well done. Did very, very well. We'll get the trophies presented by Gidlick Racing and we will get our pictures taken. And let's get you all up on the top step of the podium. Well done, guys. Should we grab a word with our winner? Do you want to say some words? É para a equipe isso aqui. É para a equipe. Okay? And say some words to them. Anything else? É para a equipe, esse troféu é para a equipe, ok? Good stuff. Well done. Well done. Well done. Good stuff, guys. Uh, right, let's get our Cup 3 winner out. He finished 11th. At, whoa! That was a, oh, almost. Almost a great catch. Good job, that one. Some champagne. Oh, that could have got very messy. Uh, let's get our Cup 3 uh, winner out. Uh, great to have him here. And he's doing very well, settling into the championship nicely. Finished 11th overall out in his Porsche. Number 32, Morton Stromstedt. Let's give him a round of applause, guys, as he comes out. Morden Stromstedt. 
Absolutely fantastic. We'll get the trophy round to be presented. We'll get the pictures taken, please, as well, Danny. Congratulations to Morton. In a Campos racing suit, you'll notice, because he's used to racing in single-seater cars. And that's what I'm going to speak to him about as we were speaking about for the uh, for it all started. Uh, Morton, I mean, pretty different, uh, the car you're driving now, to the single-seaters you're used to racing. Yes, much more comfortable. I can sit probably. I can see, you know, don't get wet in the rain. It's uh, it's perfect. <laughs> and your son, of course, you mentioned as well. No, people will know him. He's going to be racing in a Formula Regional European Championship by Alpine this year. Uh, you you want to get him in with you at some point and do a race together? Yeah, he was actually, uh, we had a talk about being here this weekend, uh, but plans couldn't make, make up. But at one point, we might be doing uh, the endurance race together. We're going to change that going forward this season. we got some time. Yeah, yeah. Then I'll need to teach him something about the GT cars, of course, but I think he can catch up. <laughs> That's going to be fantastic if that happens. Congratulations, though. I'm sure we'll speak again later. Well done, Morton Stromstead. 11th overall. Top 10 coming later. Top 10 coming later, I'm sure. Uh, right, let's go for uh, Cup 4 uh, next. Uh, we are... Uh, okay, we, we've had a, a change uh, to third, I think. Uh, uh, we're going to get third place uh, out now in uh, camp number four, and that's Alexi Wolfie. Uh, finishing in second place was the number 177, Alfredo Hernandez. Well, do I hear people down there? Let's give him a round of applause as he comes out. Well done, well done, sir. And finishing third overall, put on an absolutely fantastic drive in his Lamborghini uh, in the number six, taking the Cup 4 win, was Adrian Lewandowski. Well, well done, well done, well done. Let's get the trophies presented uh, and we will get some pictures taken and... We will grab a word with our winner before we head down to the pit lane, which is where we're going to go next. So stay with us because uh, Lucas is prepped and ready, I believe, uh, uh, ready to speak to some drivers. So uh, uh, stick with us. We are going to take a very short break. Do you, do you want to have a chat? Do you want to, should, we, should we chat about that one? Third overall. I mean, that was an absolutely fantastic result. Um, yeah, I mean, it's fine to, to come the third overall with the few GT cars, a uh, few GT3 cars, which are which supposed to be faster, but uh, generally it was a pretty peaceful race for me, and uh, I think pretty okay. Maybe uh, too long, the, the, the safety car was too long and not so much racing, but uh, generally I think fine race, fine training, and we will see what will happen in endurance. Good stuff. Well done. It did look peaceful to watch, I'd say that. <laughs> Interesting description. Well done. Okay, that concludes the podium ceremony. Uh, as I look to my right, Lucas is going to be down there somewhere uh, in the pit lane getting ready to speak to some drivers. I'm going to go down there and join him. For now, though, we're going to take a very short break. So don't go anywhere because we are going to be live in the pit lane very, very shortly. So that's your set of podiums done for the uh, GT Winter Series. One more race for that class, of course, coming up later on today to round off the uh, second weekend of the GT Winter Series package. And we can just see why we like it so much. It's midday here in very sunny Portimao. It's about 14, 15 degrees sunshine, blue skies. Everything is perfect. And look, we've even got a bit of a crowd in our pit lane. Now, of course, with the massive grandstand on this very modern Portimao venue, it doesn't really look like much. However, when the people gather here in the pits, it's a different story. Now, let's talk to uh, Mr. Lewandowski there as he uh, just comes back from the uh, podium. As always, very exciting, the mix between the... Um, GT3 cars and of course your Lamborghini Super Trofeo car. How does the mix work here in Portimao? Uh, well, I mean, it was funny because, for example, I tried to, to 
to, to fight with the second Mercedes and generally in the I mean the probably first sector maybe se second sector I think I was a little bit faster at least at before the safety car but last sector especially last, cor last corner was like phew, so big difference bef between the GT3 Mercedes and my Super Trofeo I, I was like pushing as much as I can and he was like disappearing from me so uh, I mean pretty hard to, to fight because we are faster in different um, part of the track but generally uh, it was a good race good fun you know to just try to to fight with the gt3 which which should be faster that uh, probably is the, fa the faster yeah and uh, try to come up with the super trophy and then of course there is a, another aspect for the endurance race later on because after the potential driver changes you never really know who is in the car right now and what you're up against yeah i mean that's what i, what I was talking with, with my friend now that uh, will be really funny because probably the, the faster driver will come to the second uh, second part of the race and they will start to overtook uh, and will be a little bit I think it will be messy uh, I'm going alone now because my father is not here so so we will see how it come up for sure we have also I hope not but what we saw in every race we had some safety cars so we will be close it everyone will be close and the fast driver will be pushing behind so there might be good race to watch Racing aside, Adrian, if we have a look around, sun is out, nice weather, and we've even got spectators in here in the pits. That's fabulous, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was surprised in the story. There was lots of like spectators, and it was very enthusiastic. And now we have sun, much, much better. Uh, the weather is much better. And unfortunately, I don't know. Maybe it's, uh, the track is uh, far from the from the city or something. I'm not sure. But uh, what it, it is what it is. It's just like a winter series, a little bit warm up, so maybe people don't like the Renault or something. I don't know. Adrian, thank you very much and all the best for the uh, third race coming up later. Now, look at this. We even got young racing fans here. I think you're from France, aren't you? I spotted some French there. What, what? Yeah, we actually yeah. live here, yeah, in Lagos. Uh, so you live in Lagos and you decided to come here for a nice day out on the circuit? Yes, absolutely, because it's so rare to have this opportunity to just meet the pilots and just go in the padlocks. My son is thrilled. Yeah, it's awesome. And it's all for free, it needs to be said. So uh, very nice to attend. You're enjoying your time as well? Thanks to have you here. Come on, yes. Yes, thanks for joining us here in the GT Winter Series paddock. Please feel invited whenever you want, as I see our colleague Chris McCarthy joining our uh, pit walk as well. Uh, what a fabulous day it is now, Chris, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's been uh, really, really good so far. I mean, all the racing has been uh, fantastic, I think. Uh, that one going really to the wire, wasn't it? Um, uh, across some of the classes in particular. Uh, prototypes was interesting as well. I think uh, some of the stories of the day has been the safe cars isn't it you know the safety cars coming into play just tightening things up and i think in some of the longer races like this that can really swing things around but uh yeah overall some fantastic racing and uh, i've really really enjoyed it i think the prototypes put on a fantastic show uh, gt winter series i think almost stealing the show there but gt4s again really close battles for the lead and i, I think that's given us a taste of what's going to be a great endurance race later so let's have a bit of a wander through the uh, pit lane. Of course, racing aside, uh, weather very, very nice now. Uh, and of course, there is plenty of stuff to talk about. You are doing quite a lot in terms of social media coverage as well. One of the many things that has been extended for this year's GT Winter Series campaign. Yeah, it, it's been great to work with uh, you know, our colleague Emilio, uh, who's been running up and down around the circuit. Uh, it's a good job uh, he, he has his scooter to get around because it's quite an extensive circuit isn't it um, but no it's been great to work with him uh, we're trying to get as much uh, inside coverage as, as possible because um, with a championship like this I guess only uh, you know ourselves and um, uh, the, the team at Alpha Live and everyone at Geelig Racing really get to know how it, it all is put together how it works and I guess the part of the social media coverage is to try and uh, uh, help put people who you know, wherever you're watching from around the world who can't be here today like these lucky fans are, um, be here in the pit lane with us. And then that, I guess that's the whole idea of it. And look, there is uh, one of the LMP3 machines, the yes. Inter-Europol car number 80. And that's one of the stories as well this weekend, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's been a... Uh, that, what a story, what a turnaround, right? I mean, Pedro um, still, I, as I point to my back quite literally, uh, you could tell when he walked up onto the podium that he was you know, holding his back, really is in some pain, in some discomfort. And to see that car come in, we were both talking yesterday, 
saying, you know, that car's not going to go anywhere. Uh, and yesterday, uh, even possibly for the weekend, and it didn't go anywhere yesterday, Pedro had to go off and get some x-rays done, which he did voluntarily. Um, but the fact that they've turned that round and got out and got a podium is absolutely fantastic. And so, so close to getting that overall win. Uh, maybe one or two more laps, they might have even done it. But I think that's been one of, you know, the, possibly the story of the day so far. So I think, what was it, six tenths at the line? It was absolutely fantastic. It was really edgy your seat stuff. Um, yeah, I, I took a long time to get to the podium because I didn't quite want to leave my seat. So, uh, yeah, and it's been great to have Sebastian Graveland uh, in there as well. He did a, you know, we've seen him racing in like the likes of F4 in Euro Cup 3 as well. And I think he's made for a great teammate for Pedro, particularly this weekend. And as you can see, the uh, pit box is almost empty in there at Inter-Europol competition. Of course, a very professional outfit. Mm. They won Le Mans last year in the LMP2 class. Yeah. Uh, they do an awful lot of racing around the globe with uh, various types of proto yeah. prototype machinery. And this is one of the most uh, interesting and fascinating aspects about motor racing, isn't the whole logistics behind it. Even here in GT Winter Series, which basically happens in two countries only, it's still an incredible effort, isn't it? Yeah, I think you made a very good point there. Into Europe, our team that have raced at the very top, they're the 24-hour Le Mans and been successful at it. So they've had the experience of a car coming back in a bit of a state, maybe at 1 a.m., and having to get it fixed and get it back out so they can take the checkered flag. Um, that's just a rough example. That's not an actual fact but they know what it's like you know if they've had an incident in practice at Le Mans they've got to get it fixed really quick so they can get some more practice or, or even go out for qualifying so uh, I think you know Pedro and Sebastian were in really good hands there and the team we, we were both amazed by it weren't we yesterday when we came down to the garage I couldn't believe how quickly that car was looking normal again looking race ready again I thought they were even going to get out yesterday I think they were very close to it um, but uh, you know in the end maybe it was a safety thing or precautionary thing they left it to today and uh, uh, yeah, I, I think they've done a fantastic job. Well, they, they were close to it, working until the very last minute. And if we take a closer look at these cars, now, of course, it's a proper bodywork. There is aero and a big wing and everything. But if you peel this off, you can sort of see it this way. It's a it's pretty much like a single seater, isn't it? Yeah, and when you look inside, and um, we were lucky for Danny Sufi to quite literally open the door and take us inside, and he did describe it essentially as a single seater. Uh, you know, when you're sat in in the tub, uh, that's the kind of view that you get uh, from it. Um, you know, you're very restricted on what you can see. The mirrors don't give you a huge amount of a view. I mean, they do have the screen uh, to either their right or left, which they use uh, as a mirror, essentially, uh, so they can see what's going on behind them. But other than that, you know, you can see how low to the floor they are. You know, they essentially are sitting on the ground. And um, it's absolutely fantastic as we've got more fans coming up uh, to take a look. Uh, yeah, amazing bits of kit. And this is a great step for someone like Kevin Rabin in, in something like the Nova who wants to jump straight out of karting but uh, for drivers like Sebastian Graveland who raced in single seaters last year if you want to start a, a career essentially in racing in prototype getting to the 24-hour Le Mans LMP3s is the perfect way to go do, do your prototype winter series and then we were speaking to Wyatt's Brickard check yesterday and it sounds like he's going to be off to do the European Le Mans series and this is a perfect way to get ready for that and into Europe I think that's what they're here preparing for absolutely so uh, let's move on for a couple of meters or feet or whatever you want to call it i think we might even have a second microphone here for you chris uh, that won't make things even I that's easier i think that's our podium microphone but uh, yeah I, I might, if i do that i might be going all around so uh, yeah uh, we've just had to, <laughs> had to run that run down it would have been great but i'll uh, I'll, I'll speak when spoken to <laughs> we'll share we'll share that's no problem at all let's speak to one of our drivers just uh, climbing out of the car there uh, now we're still wearing proper kit proper jackets are you getting a bit hotter in the race warm, warm. yeah yeah a little warm <laughs> how was the race uh it was great until whatever it was 15 16 corners to go <laughs> uh yeah no i had uh, had, a, had a lot of really good fights um a lot of really good coaching from my uh my man steph here he was up in the stand spotting me and that that really helped on the start and the restart um and then you know had what what I uh, what looked a lot like a potential podium position and got a little bit ambitious on the throttle and ended up last. <laughs> Demir Hot is one of the drivers being entered in the uh, 992 class, which is our category for the Porsche Cup cars. It's incredibly competitive because it's essentially a one-make championship within another championship. 
Yeah, totally. And I mean, the cars are amazing. Uh, everybody I've uh, interacted with in these you know last couple of race weekends here in the Cup cars has been incredibly fair. Uh, it's been really good racing. It's been very close. Uh, you know, no quarter given, but no elbows either. It's been good. Now, in the, let's say, official Porsche One Make Championships, there is a very, very specific rule set in what you are allowed to change on the cars and what you're, that's even more important, what you're not allowed to change. What about the GT Winter Series? Which setup windows do you have for the car? Uh, no, we're actually running it just like in Carrera Cup. Uh, so the, the uh, team we're running with lap time, uh, Moritz is engineering for us. Um, you know, they don't want to go and learn a whole new set of setups and a whole new set of configurations. So we're racing it pretty much straight up. And let's speak to Stefan Rosinski. He's your driver coach. The mayor, as you said earlier, I'm just going to uh, step around for a second. Uh, I'm seeing Area 71 Motorsports Area Park. 20, Area 27. Area 27. Well, what did I say? 21. 71, I think. S 71. Uh, anyway, it's 27. I can <laughs> I can Sorry. see clearly. Yeah, th there we go. Uh, what is Area 27 Motorsports Park? So it's the racing circuit in Canada that uh, I'm a coach at and an instructor. So that's where I met Demir. So this is his first foray into proper motorsports beyond sort of club level racing so this is weekend two so we're we're still learning quite a lot but uh, it's been great so far now we should explain you're still racing full-time yourself which always helps in giving knowledge to another driver doesn't it yeah i raced in the 2023 porsche career cup north america so learned a lot about this car um, in the past season so obviously it helps to to pass along some of that feedback and also in my stint in the endurance race, I have about two laps here in the dry, so I'm going to have to learn it very, very quickly <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the second half of the race. <laughs> and we just heard from Demi, you spend the race uh, upstairs in the grandstand? Yeah, I spend it uh, in the top left corner there, and uh, you can see quite a lot of the track. So in terms of traffic flow, race management, I mean, I know he just doesn't have the experience, so sometimes it's helpful. And even things I sometimes like to know, just in terms of the gaps, knowing what's happening in front of you, the uh at the level of aggression some of the other other drivers have it's always good to know to keep it primarily to keep it safe so what are the main bits you're focusing on when watching a race from Demir? i think just primarily watching his level of aggression as well as the drivers around him just in terms of a safety aspect to make sure if you i can see a problem happening sometimes before perhaps he can um, sometimes he sees it as well but mostly for safety level of aggression or potential opportunities as well if there is a gap obviously i'm not going to drive the car and say hey you have to pass him now but if i see there's an opening or a mistake i can say hey there's there's there is an opening or, or a potential opportunity so you have radio contact live radio contact as well correct yeah i'm in the radio up in the stands and where i don't see him there's nothing i can say but where i do see him i'll do my best Right, that's uh, definitely a very, very interesting factor of um, GT Winter Series just as well. Demi, what's your long-term goal for this, championships, uh, this championship and potentially for any other classes of racing just as well? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very much in sort of exploring how fast I can get, um, trying to be very uh, professional about it, but knowing that I'm an amateur and, you know, I'd like to be a really good am and maybe get invited along some, you know, really good pros in some big races one day, but uh, just taking it step by step. Uh, like Stefan said, you know, this is my, you know, Estoril in here, first real foray into fast cars, wheel to wheel. Um, I like it a lot. Uh, and uh, learning curve has been steep, but it's also been a lot of fun. So uh, I think we're just going to kind of keep chipping away at it. Um, and I, I really, I'm, I'm more about finding out how fast I can get rather than any, you know, kind of accomplishments or whatever, because that's for, for, for these guys to do. And then there is one more race coming up, of course, this afternoon, the uh, almost hour long endurance race for GT Winter Series. What do you expect? Uh, you know what? We've had uh, two objectives every race so far. It's been keep it shiny and keep it on the black stuff. Uh, I got one out of two in this last one. So keep it shiny, keep it on the black stuff. I think we have the speed. We don't need to focus on the speed. Um, you know, we've, we've got, you know, I've got decent enough race craft. He's got plenty. So it'll just be about keeping a cool head, taking the opportunities so that we don't get gapped. Um, but like, enjoy, enjoy the last race of the weekend. Right. Thank you very much, guys, and enjoy the rest of the weekend. It's getting easier and easier, isn't it, in these weather condi conditions? <laughs> it's just fabulous. Right. Uh, Chris still being here, and I'm told we have more drivers up there.
but uh, oh yeah, there, there are the guys from uh, Fossetti Motorsport. Uh, before we walk up to them, uh, that I think is one of the great stories in GT Force this year. Completely new team using the new uh, GT4 Winter Series to just have a go and try it out, and they are successful immediately. Yeah, yeah, they are. Uh, they've done a really superb job. Um, you know, to, to jump into that car, essentially, the team take it on uh, and develop a, 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 almost a new program and put these two together, Jamie Day and uh, Mikey Porter together. New pairing as well as teammates. You know, Jamie's had some GT4 experience at British level, at European level. Uh, Mikey's come up from Genetta Juniors fresh into this, uh, finished fourth in that championship last year. Uh, I always considered him one to watch, though, because that's a really tough championship. You know, the likes of Lando Norris have come out of that championship. Uh, so, yeah, they've had some really big names come out of it. So if you do well in that, I always think you can go and do any well pretty much anything i think we've got uh, uh ryan uh, one of our producers waiting for us down there maybe with a driver uh, but yeah i'd say these guys are uh, you know, are ones to watch going forward and i think that was a sign that race that they put in earlier with jamie essentially cleared off down the road uh, of what we're going to see possibly going forward i think, wouldn't say it's a sign to the other teams it was almost a, a threat uh, that these guys could almost run away with this championship but uh, i think the other teams will, will look to respond going into this endurance race now and, and try and get back on the ball because the races we've seen it's been four four for the win all the time and that was almost the first time we've really seen someone clear off down the road so yeah jamie day was a fantastic racer in karting single seaters and starting to prove it now in gt4 and that's a very nice aspect of gt4 winter series isn't it we've got three races per weekend for two different du durations uh in some cases two different drivers for the shorter ones and then a completely different third race to round it off yeah, it's uh, th th it's always great when you put the drivers together. You almost give them their own chance to go out there for 30 minutes uh, and have a sprint. No, 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 no coming into the pits. It's them to themselves as they're used to doing in kart racing. Uh, and then they have a chance to share the car, which I, I think is really, uh, really good way to learn how to race in endurance racing. You know, you, uh, it's, it's great for someone like Jamie or Mikey to be sat in the pit lane and watch the other driver go out first and then jump into whatever situation they're dealt with it might be that they're dealt with uh, you know a 10 second lead or that they're dealt with being dropped down to 10th place because something has happened on the track before them so that's the experience that these drivers have to go through and uh, that's what essentially they're going to go through as they move on to whatever it is they go to next i think all these drivers will be looking to go on to something like gt world challenge or the world endurance championship they've all got the potential to do that particularly these guys so uh, yeah i look forward to seeing what they do next they i think they're going to be some big names in the gt well for SETI Motorsport considering they're only getting started and and the most important thing their car looks amazing it looks amazing doesn't it it looks like an Aston Martin the, the delivery I, I know that sounds weird but it, it looks absolutely fantastic and it's a good but I mean we always have lots of Caymans of course because they are available in various configurations and it's very nice to have a couple of Astons on the grid and of course the uh, very very distinctive McLaren just as well. Uh, let's maybe have a look inside the uh, Fossetti pit box because we can see uh, that Mikey Porter is already getting ready for the next race that's coming up in a couple of minutes with a very very nice crowd still attending our pit walk i have to repeat myself this is so nice to see i mean if we look at the massive grandstand on this modern spec algarve circuit of course uh with a couple of hundred spectators that doesn't look too impressive in here though in the paddock in the pits it's a different story yeah it's you know really good atmosphere down here and uh, you know this is what it's all about is dealing with that that pressure isn't it of having Having the fans around you uh, for Jamie who's walking by now it's uh, you know he's not gonna be starting the race so for him it's uh, uh, having to get himself ready for you know half an hour's time 20 minutes time uh, and Mikey now of course is looking out to a, a huge crowd but he's used to that you know Janetta juniors race on the what we call the Toka package British touring cars they have yeah 30,000 fans so uh, yeah Mikey Porter he's used to race in front of big crowds I think he'll be dealing with this no problem Jamie likewise as well British GT he's raced in which have big crowds as well so uh, yeah i think that i'm not surprised they're both taken to this very comfortably and of course that's going to be the next race uh, on our schedule now fans uh, are being 
I was about to say kicked out, but that really isn't the case. And they are the properly, yeah, properly, properly complying. Uh, very nice to see uh, some fans here. And I think that really sets the tone for the remaining four rounds of the championship, all happening in Spain on fabulous circuits just as well. Yeah, you know, I've n the only circuit I've really been to is uh, is Barcelona. So these are new trips for me. I've got to say, this is a fantastic circuit, but they're all, they're all GT circuits, aren't they? Although we, we are welcoming the Formula cars next time, which I'm... Yeah. Super excited for, uh, you know, Casper Stuka, who was our champion last year, Red Bull Junior, and he's just signed to MP Motorsport as well as a Formula 3 driver. So looking forward to seeing those. But of course, we're concentrating on GTs now. I think they all provide something different, don't they? Aragon, so, so fast, uh, you know, hugely fast circuit. Uh, Valencia, more tight and twisty as well. Barcelona, real F1 style circuit, I guess. It's got a bit of everything to it. And Jerez, well, I've never really been there before. So I guess you can tell me a bit more about that one. It's a, it's a great circuit, though. Uh, you know, I think they've all got a bit something different to them. Need to admit, I haven't done Jerez on a uh, GT Winter Series weekend, but I went there on uh, for the MotoGP a couple of years ago. Spent watching the race on the service road. One of the most impressive things I ever saw. It's fabulous. It's f and it's got some fast sections to it as well, hasn't it? So these cars are really going to kick round there. Um, I, I think we should move to the side when the lights come on. I think that means uh, maybe we'll clear to the side. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think they all provide a different challenge, their own unique challenge. Uh, as does this this track, you know, this track is really on the elevation. I was speaking to Matt George, uh, who himself a GT racer over there, who's helping coaching uh, the guys this weekend uh, and going forwards. He's uh, going to be a part of this team. Uh, but yeah, he, he was telling me how, you know, driving around this circuit, breaking on the elevation, you've got to get the car nice and settled. Uh, yeah, weight, the weight transfer, even on these cars, really, really tough to deal with. Uh, again, at the first round, that was just, uh, you know, Estoril. Again, the, when you get there, he's blows away how much you know the start finish line is different to turn five and six for example so uh, yeah it, 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 the, the calendar is put together very very well and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, going forward throughout the season so two more races coming up today live from Portimao the GT winter series to round it off but next up is the GT4 winter series and in both races we are going to see a pit stop and in some teams that will include a driver change just as well. Now, earlier today, we spoke to Gianni van der Graat, the uh, young Dutch racer in the FK Performance BMW, and Adam Weller, our commentator, has been uh, busy catching up to some other drivers this week. And Rihanna O'Meara Hunt is Gianni's teammate in the FK Performance team, and will uh, and they spoke earlier this weekend i'm just waiting for confirmation if we can uh, roll the tape or if we are heading straight into race preparation because as you can see the uh, cars are heading into or out of the pits so here we go then this is the third and last race of the weekend for the gt4 winter series coming up next Yeah, we are back to live racing action then in a matter of moments as the GT4 Winter Series cars are heading back out there onto the circuit. We are going to go racing. It is going to be a very interesting pair or a very interesting 60-minute endurance race pit stop uh, set to come from minutes 25 to 35 here. And for a number of these teams, that does mean a driver change in this one. It will be Mikey Porter starting that number 19 Forsetti Motorsport car from pole position. As we saw, they are on pole position because uh, their lap time, uh, lap times, plural, across the two sessions were the fastest average uh, across the two times. So that was uh, uh, a good out uh, showing from them. And uh, they will be 
really on on it uh, going into the race, I'm sure. Mikey uh, has been getting stronger and stronger himself uh, at the wheel of that car. And, of course, Jamie Day is already a proven commodity uh, all over the world within the GT4 universe, but also, of course, in particular uh, in the GT Win Series, where he's already secured two race wins. The cars are headed down to the grid at the moment. And I believe Lukas Gajewski is going to hot-foot it across that barrier and uh, join them for a wee chat before we go racing. Uh, of course, the uh, Schnitzel Am Racing Mercedes AMG is the car that starts alongside Jamie Day uh, on that front row, and it is set to be uh, John Mesh, we understand, that takes the start in that one. Just uh, double-checking that. No, on my information, Marcel Marshevik should be taking the start uh, in that car. So Marcel Marshevik will take the start before handing over to Joel Mesh, who, of course, uh, took the win along with Jamo Hartling in the GT4 Endurance race last weekend at Estoril. He'll be looking to make it two from two in GT4 Wind Series Endurances uh, this time around. On the second row of the grid, Elite Motorsports, Tom Leban will be there in the McLaren Archera. No considerations given, of course, this time to uh, the tyres they're going to put on. Everyone on slicks this time, unlike yes, last time's endurance race. And uh, that McLaren, a very potent package. Look forward to seeing uh, how it performs across the uh, 60 minutes. And uh, that car alongside Matthew Martins as well, who'll be one to watch. Uh, in the number nine Placar Motorsport entry, Roberto Faria. I shared a car with him this morning on the way down to the circuit, and he seemed very confident in the race pace, uh, in particular, uh, of the Rakar Motorsport machine. So I think that uh, they are in a strong position, and uh, that is good news uh, for the Rakar Motorsport team. And uh, Forsetti Motorsport then showing up uh, to the grid as uh, everybody else pretty much is there now the last of the Caymans making their way as well the anticipation building for this 60 minute endurance race then uh, in uh, the GT4 winter series and uh, you can see there that the uh, grid pretty full I'm sure that the spectators will be heading back to the main grandstand in their droves for this 60 minute race this one is going to be very exciting these 16 cars in the GT4 winter series not as big of a grid of course as the main GT class uh, but very very competitive lots of strong lineups in all four classes Lucas Gajewski we can see him there from a long way away let's get a close-up over to Lucas Thank you very much, Adam. Here we are next to the number 66 Speedworks Automotive Porsche Cayman. This is a new team in the GT4 Winter Series this weekend. You can see Arne Hofmeister, young German racer, having a bit of a chat with Franz Linden, who will take the start and the first part of the race. And this is a bit of a story for Franz. He has a big, big history in Gietlich Racing, the company running and organizing the GT4. GT Winter Series package and it's his first competitive outing after starting in track days and I'm trying to disturb the two having their chat Arne kann ich mal gerade noch oh danke dir so Franz welcome to competitive racing welcome to GT4 Winter Series I was already explaining to the audience your history with Gatelich Racing how do you enjoy your time in a proper race competition now well I have to admit it's a totally different and new world which i also to 100 percent enjoy i'm really uh, it's really a pleasure being part of this uh, team and also being part of this race uh, it's brand new it's different uh, but it's bottom line a lot of fun that's great to hear not too scary hopefully no no <laughs> lots of respect but no fear that's great to hear franz thank you very thank much you. That's very, very good to hear. Uh, is Arne still here? Yes, let's just uh, check with Arne Hofmeister because we spoke earlier about the uh, topic of coaching. Arne, very interesting task, I guess, for you just as well to have someone who has quite a lot of experience in a racing car but who has never taken part in any competition. Yeah, th exactly. It's, we have a lot of fun and uh, now it's, it's the next step for Franz, uh, as you explained already. Um, he's doing a great job and he is having fun, so for us the weekend was perfect and we hope to have fun again in the last race for today. 
Now, of course, you're being very used to uh, GT4 and GT racing in general. Is it still, after all these years, hard to be in the pit box watching and waiting for the car to come back in for the driver change? Yes, yes, of course. You explained my, my job is more coaching than driving. And yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to, to watch Franz, how he's doing. And then I have to focus on my driving. So it's not so easy sometimes. Thank you very much, Arne, and best of luck to you guys. So there is your new addition to the uh, GT4 Winter Series, the number 66 Speedworks Automotive Porsche. Definitely keep an eye uh, on this one because it really is an advertisement for what you can achieve as a gentleman driver within the Gietlich Racing and GT Winter Series package. Although they are, of course, for now, lining up pretty much last on the grid. Next to the 127 BMW, there is the 81 car and a bit further up the order is the car we were speaking about earlier on. That's the FK Performance BMW that's going to be shared by Gianni van der Graz and Rihanna Omira Hunt, the Canadian racer. However, out front, it's going to be Schnitzelarm racing in the Mercedes AMG GT4 in second place on the grid. And for SETI Motorsport, we just, uh, we've just been in their pit garage, are starting this almost hour-long race from pole position once again. Quick at break and then it's going to be Adam Weller on the comms for the last race of the GT4 weekend. So then welcome back from the commentary box. We've uh, taken a walk through the pits. We've taken a walk on the grid. We're now focusing back on the racetrack once again with Facetti Motorsports' Mikey Porter leading us around the circuit on this formation lap. It will be Mikey Porter uh, handing over to Jamie Day in the second half of the race, of course. They'll be alongside Marcel Marchevitz uh, and uh, Joel Mesh in the uh, on the first row of the grid to so the Schnitzelam Racing number 11 car right there primed and poised to try and take another endurance racing win. Tom Leben, the 78 Elite Motorsport McLaren. Uh, Leben is starting the car. Zach Meekin uh, is set to follow, although uh, Matthew Martins is ahead of him in the queue and he's meant to be uh, in fourth place on the grid. So I'm not quite sure how that's happened, but there we are. Uh, Matthew Martins incidentally sharing with Rakar Motorsports, Roberto Faria. Uh, Faria was only confirmed very late for this weekend, so he's uh, very much enjoying jumping in last minute uh, for a second weekend in the GT4 Winter Series. Row three of the grid, Andreas Huffler uh, is going to be sharing with his son, Leo Pischler, and it's Huffler taking the start, so we'll see how he does. Uh, Charles Dawson uh, from row three, he is alongside, of course, young Emil Yerdrum. We'll run through the rest of these as quick as we can. NM Racing Team's Max Huber, the number 10 car, alongside Vimmerwerk Motorsports' Ivan Ekelschik. Row five of the grid, Alberto Di Martin will be sharing with Neil Montserrat in the NM Racing Team car. Then it is the... Uh, Vimmer, sorry, the FK Performance entry, Gianni van der Kratz set to take the start. He'll hand over to Rihanna O'Meara Hunt. Uh, in row six, it's the pair of SR Motorsport Porsches in the Cayman Trophy class. Mikhail Sander in the 111, set to start alongside Enrico Ferdera in the 110 car. Ferdera likely to make up some places early doors in this race. Speedy Motorsports, Louis Liberal is alongside Richard Wolf in an all BMW row seven. Speedworks Automotive's Franz Linden, who we heard from on the grid will be joined by Mikael Bonk on the final row of the grid. So then it is 60 minutes of endurance racing in the GT4 Winter Series. We're about to go racing and it is Jamie Day rolling towards the start finish line on the inside 
of the front row. Joel Mesh will be looking for his opportunity to go around the outside and challenge early doors. We've seen so many fights between those four pro-class cars at the front of the order. Uh, for Seti Motorsport, Schnitzelaum Racing, Elite Motorsport and Lacar Motorsport, Mikey Porter, Marcel Marshevitz, Tom Leban and Matthew Martins, your cast of characters for the opening salvo of this 60-minute GT4 Winter Series race. Pit stops in the middle 10 minutes of the race. That's going to be very interesting to see how that affects things. But for now, it's an all-out run to the first corner. And it should be Mikey Porter that leads them there. We go green, we go racing. And it is Mikey Porter with a decent start. But Joel Mesh is right there with him as they run towards the first corner of the lap. Who's got the run through the corner? Certainly the inside line is preferable. And Mikey Porter will, in fact, lead into the first turn. Joel Mesh runs it wide. but. Uh, nothing that Tom Levin could do about that. Matthew Martins looking for second place in the number nine Rakar. Aston Martin, he has to settle for P3 for the time being. Everybody else navigating their way through the pack as they now come up from behind the, cre uh, the crest of the hill down towards turn five. And Mikey Porter goes defensive and he has to because there are a lot of very fast drivers behind him. Andreas Hufler and Ivan Ekelchik in the two Porsche Caymans joining in with the scrap early doors as well. The two NM Racing Team cars have already found each other. Neil Montserrat will have his head in his hands going this again. Side by side, guys. Really? Yes, really. Side by side for second place as well as Joel Mesh under pressure from Matthew Martins as they run down through turn nine for the first time. Everybody cleanly through the first few turns by the looks of it. Looks like we still got our full quota of cars. Enrico Ferdera is making up places as we expected in the Cayman Trophy cars. The first of the plain white Porsches in the hands of Enrico Ferdera making up some places. We'll see exactly where that car is uh, when uh, we cross the line for the first time. I think it's well in the top 10 though. There is Alberto Di Martin chasing Max Huber for the AM class lead. Meanwhile, at the front in the pro class, it is pro one, two, three, four, and it's Mikey Porter and uh, Marcel Martovic that lead this scrap at the moment. Tom Leban there in P3. Martovic running down the main straight and Looking to the inside, but he's not going to be close enough. Mikey Porter holds on then for the time being, but he drifts really, really very wide indeed through the first corner. That's the opportunity for Martovic, or is it? Because Porter carries the speed around the outside on the runoff area, and he retains the lead. Now, he can't afford to do that too many times. I'm sure once is probably forgivable, but they do have to be careful of doing that time and time again, or else the track limits fairies will start to cast their magic spells. I'm talking about the stewards. Uh, Marcel Martovic goes to the outside line at turn five. Can he carry the speed around the outside of the corner? No, surely not. Uh, but it is still almost side by side as they run up the hill through the kink at turn six. And it is going to be Mikey Porter that just about has the car ahead by the time they get to turn seven. The two Aston Martins then sandwiching the Mercedes AMG GT4. But the interesting thing is, of course, that all three of these cars are powered by the same basic four litre uh, Mercedes AMG power plant. So uh, the cars should be very even in a straight line at least. Looks like there was some grass kicked up on the exit of turn eight, but everybody is through safely. Your leader in Cayman Trophy, Enrico Ferdera, was seventh across the line, so he did indeed make up places early on. He's now trying to chase down Andreas Hufler in the full-fat, full GT4 spec Cayman. Through the 14th corner, the penultimate corner of the lap, they go. And Porter will lead for another lap for Facetti Motorsports. And they would love to chalk up a first enduro race victory. Of course, Mikey Day has claimed two races as an individual. He's yet to stand on the stop, stop step with Mikey Porter, though. And that's what they're trying to achieve in this one. Mikey Porter, all too accustomed to defensive driving in the Jets of Juniors. So Marcel Martovic is going to struggle uh, to find his way past this youngster without a very smart move. Uh, however, Martovic to the inside line at turn three. A little bit later on the brakes than Porter. Porter is very clever about it, doesn't cut 
to the inside because he knows he has the inside for turn four. But is he still there? I'm not sure he is. I think Martovic may well have done enough. We'll see them emerge now uh, from turn four. And it is still side by side. Mikey Porter did hold on. He's still got the inside line at turn five. And still they are side by side as they now head back uphill towards turn number six. They will now head towards turn seven and eight. And I don't know who's going to be in the lead by the time they get there. It is Marcel Martovic just about. Matthew Martin says, well, can I come through also? And he does find a slightly open door. It's now side by side between the Astons and the McLaren wants to run interference as well. Tom Levin looking to try and have a go as the two Astons do in fact run side by side. And it is going to be Matthew Martins with the inside line into turn 11. Surely that second place to him. It certainly looked like it was as they exited stage left. We pick them back up at turns 12 and 13, and it is the Rakar Motorsport Aston Martin that leads the way. Mikey Porter wants to go on the offensive now to try and get some of those positions back. Ivan Ekelchik getting involved as well in the first of the Pro-Am runners. Ekelchik uh, handing over later on to uh, Jaegor uh, in the uh, in the Vimmerwerk team. Jaegor Hishin taking that car over after the pit stop window. We'll see how that youngster gets on in just his second weekend of racing a car uh, later on in the day. Mikey Porter up into sixth gear then as they run down that main straight in the slipstream of the top two, flashing the headlights. He wants to pull this one back if he possibly can. No pit stop handicaps, unlike the prototypes in these GT endurance races. So these drivers have to win these on merit. And uh, it is going to be a, a long, hard slog for anyone uh, to find a way past Marcel Martovic or indeed Joel Mesh once the Schnitzelau Mercedes AMG GT4 has got itself to the front. But Matthew Martins is clearly feeling game. He flashes the headlights as well. And we've seen him pull some wonder moves already this season from fourth to first place at Gancho in race one at Estoril. Uh, the, uh, the biggest flourish of all in the first ever GT4 Winter Series race definitely went to Matthew Martins with that phenomenal maneuver. The top five clearing themselves off then from the rest of the field as they dip down through eight and into nine now. Basically like jumping from the third floor of a, third floor of a flat um, going from uh, turn eight to turn nine. Uh, it is quite the decline as they run through 10 and 11. Uh, Andreas Hufler and Enrico Federer also packing together in sixth and seventh. Then it's the BMWs of Van der Kratz uh, and uh, Richard Wolf fighting for eighth overall. Richard Wolf is your AM class leader in eighth place overall as it stands. Marcel Martovic looks like he's under some pressure from Matthew Martins as they come out of turn 14. Martins uh, just looking for his opportunity. Now let's see uh, what the run is out of the final corner for the number nine Aston Martin. If he gets a good run, turn one can be an overtaking opportunity. I don't think the run is quite good enough for him on this occasion, but I've been proven wrong plenty of times before, especially by drivers as determined as Matthew Martins has raced Ligiers. He's raced Porsche Cup cars. He's now in GT4 machinery and looking for his opportunities uh, to race more GTs in 2024. And what a way to showcase yourself if you can get a good result here in the GT4 win series, if you can prove yourself in a championship against competition as we have in this class, a spoil of riches in terms of silver rated hot shoes in this category. Lots of promising youngsters. There's Mikey Porter in third place, also keeping a watching brief. And I think Mikey, um, as young and as new to GT4s as he is, I know he's a very clever young driver. I think he'll just be sitting there waiting for Matthew Martins to have a go because I think Matthew Martins is observably determined uh, most of the time at the wheel of a racing car. And I just don't anticipate that he's going to sit there and keep his powder dry for the entirety uh, of this stint. So I think that sooner rather than later, Martins is going to try and open that door kick it down or otherwise even if he has to pick the lock he'll try and open the door and get through and when he does that well it might just swing open for Mikey Porter also so I think Mikey is just waiting for that opportunity to arise if and when it does great to ride on board there with the Facetti Mode Sport car 
Mikey Porter proving to be a competent cameraman as well as an exceedingly talented driver uh, at this stage of the race. Again, Martovic and Martins very close together as they exit the penultimate corner of the lap. But now through turn 15, uh, Martins has to try and hold on to the rear of the AMG. You see the car, the Aston, drifting slightly wide. That might just be dirty air causing a little bit of interference with the car's steering ability. Uh, even though these cars aren't exactly the most aerodynamic laden devices you've ever seen, it still has an effect trying to follow a car. Oh, and Matthew Martins was uh, very much uh, faster turning into the corner there uh, than Joel Mesh. I thought for a minute they might uh, find each other. I should say uh, Marcel Martovic, of course. It's Marcel Martovic that started the car. My apologies. So uh, Martovic then uh, running in the front of the order here. Indeed, uh, Martovic will be handing over uh, to young Joel Mesh, who... Uh, also finished the race with Jamo Hartling last time out. And Matthew Martins, oh, for a minute there, looked to the inside. But he's sort of compromised his run now up the hill through six. And uh, let's see uh, whether or not uh, he can find an opportunity in the next few turns. Turn 10 and 11 is uh, an overtaking spot that we've seen in use a couple of times this weekend. You have to be fully committed down the hill and through turn 9 in order to give it a go. But I tell you what, he's not far away, is he? Flacking those headlights as they run through 10 and 11. Matthew Martins uh, not close enough for a move on that, uh, on that occasion. Ah, and we have a car off the circuit, the 85 of Charles Dawson. You see it there. I was about to say there's uh, some new skid marks. And unfortunately, with the safety car now out, this brilliant battle has to come to an end. And also, uh, the race has come to an end for Charles Dawson as well. So Charles Dawson, who was uh, running fairly well, started from the third row of the grid, has unfortunately had a moment there. You can see those telltale um, tracks behind the car. I think he just locked it up into turn 10 and could never get the thing turned in. And unfortunately, now stuck in the gravel. I'm sure uh, Seb Morris will be trying to impart some words of uh, advice, some calming words down the headset to his, uh, his coachee. Uh, his coaching client, uh, Charles Dawson, but uh, unfortunately, uh, there's no two ways around it. The race effectively finished for the CV Performance Group car. It may well be recovered and may well continue. However, uh, the, the car will not be a factor in the Pro-Am leading battle by the looks of it uh, in today's race. So then your order as we are under safety car for the first time in this race is Marcel Martovic, your leader, Matthew Martins in second place. Then it's Mikey Porter, Tom Leban in fourth position, Ivan Ekelcik in fifth place. Then it's Andreas Hufler in P6, Enrico Ferdera in seventh, Richard Wolf in eighth, Gianni van der Kratz in ninth place, and Alberto Di Martin in P10. Mikhail Sander is in 11th position, 12th place is Mikhail Bonk, in 13th position is Franz Linden, 14th place, and unfortunately, as we saw uh, in the gravel, uh, Charles Dawson. And I also note that in the pit lane is the NM Racing Team car uh, of, uh, of Max Huber. That's hugely unfortunate, actually, because Huber is always one to watch in the AM class, and that car looks to be going no further. So that is a, that is a big shame. You see the recovery crews then working uh, to recover Charles Dawson. Uh, we also didn't see uh, the Speedy Motorsport BMW uh, take the start of the race. So uh, no start for Luis Liberal, unfortunately, uh, in the number five Speedy Motorsport car, electing not to partake uh, in the endurance race. The car did suffer an issue with brake pressure uh, in the... Uh, first race of the weekend uh, on Saturday so potentially that is uh, that is an issue uh, that has reared its ugly head once again we'll have to see uh, whether that is the case or not uh, we'll find out I'm sure in the post in the postscript as it were 
So Charles Dawson's car still in the midst of recovery. And of course, uh, for the AM class drivers that uh, are maybe handing over, or indeed the Pro AM drivers that are handing over to their Pro later, uh, this could be beneficial. I'm looking at Andreas Herfler, for example, there in the Razoon Milwaukee backed Razoon Porsche there. The 77 car just going out of shot. Uh, Andreas Herfler. Um, he'll be the first to tell you, since he's Leo Pischler's dad, that Leo Pischler is faster than he is. At least I'd like to think that that's the way that works. Uh, Andreas Herfler will hand over to Leo Pischler, and this helps Leo Pischler potentially become a factor in the overall fight uh, in the second phase of the race with this safety car period. I'd also say this car, Alberto uh, Di Martin, uh, is potentially, I don't know about a factor for an overall result, but could well uh, be a top five contender and certainly an AM class victory contender. Alberto Di Martin handing over to the extremely talented Nil uh, Montserrat, uh, who, despite being downgraded to bronze, is um, a bit of a super bronze, if you will. Uh, also, the team boss of NM Racing Team. So I suspect that this car running in ninth place will ascend up the order after the pit window is complete. Uh, this safety car is going to have a skewing effect on the race to an extent, then. I think also... Uh, Mikhail Sander and uh, Franz Linden will benefit from this as well. The uh, second and third place cars within Cayman Trophy. Uh, because, of course, in the case of Sander, he's handing over to Thomas Rackle, the young uh, karting ace who's making his first steps in car racing. He was very quick uh, in the race earlier on today in the 30-minute sprint. So I expect him to be uh, very impressive. And then also in the case of Franz Linden, he's handing the Speedworks Automotive Cayman Trophy car. Uh, over to Arne Hofmeister, his driver coach, and I expect him uh, to be very, very fast and very, very handy uh, as the race gets underway. Did see another car speeding around the circuit there in the uh, far shot. I, I don't quite know whether that's just a course vehicle. Uh, no, it's the Vimavert Motorsport Porsche. Uh, so the Vimavert car has been in the pit lane. Uh, was running well up there in the top five, but Ivan Ekelchik has been into the pits. Uh, safety car is still out there. I don't think it's expected in this time, so he won't lose much time. He will lose a lot of position, and sure enough, the safety car obviously is still out there because we're still uh, dealing with the crane game down at turn 10 and turn 11. There's no shame in losing to a crane, gents, but we do have a race that we'd like to try and restart. They're doing a great job getting that car uh, back onto the flatbed now, though. It took a couple of laps to get the, the straps on there and make sure the car was secure, which obviously you want to do, make sure everything is safe. And uh, we will hopefully, within uh, at least the next two laps, get this race back underway once again. The pit window opens in just under eight minutes so with 35 minutes of the race left to go the pit window will open it will close again with 25 minutes left to go so the pit window uh, looms large over this race as well i'm sure that if you're a, a, a marshevix a, a matthew martins you want to try and be a hare while you can, get away while you can before a few of the uh, the more experienced or faster drivers get into the cars behind you. Uh, certainly, we know Jamie Day is one of the quickest drivers on this grid. Uh, nothing against Mikey Porter either. It's a very strong driver lineup at Forsetti. Um, and then, of course, you've got Zach Meekin, who's done a good amount of driving here at uh, Portimao. Feels very comfortable at this circuit, so I expect him to be good once he takes over, too. And, of course, in the AM class, you, or the uh, other classes, you have to consider uh, that as well, that potentially, uh, with this time taken away from them, I'm looking at Ivan Ekelchik in particular, actually, even though he's now at the very back of the order. Uh, Ekelchik handing over to, uh, to Yegor, uh, Hishin, who is a, a, a very promising young driver, but certainly not quite on the pace of uh, uh, Ivan Ekelchik just yet. And so uh, potentially that uh, Vimavert team will be ruining the fact that they've lost some of their uh, pro driver time in that Pro Am lineup. Lights still on on the safety car. I hope that this will be the final lap under safety car conditions. It looks a little bit touch and go at the moment as the uh, flatbed is being prepped to, to head off 
uh, into the service roads once again. There is your field running through your class leader, Richard Wolf there in the 81 BMW, just behind this one of uh, Vandekratz, Gianni Vandekratz, the uh, BMW M2 Cup Benelux champion of 2023, of course, um, sharing with Rihanna O'Meara Hunt. Uh, Rihanna is uh, set to take that car over, the, the Kiwi racer who uh, got to speak to earlier in the week. She said, uh, I work at Highlands Motorsport Park, of all places, as a, as a driver coach, which to me is by far New Zealand's coolest looking racing circuit. It's a very impressive track. Check an onboard lap or two of that place uh, if you can, or indeed the first lap of the Highlands 101, where they have to do a classic Le Mans style run in order to get to their cars. Um, well worth a look at Highlands Motorsport Park if you've never seen it and you're into uh, binge watching YouTube onboards, you'll be there a while. It's a, it's a pretty impressive place. And uh, she gets to work as a driver coach there started her racing in uh, Toyota 86s, uh, or at least car racing wise, one of her first forays into cars was uh, Toyota 86s, uh, did some running in the GTR New Zealand class after that, which uh, is a very spectacular series in terms of grid variety, I must say, um, and then has been plying her trade in BMW since then, uh, sorry, in GT4s since then. This is her first weekend in the BMW, and I believe she's set to race in the uh, 24 hours of Dubai next weekend, so she's gonna have a lot of BMW seat time to contend with after today's race. Uh, but Rihanna will take that car over in a few minutes. So then, 39 minutes and 15 seconds of the race left to go. I don't see a flatbed, I don't see a Mercedes. I do see a bulletin saying safety car in this lap. So we are going to go back to racing this time. Safety car will come in and we will be underway uh, once again under green flag conditions. What can Matthew Martins do uh, as this race resumes? He was really looking quite feisty behind Marcel Marshevix before the pit, uh, before the safety car came out and intervened. Let's see what happens as we go back to racing conditions. There you see, just holding the field at a very slow pace now is Marcel Martovic. He's probably going to pull the pin. Yes, just going into the final corner. And uh, he launches the car away, takes the corner flat as best he can. He's pursued by the Astons, by the McLarens, by the Porsches as they run through the final turn up the main straight for the first time back under green flag conditions. Mikey Porter fancies a go at Matthew Martins. He's been afforded the outside line, though, in the force. Setti Aston and can't quite get that done. Uh, Matthew Martins holding on to second place then. He was rather hoping he'd get to try and go on the offensive uh, up against the race leading Mercedes, but instead he's having to defend that second place. Uh, everyone through the first couple of turns readily and well then. Mikey Porter just battling the car a little bit through turn four. Very easy to get it wrong at turn four. We saw in the GT Winter Series uh, in qualifying, unfortunately, the uh, the car that was set to be driven by Bruno Spengler in the endurance race, Louis Stern's FK Performance GT3 BMW. Uh, that car had an incident in qualifying uh, with Stern at the wheel, and that uh, concluded their weekend before the first race even started. I understand Louis is okay, uh, but car needed repairs beyond what they could achieve uh, within the paddock. So uh, certainly an early flight home for Bruno Spengler, who we were hoping to see uh, on the track. We're hoping to have him in the commentary box too, but uh, sadly had to head home. Ivan Ekelchik uh, going through some of the cars further back in the pack. Of course, he started uh, this, uh, well, resumed this race at the very back of the pack after visiting the pit lane, and he's already up into what looks like 10th position. So Ekelchik working his way back through in the uh, orange and white Wimmerwerk Porsche. And look at Andreas Hofler. He's really doing a fairly solid job, isn't he, in the uh, number 77 car. So Hofler uh, running quite nicely here. And of course, he's handing over to Leo Pischler, his son, who has repeatedly proven to be a force to be reckoned with already in the GT4 Winter Series paddock and in various GT4 paddocks elsewhere uh, around Europe and within their native, well, not their native Germany, but uh, their nearby Germany. They are Austrians. And uh, 
Van der Kratz second in Pro-Am, about four seconds down the road from them as well. So, uh, or about two seconds down the road from them. Four seconds behind the leader is uh, Van der Kratz in sixth overall, second in Pro-Am. But there is Andreas Hoofler just clinging on to the rear of Tom Leban at the moment. A very fast family by the looks of it, the, the hofler Pichler clan. The inside goes Marcel Martovic, covering off the threat of Matthew Martins, who is once again uh, looking to go on the offensive. As I said, I thought he'd try it uh, as we restarted, but uh, Mikey Porter had other plans and uh, tried to get around Matthew Martins. But now Martins looks like he's uh, got his eye back in, got the tyres up to temp, and he wants to try and get past Marcel Martovic before the pit window opens. Incidentally, the window will be open as they pass pit entry this time. Uh, so the pit window to open in just 20 seconds. And we'll see uh, what effect that has on this race. Who will pit and when is the big question. Will anyone pull the pin on the first occasion? I suspect maybe uh, someone like a, a Franz Linden might pass the car over uh, to his pro pretty quickly. Maybe Alberto Di Martino as well. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, but Mikey Porter following on behind uh, Marshevics and Martins. Uh, last time they split this race about down the middle at Forsetti. Uh, but we'll see uh, whether they do that this time. Certainly uh, the top two continue on, but Mikey Porter with the tight line. He's coming into the pits, I believe. Porter, yes, into the pit lane comes Mikey. I understand this was the original plan at uh, Estoril for the endurance race, but it didn't pan out that way. This time, though, Mikey Porter uh, is handing the car over pretty sharpish uh, to his teammates. Meanwhile, Ivan Ekelchik continues his move up the field, this time up against Richard Wolf. Uh, didn't quite have the room to dive up the inside there, though. This is the battle for sixth place overall. Well, battle for fifth place, really, because Enrico Ferdera is right there with him as well. There are your leading two, Martovic and Martins. There's Leban in third place. And then you've got that scrum in the back of shot for fourth position, uh, for fifth position, sorry, being led by Ferdera. Uh, there's Mikey Porter out of the car then. Good first stint from Mikey. And up into sixth place has gone Ivan Ekelchik. He's gotten himself past Richard Wolf, so that is a change for position. Enrico Ferdera uh, will be his next target. Ferdera in the Cayman Trophy car. Again, I remind you, not a full fat uh, GT4 machine, but close to it. Uh, so on paper, Ekelchik has the better car. Uh, but of course, setup and things like that can have an effect. Uh, but uh, for all the will in the world, I'm not sure Ferdera is quite going to be able to hold off Ivan Ekelchik, who uh, seems to mean business uh, now that he's back in the car after that uh, unscheduled and unexplained pit stop uh, as well as uh, the always we have the move going on I was just looking at the timing screen but move for fifth place uh, as Ivan Ekelchik goes through that's uh, fairly academic stuff then uh, for Ekelchik the faster car gets through and will now move on to try and chase down Gianni van der Kratz uh, who is significantly less experienced than Ivan Ekelchik in GT4 machinery so we'll see uh, how long it takes for that to maybe become another position uh, for the charging Ekelchik in the Vima Vert car uh, as well as for Seti Motorsport and Jamie Day we also saw a few pit stops elsewhere uh, Leo Pischler uh, came in in the uh, in the Cayman. So he uh, takes the car over from his father, Andreas Herfler. Thomas Rackel has come in, or rather has taken the car over at SR Motorsport from Mikael Sander. Uh, we've also had the Arne Hofmeister Porsche in as well. Uh, Franz Linton handing over to him. We see there Alberto Di Martin in the pit lane and the very fast Neil Montserrat is about to belt himself in and uh, go after it uh, in the AM class battle. I suspect he'll be uh, challenging Richard Wolfe for the AM lead uh, before the end of this one. The 15 car belting up at the moment, Neil Montserrat, and we'll see how he performs in the second stanza of this race.
through turns 10 and 11 they go then 31 minutes and 30 seconds of this race are still to come so approaching half distance approaching halfway in the pit window as well Marshavix and Martins it looks like there's very very little in it it's going to be very interesting to see how the race changes once uh, Joel Mesh takes over the number 11, the leading Schnitzelau Mercedes, and when Roberto Farrier, uh, the XGB3 and Formula 3 star, takes over uh, the Aston Martin in second place from Rakar Motorsport. Does either car duck into the pits this time? No. I suspect that these are two driver lineups that are basically going to cut it down the middle, though, so I think we'll see them and even potentially Tom Levin as well in as well. I suspect that all three cars in that picture are probably due a pit stop this time by, but they could uh, prove me wrong. Usually all pro lineups will uh, will typically uh, cut the race in half, and we'll see if that proves to be the case. Another couple of stops this time. Uh, Charles Dawson is back running again, I, uh, I see. Um, Although, actually, no, I think he's just been taken into the pits um, by the flatbed and it's showing up as the car in the pits. So uh, Charles Dawson isn't running again, but uh, he's listed in the pits, as is Max Huber, who sadly pulled in after just three laps. The only car still running to uh, make appear an appearance in the pits this time is uh, Mikhail Bonk for Hofer Racing by Bonk Motorsport. Um, he hands the car over from second in Am, and there is the 127 car, which will be now hand over to, handed over to Martin Kroll, who's been a little bit off the pace uh, so far this weekend. We'll see how he performs now, taking over this car that was running P2 in the Am categorization. It's getting very close once again as Matthew Martins uh, continues to try and uh, just 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 knock on the door of Marcel Marshavik, see if he can uh, find passage, gain entry through any means. And uh, let's see if either of them do pit this time then. Four minutes and 30 left on the pit window. No pit stop handicaps in this series. So everyone has to adhere to the same uh, minimum pit stop Delta, which I believe here is 79 seconds. Uh, so they have to do that. And both drivers actually carry on. OK, so uh, uh, clearly both team bosses looking at their drivers and saying, you know what, I think they've got their eye in right now. Let's keep them out there as long as we can. Tom Leban not peeling in either. The uh, Bonk Mode Sports BMW heads out. And oh, the lead has changed. The lead has changed with a car slowing. Uh, that was Max Huber, I think, coming back out on an outlap. Uh, after several laps spent in pit lane. And Matthew Martins runs off the circuit and gains a position as a result of it as they went either side of the back marker. Marcel Marshavix isn't going to have any of that, though. He's going to try and challenge now as they run down into turn five. I'm sure the argument from uh, Matthew Martins will be, well, where else could I go? Uh, but I don't know how much that will hold in the, uh, in the court of, uh, of stewards. Uh, we'll see what goes on there. But uh, certainly, as a rule, you're not supposed to make overtakes by going off the circuit. But... Uh, there were circumstances at play there, potentially, that might uh, uh, cast a uh, and cast a nicer outlook on it from the stewards. We'll have to wait and see. But the reality of the situation is uh, that Marshavix is no longer your leader. We ride on board with him there on your picture-in-picture. Picture, and Marshavix is... Uh, just studying now the rear of Matthew Martin. And, of course, Roberto Farrier will now be rubbing his hands together, saying, I take over the leading car. Excellent. And uh, we'll see uh, whether or not he can uh, make something happen once he does take that car over, trying to hold on to that advantage. Uh, we've got 27 minutes and 20 seconds left of the race. They could still do one more lap in theory, but I suspect, yes, at least one of them will come in, and it is uh, Marcel Marshavik's in. Uh, Roberto Farri has got one more lap left to wait, and so does Zach Meekin as Tom Levin continues on his merry way. Pretty much mm, almost everyone in the field has now made their stop. Uh, in fact, I think everyone but the top two uh, will be making their stop. Yes, indeed. Uh, so these are the last two cars left now, Matthew Martins and Tom Levin, um, that we're not yet seeing in the pit lane. Jamie Day is the first of those 
uh, that have pitted. Now, the question is going to be, where does Jamie Day come out relative to Marcel Martrovic? Uh, because, of course, Jamie Day is pitted. He was... He's taken over the car that was in that lead battle earlier on. And, of course, Marcel Martrovic was our leader until about a lap ago. So it's going to be critical to see quite how Jamie Day and Marcel Martrovic rejoin each other uh, in this race. Matthew Martins will also be there with them uh, in about a lap's time. Or, yeah, about a lap's time, because he's got half a lap before he's going to have to make that pit stop. And Tom Levin equally uh, is going to have to pit this time at least... They fall outside of the pit window, and that is a no, no, and no again uh, in the eyes of our stewards. Marcel Marshavix then exits pit lane, but where is Jamie Day relative to him? The Aston just came past my commentary box window. I think Marcel Marshavix should just about come out. Oh, sorry, Joel Mesh, as it now is, having taken over the car, should just about come out ahead of Jamie Day, and oh goodness me, it's getting very close between Rihanna O'Meara Hunt and Richard Wolf. Rihanna's taken over from Gianni van der Kratz, and this is a battle uh, for something like fifth or sixth overall, and uh, Rihanna wants to uh, start to get those elbows out, and it uh, looks like she was defending very hard against Richard Wolf as these two scrap. Rihanna goes defensive there into turn three, and Richard Wolf had to duck out of the way of that one. Ah, now Elite Motorsports haven't pitted Tom Levin. Levin has come across the line as the race leader, and he now is outside the pit window. What has gone on with Tom Levin? Side by side and through goes Richard Wolf uh, to get up and past Rihanna O'Meara Hunt. And now right ahead of him is Yegor Kichin in the 24 car so suddenly the pro-am second place battle joined by the two am class leaders richard wolf is going to have to keep an eye on the mercedes amg just behind because that is neil montserrat challenging him for the am lead so you've got second in pro-am followed by the am leader followed by third in pro-am followed by second in pro-am so Four cars fighting two classes. Neil Montserrat around the outside of Rihanna O'Meara Hunt there. Neil Montserrat, I think, moving up into eighth place overall as a result of that then. Matthew Martins in the pit lane, as you can see, as Neil Montserrat gets himself past Jaeger Heeshin. So Jaeger Heeshin uh, moves down the order further and is now under pressure from his Pro-Am class fellow racer, Rihanna O'Meara Hunt. Tom Levin, meanwhile, is still circulating around the circuit, and he's fallen outside of the pit window, unfortunately, and that is pretty much a slam-dunk penalty, as far as I know the regulations. So we'll have to see what happens with Levin and Meekin. There is the AM class lead then under contest because Neil Montserrat in the slipstream of Richard Wolf. We ride on board with Montserrat then as he dives to the inside at the first corner. Is the BMW still there? Well, I surely hope not because Neil Montserrat drifted wide. Where is Richard Wolf relative to the Spanish racer? I think Neil may have gotten through or is Richard Wolf still there? Uh, I think it may still be side by side, but Montserrat with the inside line into turn four. That should be a position gained. That should be the AM lead then for the NM Racing Team, Team Boss. Neil Montserrat is still under pressure from Richard Wolf. Wolf around the outside at turn five. The talented AM driver going against the Team Boss of NM Racing Team. And it looks like Neil Montserrat now has this covered off. Richard Wolf needs to act quickly in order to try and get this AM class lead back. Because to be honest with you, uh, if it's down to pure pace, I expect Montserrat to be the quicker driver. And sure enough, as they now start to head towards more apexes more challenging section of the circuit the mercedes just starts to find a half car length or so at most corners tom levin meanwhile in the pit lane at long last handing over to zach meekin but again this has fallen outside of the pit window the pit window shut with 25 minutes of the race left to go and i believe that means that uh, tom levin uh, and indeed, Zach Meekin may be punished for that transgression. So then Zach Meekin rejoins the race. Meanwhile, the top two are exceedingly close at the front of the order. Jamie Day and Joel Mesh will be running through the first few corners of the lap as we speak. And Mesh is just behind Jamie Day. Now, I think that uh, Joel, Joel Mesh was ahead of Jamie Day 
before uh, after the after the pit stop so i think jamie day may well have overtaken mesh on track uh, nonetheless jamie day is your race leader mesh is second place meekin uh, is registering in third position albeit again this question mark hanging over their heads regarding the pit window and then roberto farrier is down in fourth position and uh, he'll be looking to try and pick up some momentum and go podium hunting leo pishler is in fifth place and leading in pro-am just 6.2 seconds off the lead as well he could still be a factor for a podium over the next 21 minutes and five seconds of that i am certain Top six within six seconds, or top five, I should say, within six seconds then in this race. We see the drone hovering over turn 12 then, watching expectant expectantly at one of the uh, primary overtaking spots of the lap, turn 12 into 13, and indeed then into 14 thereafter. But everybody in the top five a little bit too spread right now. And look at the gap now between Jamie Day and Joel Mesh. The gap is out, I think, to something like two seconds. We'll confirm it as they cross the line. Uh, 0.6 last time by. Let's see what the gap is on this occasion. Through goes Jamie Day. He's followed by Joel Mesh. And it's 1.7 seconds, the gap between the two of them. So, yes, the gap is extending. The Pro-Am second place battle is once again getting interesting as Jaeger Heeshin uh, tries his best to hold off Rihanna O'Meara Hunt. And they're being joined by the lead battle in the Cayman Trophy. So that is Thomas Rackel and uh, Arne Hofmeister uh, closing in on the Pro-Am second place scrap uh, so again two different classes being contested at the same time on track there and the big BMW trying to stave off the Porsches and pass the Porsches Porsches everywhere that uh, Rihanna O'Meara Hunt looks and uh, Thomas Rackel getting past uh, the big BMW then and uh, Hofmeister trying to follow suit Rihanna O'Meara Hunt already down to 10th place, still there third in Pro-Am though, and looking for a way past Jaeger Hishin, if at all possible. There is Hishin, there is Thomas Rackel, and here comes Arne Hofmeister, gets past Rihanna O'Meara Hunt then. And now Rihanna will be hoping that these two Cayman Trophy cars can maybe uh, part the seas for her in the battle in Pro-Am. However, actually, she's firing back at Arne Hofmeister. What was I expecting a racing driver to do but to fight back? Uh, but she will be uh, hoping to potentially get uh, another shot at uh, Igor, uh, Yegor Hishin uh, in this race. Because that is four second in Pro-Am. I'm sure that's being imparted to her uh, by the FK Performance crew. Seventh, eighth, ninth and tenth then running in a line. They fly through turn 12. And the 24 car. Uh, Jaeger Hishin has very quickly been pursued and caught up by Rackel and Hofmeister. Those two are going to be fighting for the Cayman Trophy honours right to the flag, I suspect, uh, because uh, they are looking very, very equidistant. And both of the white Caymans have disappeared around the outside of Jaeger Hishin then. And now Rihanna O'Meara Hunt has another opportunity to maybe go for that Pro-Am lead. She gets a good run out of the final corner. The big BM then in the slipstream of the Cayman that looks diminutive in comparison. Can Rihanna O'Meara Hunt find a way to the first corner on the inside line? No, not quite close enough, but that's a little look anyway. Uh, thought she might go for it there after all. Uh, she is looking to try and get that second place in Pro-Am. Looks the inside. Of course, second place in Pro-Am would match uh, her results yesterday in the 30-minute sprint race. So she'd absolutely love to go home with two second place trophies, although I'm not sure there is a trip home between now and the Dubai 24 hours next week. She goes to the inside line but can't get it done there as the two Cayman trophy cars disappear up the road from our Pro-Am second place battle. Meanwhile, Joel Mesh has closed in on Jamie Day once again. The gap has gone down uh, by a second in the last lap. So Jamie Day and Joel Mesh at the front of the order. 
uh, they are suddenly much closer together and Leo Pischler has gotten through into fourth place. So Leo Pischler in the Pro-Am Cayman has gotten past Roberto Farrier. Uh, Farrier still finding his feet in GT cars. Leo Pischler has found his feet and is now tap dancing away uh, in the battle for fourth place and he might go Zach Meekin hunting yet. The top two have crossed the line. The gap is back out to 1.1 seconds. So whatever happened to Jamie Day, it was only a momentary issue. But he was a second slower uh, on just over a lap ago, which is certainly uncharacteristic for the experienced Jamie Day. Leo Pischler is on his final warning for track limits as well. That might be something to consider. And Roberto Faria is slowing. Roberto Faria seems to have a mechanical issue then. I was wondering why he was pulling out on the main straight in the manner that he was. I was rather hoping for his sake that the car was okay, but it seems as though Roberto Farrier has a problem. That's going to hand fifth overall uh, to Neil Montserrat then. And Roberto Farrier sadly going no further. Will he even emerge uh, on the other side of the hill? Yes, he will, but uh, at a very slow pace. And next up comes Nil. There he is going past in the black and red Mercedes AMG GT4. That's for fifth overall. The AM class leader, Nil Montserrat, continues on his way, but clearly it's day done for Farrier. There's your Cayman Trophy lead battle then. Still Thomas Ruckel uh, holding off Arne Hofmeister. Quite the disparity in terms of uh, experience from these two, as uh, they both lap Max Huber, who is some 12 laps down. 111 and 66 heading through turn eight now and Hofmeister uh, a very experienced Porsche pilot uh, Thomas Rackel a very experienced kart racer but seemingly taking to this whole uh, car lark quite well uh, the same is going for uh, Yegor Hishin as well as they all get past the limping Roberto Farrier uh, Hishin is doing a good job here of uh, holding off Rihanna O'Meara Hunt, who is certainly trying every which way she can uh, to get past Hishin in the battle for uh, second and third in Pro-Am. There is the uh, Cayman Trophy battle, also the fight for seventh overall then. Hofmeister still investigating his options, investigating his possibilities. Uh, but for now, it's Thomas Ruckel just about keeping things at bay. And we've had a swap for second in Pro-Am because Rihanna O'Meara Hunt has gotten past uh, Jaeger Hishin. So uh, Hishin uh, down a position then, third in Pro-Am for Hishin now 11th overall while Rihanna O'Meara Hunt moves into the overall top 10 there uh, in the back of shot albeit with Hishin uh, looking on the offensive uh, as they head towards turn one he breaks very late for the first corner side by side between the two of them Hishin doing everything he can to try and get back to the uh, Pro-Am class second place but not quite able to do anything about it uh, O'Meara Hunt then will now be looking to uh, gather herself and maybe try and make up some more overall positions uh, so long as she has staved off uh, Hishin for the time being. There is Roberto Farrier into the pit lane. Uh, that car finally into the pits and a shame to see Farrier's race end in this manner. Thomas Rackel and uh, Arne Hofmeister still going at it for seventh and eighth place. Meanwhile, uh, the penalties are coming in. The elite motorsport car, Zach Meekin at the wheel of the elite McLaren. Pit stop infringement, stop go penalty of 20 seconds for that car. Remember, it was outside the pit window that that car pitted, uh, as I said at the time. Uh, too late into the pit lane, and that is going to be a hugely costly thing. A stop-and-go penalty of 20 seconds in the pit. And then also the number 11 car of Mesh is into the pit lane as we speak for a drive-through penalty. So your former... Uh, second place runner Joel Mesh is in the pit lane serving a drive through. Two of the leading cars serving a drive through penalty as we speak. The Cayman Trophy class still providing the fireworks, though, as Thomas Ruckel and Arne Hofmeister are going at it for seventh overall. Mesh rejoins the race behind Richard Wolfe and Neil Montserrat in fifth position. Here come the Cayman Trophy cars across the line for seventh and eighth place. I'll tell you who's smiling right now. His name is uh, Franz Linton. 
Linton is going to be smiling from ear to ear. Franz Linden will be smiling from ear to ear watching Arne Hofmeister here. A great uh, scrap this is. And wouldn't it be amazing uh, for Linden to, uh, Linden to take a, uh, a win in the Cayman Trophy class in his first weekend? Certainly Arne Hofmeister is trying to make that come true at the moment. But at the sharp end of the order, it has been all changed because we've had those drive-through penalties and that stop-and-go penalty served. So Zach Meekin has rejoined the race in 11th position. Uh, Joel Mesh has apparently rejoined in third place, which I'm quite surprised about. I thought he'd be a little further down the pack than that uh, for his drive-through for a pit stop infringement. I don't actually know what the infringement was. I assume a slightly short stop is the, uh, is the answer to that. Uh, just verifying that as we speak. Uh, unfortunately, it's too late for me to verify that, but... Uh, I suspect that was the case. Um, but uh, two penalties then to two leading cars, and that has changed the order. Jamie Day is your race leader. Second place is Leo Pischler. Third place should be Joel Mesh uh, ahead of Neil Montserrat. And indeed, there is Joel Mesh just ahead of Montserrat on the circuit. I wonder if that puts a bit of fire under Neil as we have side-by-side -side for the Cayman Trophy lead. Arne Hofmeister has found a way alongside Thomas Rackel. And uh, the number 66 Cayman is through into sixth overall. And more importantly, the Cayman Trophy lead. I'm sure the battle is going to continue on regardless. Uh, but Arne Hofmeister has finally broken the dam gotten through uh, and sure enough confirmation that the uh, pit stop infringement uh, was the pit lane time for the number 11 car of uh, Joel Mesh so uh, that has been confirmed unfortunately Schnitzelalm sending the car out an iota too early and a drive through uh, is the result we continue to watch this battle for sixth place then between Hofmeister and Rakel. Also a good battle still going on a few seconds further back between Omira Hunt and uh, Jaeger Hishin as well. So all of the subclasses with good scraps going on. Neil Montserrat is by no means out of the woods in the AM class lead either because uh, only 3.2 seconds further back is Richard Wolf. So wherever you look, you've got exciting battles. There is Yegor Kishin uh, still looking for his way past Rihanna O'Meara Hunt. Uh, but Hunt seems to be controlling it to an extent right now. Yegor Kishin, though, an, an ambitious young racer in his uh, first couple of outings this month in a racing car, at least in racing conditions. And uh, I suspect uh, that uh, if he gets half an opportunity to try and go for that second place in Pro-Am again, uh, he is going to take it. We'll keep an eye on those two. Um, certainly, Jaeger Kishin uh, receiving tuition from Ivan Ekelschik, and I'm sure that with each passing weekend, we're going to see Jaeger Kishin improve that little bit more. And uh, that's going to be the exciting thing across the six weekends in GT4 Wind Series, which is proving to be a development ground for so many young GT racing talents. Where will they be at the start of the year versus the end of the year? We're certainly going to see some forward progression. We're certainly seeing forward progression from the driver of the 66 car, Arne Hofmeister, building an advantage as Jaeger Kishin goes for it. Jaeger Kishin does go for the inside line, does go for P2 in Pro-Am and goes for uh, go, go successfully through and pass Riano Amira Hunt. I, I'll be honest, I didn't think it was quite going to happen into turn one, uh, but apparently the pace was there, the braking was there, and Yale Hishin gets through then into eighth overall once again as he continues to scrap hard uh, with Amira Hunt. Eighth place then uh, for the youngster once again. And uh, I know his dad is here supporting him. I've had a few conversations with his dad through the power of sign language, Google Translate, and, uh, uh, well, at least one of us just about being able to speak uh, the opposing language. I'm not very good at Russian. And uh, it's been really nice to speak to, uh, to Hishin's father, actually. Uh, jolly nice chap. And, uh, well, they'll be watching as that McLaren gets closer, won't they? Because... Uh, 
8th, 9th, 10th, now all in the same shot. Zach Meekin, who, lest we forget, had a stop-go penalty for 20 seconds because of uh, pit lane infringements. So, uh, well, pit stop infringements, that being a pit stop held outside of the pit window. Uh, so this is going to be Zach Meekin uh, trying to make short work of the second-place Pro-Am battle, but I don't necessarily know that he's going to uh, because Heechin and Omira Hunt will be rather on their own island thinking about their own battle and won't much care for the uh, yellow McLaren behind them. There won't be any blue flags because this is for position, 8th, ninth, and 10th overall. Uh, so let's see what Meekin can do. He's got a good run out to the final corner. Down the main straight they go, flashing the headlights furiously uh, as he does so. In 11th place in the back of shots is, uh, well, not in the back of shot, but Vili Kuna is in 11th place just behind them. He's a long way back uh, from this scrap that is now unfolding between uh, Heechin, Omira Hunt, and Zach Meekin. They come out towards turn five then, and it is still all stations as they were. But Meek into the inside of the BM, and uh, that should be fairly easy done. Yes, uh, Amira Hunt had no response there for Zach Meekin. He now has to try and find his way past Jaegel Hishin. And uh, Jaegel will have to be careful here. This is going to be a difficult uh, situation for him because, of course, if Meekin gets through at an inopportune place, Rihanna O'Meara Hunt could well follow. So uh, it's going to be hard to manage for young Heejin on this occasion. Let's see. Uh, exactly what goes down as they approach turns 10 and 11. Heechin goes defensive. Meekin, though, uh, dives to the inside line. And actually, that was pretty well managed uh, by the 24 driver, the Vimmerwerk youngster, because uh, he managed to not lose too much time at all uh, as Zach Meekin went by. And that means that he has now the optimal chance of keeping Rihanna O'Meara Hunt at bay. But uh, the big question mark is now... Will O'Meara Hunt have an opportunity into the first corner because she is right there with him? Uh, and obviously it was Jaegel Heechin going past Rihanna O'Meara Hunt at turn one, what, two laps ago? Are we going to see role reversal this time as the big BMW scythes out of the last corner just behind the Cayman? Not quite as good through that final corner, I don't think, the, uh, the M4 GT4 compared to the Cayman. And uh, I think that may well save uh, Jaegel Heechin's bacon, uh, bacon on this occasion. So then four minutes and eight seconds left of this race. We've had a brilliant battle here among the second place battle in Pro-Am. Of course, Pro-Am leader Leo Pichler is second overall and well clear uh, of everybody else in that class. Jamie Day well clear of everybody, 11 seconds uh, to the good for Facetti Motorsport. Facetti not getting that much coverage on camera today, but that's because all the battles are going on somewhere else. Uh, principally that second place Pro-Am battle. But uh, to be honest, if the silverware says P1, I somehow doubt that anyone at Facetti uh, will mind too much. They've got uh, an ever-growing tally of successes uh, to their name, of course, for Mikey Porter. In three and a half minutes, he may well be a GT4 Win Series race winner for the first time because Jamie Day's two wins for Facetti Motorsport have both been in solo races so far. And Mikey Porter would love to see that car cross the line in P1, as it's certainly looking likely to do at this stage. Zach Meekin is uh, striding off into the distance then uh, ahead of this Pro-Am second place battle. I don't think he's going to close in on the Cayman Trophy cars before the chequered flag. P8 then might be the limit of what he can do uh, in the Elite Motorsport McLaren. See how much uh, runoff area they take there through that uh, run from turn 14 to turn 15. Try and uh, minimize the radius of corner of the corner as much as they can by being on the far extremities of the outside. There's Jamie Day on board with him. He will most likely, it's going to be touch and go actually, whether he starts the final lap this time by or not. I think it may well be the last lap. Uh, this time by as he crosses the line, but uh, it is going to be close. Uh, this, though, the Pro-Am second place battle continues to exhilarate then in the GT4 Winter Series. And Rihanna O'Meara Hunt 
looking to match that solo performance from Saturday afternoon here on Sunday afternoon, along with the help, of course, of uh, her Dutch teammate Gianni. Gianni van der Kratz, the BMW M2 Racing Cup Benelux champion of last year. And she is looking quite good on the run towards seven and eight. That was good momentum out of T5, but I don't think quite close enough. Uh, just waiting for an opportunity up against Jaeger Heeshin. Had a little look to the inside uh, at turn eight and gets bare to run out of the corner. However, the young Heeshin will continue on unabated. Here they go through nine and 10 then. And there goes O'Meara Hunt, inside line. Can't quite get it done, though. Pulls out of the move fairly wisely there. Otherwise, I think there would have been contact. So Jaeger Hijin continues to lead the way in the second place Pro-Am battle here. 24 from 187. Is that still going to be the case in just over elapsed time, I, I don't know. <laughs> it has been a, a hard fought, hard contested scrap to this stage. But Jamie Day, ascending once again up the hill towards turn eight and then dropping it down uh, through turn nine on his final lap, I believe. Uh, and the final lap beginning then for our second place Pro-Am battle. Does O'Meara Hunt have the opportunity that she needs to maybe claim it in the final lap? I'm not so sure uh, the opportunity is going to be forthcoming, but maybe she pulls a uh, rabbit out of the hat towards the very end of the race. Meanwhile, for Jamie Day, uh, the less, yes, electrical backed machine, the Facetti Motorsport crew willing the car on as Diego Hishin continues to defend against Rihanna O'Meara Hunt. Jamie Day Day, though has had to do no defending in his stint to the race some competitors fell by the wayside because of pit stop infringement but Jamie has been scintillating on Winter Series Sunday he takes the win in the GT4 Winter Series along with Mikey Porter their first endurance race win down at Facetti Motorsport Leo Pichler crosses the line for second overall and the Pro-Am honours sets his personal best lap of the race on his final run round the circuit as well third place for Joel Mesh once he crosses the line. But that'll be another 15 seconds or so. So in the meantime, we rejoin the second place Pro-Am scrap. Joel Mesh has crossed the line third overall. Neil Montserrat will cross the line next in fourth place to win in the AM class, despite Richard Wolf trying to hold on to the back of him. Who emerges from turn 12 in the Pro-Am second place? It is just about Jaeger Hishin. However, Rihanna O'Meara Hunt around the outside at turn 13. That's going to be the inside for turn 14. No, not quite. Heeshin does a good job there of uh, holding the position. Can O'Meara Hunt find any way to retaliate before the line? I don't think so. I think Jaeger Heeshin has done enough on this occasion to take second in Pro-Am unless the BMW gets a mighty run out of the final corner. It does get a mighty run outside of the final corner. It's a drag race across the line. Who's got it? I think it's the BMW. But let's see what the timing screen says. The timing screen decides it in favor of Jaeger Heeshin by 0.002 of a second, two thousandths of a second in favor of Jaeger Heeshin. Oh my goodness. What a run to the line from Rihanna O'Meara Hunt. I thought she might have had a nose ahead, but uh, unless this is down to transponder positioning with, with, with and with such a fine margin, it could be uh, the transponder position that has provisionally decided that. The drag race apparently falling in favor of Jaeger Hishin. What a finish in Pro-Am second place. Um, right, let's run through the order then. Jamie Day for Facetti Motorsport taking the, uh, the overall win uh, in that race. That was uh, hugely impressive from him. And uh, just to cover some of the other drivers that crossed the line while we were watching that battle. Uh, sixth overall, uh, Arne Hofmeister taking the Cayman Trophy win uh, for himself and, of course, for Franz Linden uh, on his first weekend racing. So huge congratulations to Franz Linden uh, on his first weekend outside of track day competition. Uh, that sixth overall and that Cayman Trophy win, uh, a real uh, indication that uh, 
he's ready to move on from track days. We're now going to take a look then at the results in full. Jamie Day uh, on uh, the top step of the overall podium and the uh, pro class podium. 10.3 uh, seconds up on Leo Pischler at the end of the race. Joel Mesh having to serve a drive-through penalty, only able to take third overall. Fourth overall and winner in AM once again, Neil Montserrat along with Alberto Di Martin. Uh, Richard Wolf, fifth place and second in AM. Hofmeister, the first Portra Cayman Trophy car home in sixth place. Thomas Ruckel uh, alongside in seventh place. Then Zach Meakin in the McLaren uh, Artura, finishing eighth overall after that stop-go penalty. Great grandstand finish between Diego Hichin and Rihanna O'Meara Hunt, ninth and tenth place respectively overall, second and third in Pro-Am. Billy Kuna taking 11th place, Martin Kroll in 12th for Bonk by her for Motorsport. Of course, Roberto Farrier not taking the flag after problems with that car. Max Huber also struggling, but eventually crossing the line in 14th. Charles Dawson was the cause of our safety car and Luis Liberal did not take the start in the Speedy Motorsport number 5 BM. Well, well, well. <laughs> Celebrations. Uh, Matt George getting an embrace there from Jamie Day. Uh, Mikey Porter and Jamie Day with a race win together for the first time. Facetti Motorsport make it three wins in six races. A 50% hit rate is certainly not bad in a series as competitive as GT4 Winter Series. I'm excited to see uh, the progression of the team as they uh, grow into their first year as a, as a racing outfit. I understand their Snetterton base is being built at the moment, so we'll see how they go once they uh, actually have a full, uh, fully built headquarters to contend with. Jamie looks like he has uh, worked hard in that car. Make no mistake, even when uh, you aren't really having to fight too hard for position, uh, it is a uh, pretty rough go of it in the cockpit. And uh, certainly the temperature is obviously quite nice, being January uh, in the mid-teens. Uh, but uh, in a race car, it very quickly becomes something of an oven, no matter really what temperature you're dealing with. But with the sunshine beating down on the windscreen, it does get quite hot quite quickly. And, of course, the small matter of a 4-litre turbo V8 uh, just ahead of, uh, of Jamie Day's toes as well doesn't help either. A great performance from Jamie. Good result again for Leo Pischler, along with father uh, Andreas Hoefler as well for second and the win in Pro-Am. Uh, Joel Mesh in third place. And again, another strong result for Neil Montserrat as well, uh, winning the AM class along with his friend Alberto Di Martin, who he's been so keen on uh, getting to the top step, both coaching him and competing alongside him when it comes to these endurance races. And I'm sure Arne Hofmeister is going to be so proud uh, of uh, Franz Linden after this race. Uh, sixth overall, first in Cayman Trophy. And uh, certainly Linden played a good role in that as well as Arne Hofmeister. I understand, though, that Lukas Gajewski uh, is ready for some interviews. So let's go down to him now. race number three for the GT4 Winter Series. Congratulations to Jamie and of course to Mikey as well. Welcome to the winner's circle in GT4 Winter Series, Mikey. Yeah, it's all right. Um, first win in GT4. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, thanks to Jamie and all the team for uh, doing an amazing job. Jamie bringing it home and of course the professor for giving us a sublime car. Uh, it's just, yeah, he's, he's just the best. And Jamie, I think it was quite a joy for you to take it home, wasn't it, after Mikey's first stint? Yeah, it was good. Obviously, Mikey brought it home in a good position. Then after that, we just uh, stayed calm and then just made our way through the field until the end. And then we'll meet you in uh, Jerez in a couple of weeks' time with potentially some more podiums or wins. Mikey Porter, Jamie Day, thank you very much. Congratulations. Enjoy the podium, guys. Thank you. So there we go. Great to hear from our race winners. Uh, a great day for day, I had to say at least once. I haven't done it before. Uh, along with Mikey Porter uh, in the Forsetti Motorsport Aston Martin Vantage GT4. 
They will be celebrating long into the evening today, I am certain. Uh, of course, uh, the champagne will be sprayed at the end of this race, but uh, uh, Mikey Porter, I don't think, quite able to uh, sip it yet. Uh, at a tender age of 17 for Mikey, very, very young driver. Uh, a brilliant race, though, in this young championship, the GT4 Wind Series delivering again in the endurance. Let's take a little look back. So then it was Mikey Porter with the early lead from pole position. Matthew Martins making a statement move around the outside, trying to get around uh, Marcel Marshevik's early doors and would keep trying that outside line uh, in the first lap of the race. Great scrapping as Matthew Martins uh, tried everything he could to deliver the car to uh, Farrier in a good position. Uh, Mikey Porter, though, will ultimately lose out to Marcel Marshevik's uh, in the Schnitzelau Mercedes after quite a few laps of battling between the pair of them. And Porter, despite having the inside line there into turn five, would soon lose out a few corners later to both of these parties, uh, the number 11 and the number nine cars. And it was then Matthew Martin jinking through into the lead while they avoided the uh, Max Huber NM Racing Team Mercedes. We had some great scraps here. The Cayman Trophy lead battle converging with the AM lead battle while Roberto Faria unfortunately coasted home at the end. And Arne Hofmeister, after closing in on Thomas Rackel, managed to take the lead for he and Franz Linden in Cayman Trophy. Egor uh, Kishin having a good run uh, with Rihanna O'Meara Hunt for the Pro-Am second place, I should say, because, of course, Leo Pichler uh, was the Pro-Am leader. And then it was a drag race to the line. And, uh, well, the result going down to two thousandths of a second uh, in favour of Egor Kishin at the end of that uh, second place battle in Pro-Am, which captivated us for a lot of the second phase of that motor race. Jamie Day then, uh, our overall winner, as we have seen. Again, class winners, Nil Montserrat in Am, Leo Pischler in Pro-Am, and the Cayman Trophy uh, falling to Arne Hoffermeister and Franz Linden. And we might well hear from uh, Arne and Hans before the, uh, of Arne and uh, Arne before the end. Oh, oh, <laughs> we'll try that again. Franz and Arne before the end of this broadcast because those two had a uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant time of it in in, our, in Franz Linden's first racing weekend. You can see construction there on the hillside here at the uh, Autodromo Internacional do Algarve. The team working hard here at the circuit to uh, improve the facilities ever more. Uh, the circuit just passing its 15th birthday as an operative racing circuit. They only finished construction 16, or well, they only opened construction 16 years ago. Next month, it was finished by October, started building it in February. Very impressive turnaround back in 2008. And it has held many an impressive motor race since then. We've had a couple of corkers so far uh, in the Winter Series weekend. And of course, uh, we're not finished yet. We have another endurance race to come. But the GT4s uh, were great value for money, as always, here uh, in the Winter Series broadcast. So your top five comprised of three classes, your top six comprised of four classes. And there really isn't a much between some of these drivers, uh, despite their driver categorizations. That speaks to how strong some of our AM drivers in are, are in both the Pro-AM and the AM classes. Um, and also, of course, the Cayman Trophy guys, those are not GT4 cars. They're lower revving, smaller engines, different suspension, and so on. And yet, uh, the likes of Hoffmeister and Rackle, very quick indeed. Chris McCarthy is standing by down on the podium. Let's see our drivers celebrate. Thank you very much, Adam. Yes, we're going to get ready to go with the podium celebrations, the first of our two endurance races this afternoon. Hope you all enjoyed it up in the grandstand. Uh, we have a, another race coming up straight after this GT Winter Series, but a, a great GT4 Winter Series to end their racing for this weekend. They'll be back with us the next round at Hereth. Uh, and thank you to all the teams who've worked very, very hard down below us. Now we get to celebrate 
properly uh, as you can see as well the drivers uh, are going to celebrate with some champagne uh, up on the podium so four classes to get through uh, in total let's get all the drivers uh, out here these drivers did lead throughout the race but uh, hearing from Tom radio issues meant they did have to come through pit lane for a second pit stop a drive through meaning they did drop to third place but nevertheless a good performance from them let's get them out on the podium finishing in third place elite motorsport Tom Leban and Zach Meakin. Well done, guys. You can hear me now, Tom. Yeah, you can hear me now. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, let's get uh, second place uh, out uh, on the podium. They've done a great job uh, all weekend. Uh, let's uh, get them out onto the podium. Schnitzel Helm Racing finishing in second place. Number 11, Joel Mesh and Marcel Marshevic. Regular visitors up here. Well done, guys. Superb performance once more. But clearing off up the road by 10 seconds to take yet another win. Uh, they are starting to take control slightly in this championship, aren't they? Finishing on the top step of the podium, the number 19 Forsetti Motorsport car of Mikey Porter and Jamie Day. Let's get the trophies handed out to the drivers. Gidlick Racing will come out to present those. And then we will grab a word uh, with our top three drivers. Let's go and speak. Uh, to, let's get the pictures first. I won't, I, won't, I won't jump in front of that. Let's all get on the top step. Cram in, guys. And we will look to the camera, get a picture, and then we will grab a word with uh, our top three drivers. So our top three teams, shall I say. Uh, first of all, we'll come to yourself, uh, Jamie. Uh, another win, uh, cleared off up the road there in the end. 10 seconds, I think it was by the end. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. Just got a nice, easy start after Mikey handed the car to me in P3. And then just after that, we just chipped away and then just extended the gap at the end. Uh, and Mikey, a great drive by, by yourself as well. Put it in a good position for Jamie. Yeah, um, just doing my best for saving the car, uh, for him to put in a good stint. And yeah, he done an amazing job bringing it in P1. You guys are doing a fantastic job, new team for, for this year as well and already getting some wins on the board. Uh, a great job behind you, a great team behind you as well. Yeah, I can't thank the team enough, all of them, uh, especially my dad. We got him last time, uh, had to give a special mention to him. Uh, yeah, but the whole team done excellent job all weekend. Good stuff, well done guys. I'm, I must ask you about the celebration you guys do when you come out as well. well what's behind that? Uh, you just got to ask Matt George. Matt George, yeah. Well, I remember him from karting days. He, he's moved on a, a lot more since then. Uh, we'll, we'll ask him next time. We'll do an interview about him. Uh, okay, let's come to uh, second place. Schnitz, uh, Schnitzelhelm next. Uh, Joel Mesh. Uh, great, great job. Uh, second place. Uh, it was okay. It was okay. We've just been a bit too early out the pits and uh, got that drive-through penalty. But I think in the end we could have been uh, quite competitive and. Uh, you're racing against those two. <laughs> uh, Marcel, yourself in enjoying racing in the championship so far? Yeah, definitely. It's a very good championship, uh, a lot of fair fights. So, uh, yeah, I'm very happy about the championship, really happy about Joel. He was really fast this weekend, so I'm looking forward to the next races. Good stuff. Well done, guys. Their team doing a fantastic job. Give another round of applause. Sch uh, Schnitzel Arm Racing, second place. Give him another round of applause, guys. Schnitzel Arm Racing, second place. Worked the second time. Uh, Tom, come to yourself. Uh, of course, uh, uh, an unintended trip through uh, pit lane. Well, came in a, a little bit later and then had to come through pit lane uh, again. Tell us a, li a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, my radio packed up, so I sort of, I had no idea. I couldn't talk to the team. I saw everyone else box, so I sort of thought I had to, but it was too late. Um, yeah, whatever, we still got on the podium. Just didn't want to hand the car over, basically. Well, yeah, well, it was going quite well in that race, so I didn't want to swap. <laughs> And Zach, for yourself, when you got in, in the end, still managed to get a podium for yourself as well. I'm happy about it. I think we deserve one this weekend and we finally got a shame of what happened with the radio. But I reckon now we can compete at the top three, which is good. good stuff. Well done, guys. I'm sure we're going to see you go uh, at least one. We can see you fight for the top step. You've proven that. Uh, well done, guys. Well done to our top three in GT4 uh, win series. Give them another round of applause, guys. Fantastic driving up in the grandstand as well. I'm sure you enjoyed that one. Guys, you know what time it is now. Go for it, send it, as we say in racing. Jamie Day's ran off.
Go for it, guys. Go for it. <laughs> Schnitzelham have gone for it. So of elite motorsport. They know how to celebrate properly as well. <laughs> oh, well. Are you waiting for Jamie? <laughs> oh, well, okay. Tom Levin's got absolutely soaked. Oh, my. <laughs> wow. Okay. Thanks very, thanks very much, Tom. <laughs> I'll, see, I'll see you soon, mate. I'll see you soon. Uh, well done, guys. Uh, well, I think for SETI, uh, more for you guys. Uh, they've just ran off with it. So uh, I guess it's going to be more for you guys. Uh, OK, uh, we're going to get a quick picture. Uh, Schnitzer, I'm stealing the podium. That gives you uh, time to uh, reset it. And we're going to move on uh, to Pro-Am. <laughs> this is absolutely soaked after that. It does, it does taste nice. Actually, I was able to have a drink of it last time, and it is very nice champagne, I have to say. Uh, okay, let's go to uh, Pro-Am uh, next. Uh, we're going to get our top three out once more. Uh, finishing in third place in Pro-Am was the... Oh, yeah, all good, all, all good, all good. Uh, finishing third in Pro-Am was the number 187 FK performance car of uh, Gianni van der Kratz and Rihanna O'Meara Hunt. Round of, round of applause for our drivers up in the grandstand, please, as well. Give them some support as they come out. They've done a fantastic job all weekend. We had Rihanna on the podium yesterday as well. Finishing in second place uh, was uh, Ivan Ekelschik and Igor Kitchen. The Wimmerberg drivers are going to make their way out now. Big waves down to the pit lane. Well done, guys. Very close between these two. I think it was just two thousandths of a second, was it? Very close. It was very close out on track, almost side by side, I think. Uh, and finishing in first place in Pro Am was the Razoon More Than Racing team, the number 77, Andreas Hoffler and Leo Pischler. <laughs> Big round of applause for our Pro Am winners, please. Let's get the trophies out for the GT4 Winter Series Pro-Am winners for round two in the endurance race. The top three will all be presented trophies. We will grab a quick word uh, with our winners and then we will move on to the AM category. Let's get a picture first of all. Let's all get up on the top step. Look to Danny, our photographer. We've got Emilio over there filming our social media content as well uh oh well i was gonna i was gonna speak to our winners first well you could just stay, 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 stay okay it's okay the green light hasn't gone yet for that uh okay let's speak to our winners uh leo first of all <laughs> we'll get a head start over there oh just wait guys wait wait okay uh leo an another win uh it, it, it's becoming normal now almost uh, not normal. Uh, the race was really good for us. Uh, my dad did a really good first stint and then I continued and it went out really good for us. And Andreas, uh, you're, you're ready, you are ready to go there. Uh, so yeah, that one must have felt good. Yeah. Yeah, for me it was a hard race, but it was much fun for me. <laughs> this is good. And it's going to be much fun now. I'm, I'm going to get off very, very quickly. Right, go for it guys. Let's spray the champagne in the Pro-Am category. There we go, guys. And now we will go to uh, the AM category next. <laughs> I, I like your style. It, it is quite hot up here, actually, isn't it? I, I imagine even more so on track. Uh, OK, let's go to the AM category uh, next. Uh, we are going to get the top three uh, out. First of all, the number one, two, seven uh, of Michael Bunk and Martin Kroll. The Hoffa Racing drivers, please come out. Let's give them a round of applause as they do. Third place in AM. Are we back there, guys? They might have got too comfortable back there. That's where they do the driver's briefing. Third place in AM, number one, eight, one, two, seven. Are we there? Have they run off? They're coming. Michael Bunk and Martin Kroll. Here we go, let's go, let's give a round of applause as they come out. Third place in AM, podium on the board, well done guys. Finishing in second place, within four seconds of our leader was number 81, Richard Wolf. Give him a round of applause as he comes out. Resume more than racing on the podium again. But our winners were the NM Racing Team, number 15, Alberto De Martin and Neil Montserrat. Round of applause for our AM winners, please. Here they come. Well done, Neil.
Well done, Alberto. We had him up on the podium earlier. Uh, trophies in, guys. Let's get some pictures, some trophies. Uh, I'm going to grab a very quick word with our AM winners, and we're going to press straight on. Let's get a quick picture of you guys up on the podium, please. Small guys, down to Danny there. And I'm going to grab a ve one very quick word. Uh, oh, yeah, you guys just want to go for it, do you? It sounds like you guys want to just go. Neil, can I grab a quick word for you? Uh, how does it feel? Win winning the endurance race, I must feel good. Yeah, it was very, very nice. Uh, very tough also, the last laps with tire degradation. Um, I push it uh, my maximum at the middle of the race to be to make a bit of distance to Michael and uh, then the last laps uh, I was struggling a bit with the tires the car was amazing the setup of the car was amazing and thank you to all uh, NM crew and Alberto for the confidence they put on me very well said very well said I can tell you're used to this well done well done Neil Montserrat we'll see you at the next round okay came a trophy uh, next well done to our top three in AM. Uh, finishing third place in Cayman Trophy was SR Motorsport, uh, Enrico Ferdera and Will Kuna. Let's get them out on the podium, Enrico and Willy Kuna. Enrico Ferdera and Willy Kuna out onto the podium, guys, if you want your trophy. Here they come, here they come. Well done, guys. They always put on a good show, do the Cayman Trophy, just four seconds, 3.6 between our top two. Finishing in second was number 111, Michael Sander and Thomas Rackle. Two SR Motorsport cars on the podium, second and third. But it's Speedworks Automotive who take the win at this time, finishing in first place in Cayman Trophy in the endurance race for round two was number 66, Franz Linden and Arnie Hofmeister. I like the energy down there. Trophies in, guys. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. Okay, uh, and friends, just a quick word from yourself on the top step. I know you've been on quite a journey with the, with the guys here at Geely Racing. How does it feel to now get a win? It is absolutely fantastic. New experience, new world. I'm extremely happy and also exhausted, to be honest. Good stuff. Well done, guys. Well done. Congratulations to our top three in Cayman Trophy. Give them a round of applause, please, guys. Cayman Trophy putting on a great show. Guys, you know what's next. That is yours down there to do whatever you want. Feel free to spray it around now and make a mess up here. Let's give them another round of applause, please, guys. We're going to walk up with it. OK, we're going to walk up with it. You want to drink it? It's for the team. Fair play. Fair play. Uh, OK, we still have one more race coming up uh, today, and that is going to be the endurance race for the GT Winter Series. The last race of the weekend here in Portimao coming up in just under 10 minutes. Race number three for the GT Winter Series live from Portimao. 55 minutes race duration this time with a pit stop in the middle similar to the format you've just seen in the GT4 Winter Series. However, there are some teams and some drivers who will go alone and one of them is our pole setter in the number four HRT Mercedes, the team owned by Hubert Haupt, former uh, DTM racer himself. The team is fielding a couple of Mercs in the DTM and maybe in the future one of the drivers is going to be Finn Wiebelhaus, who is handing his drinks bottle to Manuel Reuter, former DTM driver just himself. Manuel spoke to Finn earlier. Nice to have your word as well on your rookie driver. First weekend in a GT3 car. How do you like it so far? I mean, uh, two times front row, won the second uh, sprint race yesterday, second, a solid place. I think very good start into the weekend, into his GT3 carrier. 
and yeah, we, we try to prepare him as good as possible with the winter series for the GT Master season. And he's going alone now in the endurance race, which is still quite vital, isn't it, with pit timings and pit speed limiters and all the rest of it. Yeah, exactly. That is part of the learning and hopefully he's doing uh, like in the morning in the sprint run. Uh, are you going to appear to uh, any other of the, the uh, GT Winter Series races this year? Yeah, yeah, it's planned that we do two more, definitely. That's good to know. Manuel Reuter, thank you very much. So Finn Wiebelhaus in the uh, number four HRT Mercedes on pole position for this race. Next to him is going to be another Mercedes AMG GT3 car, Kenneth Heyer, who is going to, st to take the start. You can see his dead uh, Hans on the other side there just as well. We can see Jamo Hertling, who took a victory uh, earlier on this weekend. Of course, he is right next to his colleague Kenneth just as well. Uh, not going to disturb Kenneth, but uh, Jamo, one more comment from you before the start of the race. Always exciting, isn't it, to be on the grid and then you have to wait, first of all, for your teammate who's hard at work for the, for, for the first part of it. Um, I don't know what I need to say, but uh, yeah, we wish uh, Kenneth good luck and uh, I'm waiting for him. Jamo, thank you very much and good luck to you and to Canada, of course, just as well. So there is your front row of the grid that's already being cleared with uh, less than three minutes to go. In third place on the grid, it's Adrian Lewandowski in the Super Trofeo spec Lamborghini. He is on his own this weekend with his father being absent. Uh, make sure to watch out for this car because it has a huge amount of power running without restricts, re restrictions in GT f in uh, the GT Winter Series just as well. So that's going to be incredibly exciting to see this car storming down into the first corner. Mateo Slizowski over there, car number 13. That's very nice to see. Uh, he's been missing from the grid earlier on today. Let's try if we can still grab a word with him. But of course, Mateo uh, very, very experienced, so he is relaxed, hopefully. Mateus, you've been missing from the grid earlier on. Very good to have you on the grid now. What happened earlier today? Uh, so the contract is that I'm driving only uh, endurance race, so race number three. So keep finger crossed because uh, there is a tough competition and I try my best to uh, be fast as I can. Thank you very much and good luck. Now that's interesting, isn't it? So we've got two AMG Mercs on the front row and then there is a Polish second row of the grid. One is a one make series Lamborghini. The other car is a one make series Porsche. Engines being fired up. Make sure to enjoy the last one of the season. Very short at break. And then it's going to be Adam Weller in the commentary box with race, th race three for the GT Winter Series live from Portimao. So for the final time this weekend, we are set to go racing. 55 minutes of racing to be exact in the GT Winter Series. Mandatory pit stop in the middle phase of this race from minute 25 to minute 35. Uh, so with 30 minutes of the race left to go, the window will open for exactly 10 minutes. No more, no less. Pit outside the window and as we've already seen today, trouble will rain upon you so then the grid for this one the helped racing team number four mercedes amg gt3 of finn wiebelhaus is our pole sitter once again alongside uh, the number 11 car being started by kenneth higher uh, the sr motorsport mercedes amg of higher looking to uh, maybe move up the order in the early stages try and cover off the youngster in the similar mercedes amg gt3 adrian Lewandowski starts from row two of the grid alongside matthias lizovsky championship winning driver let's see how lizovsky does after having a good performance last time out in the endurance race piotr vera will be starting from row three of the grid in the good speed mercedes amg gt3 
alongside another GT3 car, Pierre Ellett's Ferrari 296. Uh, row four of the grid, lap time performance, Marco Dedlov alongside Villico Motorsports' Pablo Brass. Uh, row five of the grid, BDR competition by Grupo Prom entering Alfredo Hernandez alongside Leandro Martins. Then it's Demir Hot in the lap time performance number 20 car. We heard from Demir earlier on today. He's alongside Tor Haugen from Pelin Racing. Then it's the Sunder Motorworks entry of Morton Stromstead. Uh, he is joined by AF Corsa's Motohiko Isozaki on row seven. Row eight of the grid is Alessio Ruffini in the Auto Sport Racing number 30 car. He's joined by John Dillon on row eight. Row nine, Divir Marco Racing's Uwe Lauer. Expect that car to go through the order, especially once Francesco Lopez takes over. Talil, uh, Talal Shair will be lining up on row nine alongside that one. Villico Motorsports' Pedro Brass is next alongside MS Racing's Werner Panhauser, Pedro Silvero and Hubert Darmetko rounding out our order in this race. So then 22 cars set to take the start of this race per my grid sheet. We've lost a couple over the course of the week, but it's still a hugely strong grid for this GT Winter Series Enduro. All flavours of the GT Racing Ice Cream Shop then, and let's see uh, which one comes out on top. The smart money is certainly on Finn Wiebelhaus in the Haupt Racing Team Mercedes. How exciting to hear that this youngster is due to compete a couple of more times after this weekend in GT Winter Series. He is going to be the measuring stick with it. Everyone else will test themselves. Let's see what happens as we go racing for 55 minutes in the endurance race in the GT Winter Series. Can Kenneth Ayer do anything about the SR Motorsport driver alongside him on the front row of the grid? Well, the time for speculation is over. The time for finding out is now. We go racing in the GT Winter Series and Weibelhaus has launched the car away long before anybody else. So he leads into the first corner. It's three wide between three marks for second place. Kenneth Ayer with the downforce of the GT3 car holds on to second place around the outside ahead of Matt Zizovsky, then it's Adrian Lewandowski, then it's Piotr Vera in the Mercedes AMG GT3. The number two car of Marco Dedlov is in sixth place. Then it's Rinaldi Racing's Pierre Ellett. We ride on board further back with the 911 Rakar Motorsport car. That's the car in eighth place, I believe. Leandro Martins making up a few places in the early stanzas of this race. And of course, he is handing over to pro driver Dieter Svets uh, halfway through this race. Expect that to be a very quick car in Cup 2 across the race distance. You already see Leandro Martin's potential here, holding on to the GT3 cars in the early stages. Side by side, further back to Mir Hot, losing out to the big uh, gold Lamborghini uh, through turn 7 and 8. The 177 car of Alfredo Hernandez then picking up a position early doors. Everyone seems to have got through the first few corners without any particular transgressions then in this 55 minute encounter for the GT Winter Series. And it is, perhaps, perhaps to no one's surprise, uh, the number four car, Finn Wiebelhaus, in the race lead. Uh, however, that was a, a very spirited start and at least looked like it was maybe full acceleration before the green light. We have to see uh, if that's looked at in any form. Nonetheless, the race continues on in its own right for the time being. The two GT3 cars there among all of the cut machinery. That's the exciting thing about GT Win Series, something that... Uh, my colleague Lucas Gajewski has said a couple of times down on the grid, it's so great to see this kind of, uh, uh, not parity between the cars, there's no balance of performance to put these all together. However, they're not too far apart, and if you've got drivers of varied ability in the cars, you end up with very unusual packs of cars all together at once. The kind of thing you only see here in the GT Winter Series. Uh, something we've seen several times so far this weekend is this battle, Pablo Brass being uh, right on the back of Leandro Martins, albeit it's been rarely not for the class lead. It's currently for third and fourth in Cup 2. Piotr Vera, uh, of course, he'll be handing over to Dan Arrow later in the race, and we want to see uh, how the Dutchman goes on uh, later on. The Rinaldi Racing entry 
and starting well in the hands of Pierre Ellett as well to be just there behind Kyokura Vera. Over the crest of the hill they go then for the second time in this race. And the Autodrama International, uh, International Au de Algarve has created some really spectacular racing between these different types of GT car so far this weekend. And we're expecting a lot more of the same, especially post pit window where some drivers, some cars are gonna surge up the order. We're seeing Uwe Lauer make some good progress in his own right. He's just behind these two Porsches making his way uh, up the order. There is Uwe in the green and black uh, Ferrari 488 GT3 car. So Uwe is up to 14th position. Uh, one of our onboard cars, of course, he's got ahead of Motohiko Isozaki as well. Uh, so uh, Isozaki uh, actually uh, in, was in 12th place at the line. So I think Uwe Lauer has gone from uh, uh, 17th on the grid to 12th over the course of two laps. So Uwe has uh, found the uh, the overdrive button on the 488 GT3 and uh, wants to get the car into a good position uh, before getting, par getting the car over to Francesco Lopez a little bit later on. So then, the De Biermacher Racing Ferrari that we ride on board with here, the two uh, cup cars dueling ahead of him, that's uh, Demir Hot and Alfredo Hernandez. It looked as though Demir Hot may be on for a move down into turn five, just ahead of Uwe Lauer. Let's uh, see whether that's the case. No, not quite close enough. Of course, the Lamborghini with a little bit of extra power uh, to use on the straights, and Demir now trying to have a go at him. Of course, he's handing over to another one of these fast hot shoes that appear in the endurance race in the form of Stefan Radzinski uh, from the Porsche Carrera Cup North America. And uh, two drivers uh, in Demir and Stefan that I think will be favourites each time they appear in the wind series within their class because uh, Demir is a very quick driver in his own right as he's been repeating, as he's been proving repeatedly, I should say, uh, in that machine. So then, uh, 50 minutes left on this 55-minute race. The window will open in just over, or just under, 20 minutes' time. And Demir Hot still all over the back here of Alfredo Hernandez. Hernandez second among the Lamborghinis, of course, because Adrian Lewandowski, as always, is strong uh, in the GT3 Poland Lamborghini further up the track. Through the final corner then goes this battle for 10th overall. And Alfredo Hernandez and Demir Hot look like they may be joined soon by Uwe Lauer, who is on a roll uh, in the early stages of this race. So the battle for 10th may well soon uh, be three cars strong. Cup two leader is Matthias Lizowski in fourth place overall. Uh, Cup one leader is Motohiko Isasaki in 13th overall. So... Uh, also, of course, uh, in, in Cup 3, we have Morton Stromstead running 14th overall as well. So uh, class leaders dotted across the overall classification. But let's see what Uwe Lauer can do. Can he close in on this battle for P10? At the front of the order, oh, as uh, Alfredo Hernandez goes quite wide there, could that be an opportunity for Demir, not quite close enough, as this battle for third in the Cup 2 class continues on. Also, of course, for eighth overall, they're just behind the two GT3 cars of Pierre Ellis and, uh, and Piotr Vera. So that's the battle for uh, fifth and uh, for sixth and seventh place, just ahead of them among the third and fourth place cars in the GT3 category. Good to see a good strong contingent of GT3 cars. We did, of course, lose a couple of them, and sadly, we seem to have lost the Pelin Racing car. Uh, we we're expecting Tor Haugen to take the start uh, in the GT3 machine, but sadly. Uh, that car has not taken the start, so we are down to just the five GT3 cars. However, um, still a nice, impressive entry overall. And we're disappointed to lose the BMW M4 GT3, for instance, uh, from the entry list after issues in qualifying. Uh, but uh, we can afford to lose cars currently in the GT Winter Series between races, and that's a rare and vaunted luxury indeed, albeit one that we don't want to have to uh, use. There is uh, the onboard then with Piotr Vera. This car is going to absolutely fly in the hands of Dan Arrow later in the race. 
But now the car is uh, pursuing Marco Dedlov, who of course is handing over to a hot shoe in his own right in the form of Alex Hart, who was running third overall yesterday before the hydraulics, uh, or rather before the uh, crankshaft sensor uh, cried enough uh, in the uh, Porsche 992 GT3 Cup car that we see just in front of our uh, cameraman there, Piotr Levera. So this is the battle for fifth overall. It's also the battle for third and fourth in GT3 when you factor in the Rinaldi Racing Ferrari 296 of Pierre Ellett. He seems to be really enjoying his time uh, in GT Winter Series. I know that uh, Christian Hook has had a lot of good things to say as well. We've been uh, chatting a couple of times so far this weekend. Uh, two great personalities in that Rinaldi Racing garage. Lots of uh, wonderful personalities to be had in the GT Winter Series paddock as a whole. And for now, the Cup 2 car in the hands of Dedlov is just about uh, holding off the GT3s. But as uh, Piotr Lovera and Pierre Ellett continue to find their footing, continue to find some confidence in these superior GT3 cars, uh, one would suspect that maybe that fifth place is going to come under doubt. Certainly, Piotr Lovera looked notably quicker there through the sweeping uh, last corner. Of course, that's where the downforce really helps the GT3s versus the softer, uh, less aero-dependent cup cars. And uh, Pierre Ellett keeping a watching brief as well. He's maybe looking for an opportunity at a, a GT3-class podium here alongside Christian Hook, the bronze bronze lineup in those two cars. Uh, I think Chris, or in that car, I should say, and Christian Hook is, uh, I think, the slightly quicker of the two. So it'll be interesting to see how he matches up to some of the pros that are set to take over later on. And just looking to the inside there, uh, the 115, but uh, no move made on that occasion. So your order at the moment is Finn Wiebelhaus in the lead for the Haupt Racing team by almost 10 seconds as uh, Piotr Vera there goes a little bit wide. Is that an opportunity potentially for Pierre Ellett? Certainly the number two car has disappeared a good few car lengths up the road there as he hesitated his way through turn eight. But I think Piotr Vera continues um, in that sixth position. But uh, Wiebelhaus leading by over 10 seconds from Kenneth Heyer at the front of the order. Then it's Lewandowski, then it's Lizowski, and then it's this battle for fifth overall with Marco Dedlov leading Piotr Levera and Pierre Ellett. Your Cup 1 leader, still Motohiko Isozaki. However, John Dillon is closing in on him further back in the pack. The two 488 Challenge Evos running at close quarters, battles up and down the grid in the GT Winter Series, as always, as the battle for fifth overall comes across the start-finish line once again. And can Piotr Levera find a way through before uh, he hands the car over? Again, there's always that interesting factor of when the gentleman driver, when the am driver of the duo decides to uh, pit the car and pass over uh, to his pro, I suspect that Vera will be quite quick to hand over to Dan Arrow, who should be very rapid indeed at the helm of that Mercedes-AMG GT3 Evo. And it was looking very close there for fifth place. Uh, Piotr Vera pressuring ever more so and side by side for eighth overall. Here comes Pablo Brass. He's up the inside. He's up into third in the Cup 2 class. Nothing that the Rakar Motorsport driver uh, Leandro Martins could do uh, on that occasion. Whoa, and that was a nice handful of opposite lock as well for the Rakar Motorsport driver. But uh, managed to hold it nicely. Still an unfamiliar car, of course, that he's driving. He'll be handing over to Dieter Sveps later. And funny enough, that's a car he's very familiar with, Dieter Sveps, because, of course, Dieter uh, has run with Johannes Kapfinger in that car previously here in the GT Winter Series. Still a great battle for 5th, 6th and 7th. No changes there. There's the 8th and ninth place scrap. Still getting closer as well for 13th, uh, sorry, for 15th and 16th out there, the Cup 1 class lead. Motohiko Isazaki coming under increasing pressure uh, from John Dillon too. So lots of uh, intra-class battles, lots of battles within class as well. 
fifth, sixth and seventh coming across the line with uh, about seven tenths between the three of them. But still just about proving to be fast enough to hold them off is Marco Didlov. I, I kind of think that uh, Vera and Erich would be quicker if they could just get past the cup car, but that's proving to be uh, the fly in the ointment, the, uh, the trouble for both GT3 parties. They come up over the hill now. And Pierre Ellis is looking a little bit feisty. Is he going to make the lunge? He is going to make the lunge. That's incredibly brave. And it doesn't pay off for Pierre on that occasion. But that was uh, certainly a move made with gusto. Very, very uh, uh, fine margins between uh, the two cars there. That could have been contact quite easily. Thankfully, both of those gorgeous... Uh, GT3 machines remain undamaged. Uh, for the first time in his GT racing career, I think Finn Wiebelhaus is not too far away from lap traffic for the first time. Uh, he is uh, running very well indeed at the front of the order, still extending that advantage around 15 seconds between uh, Wiebelhaus and the chasing pack right now, and he'll be closing in on some of those uh, cars further back in the order. Kenneth Heyer is in second place. Adrian Lewandowski still there in P3, but we've had a moment for Pablo Brass. Pablo Brass has lost out there to the Andro Martins and had a spin while he's at it. Now Demir Hot uh, emerges uh, on his bumper. He's managed to get past Alfredo Hernandez off camera as well. So Hernandez uh, has lost out to, to, to Demir Hot. We ride on board once again with Piotr Vera. Oh, look at that, the GT3 car a lot later on the brakes into turn one. Noticeable fat catch up there through turns one, two, and indeed into three. And has a look up the inside, but can't quite get it done there. Very impressive racing, though, between the two parties. Of course, Pierre Ellet falling back a little bit after trying to make that lunge up the inside. I'm sure he'll rejoin them before too long, especially if uh, we start to see some side-by-side -side action in this battle for fifth place. John Dillon has gotten past uh, Motohiko Isozaki in the uh, Cup 1 class. So John Dillon, uh, now your leader of the, uh, the AF Corsa-dominated Cup 1 class for Ferrari 488 Challenge Evo machines. as 5th, 6th and 7th once again head through turns 10 and 11. Again, expect uh, Dan Arrow in particular to really surge forward in the second phase of this race in the number 14, the Matrix Media-backed uh, Mercedes-AMG GT3. Christian Hook. Uh, while he is a little bit quicker usually than Pierre Ellet, he's not a pro driver, so I'm not expecting him to necessarily keep pace with someone like a Dan Arrow, but uh, hey, he could surprise me. He is full of surprises after all. Uh, battle for fifth place coming across the line once again, and this time Piotr Rivera looking particularly strong out of the final corner. We know that Mercedes is better on the brakes. If he just pulls that pin, he might get through, but not close enough in his estimation for that move. And, probably quite right uh, to hang fire for just a little while. Pierre Ellet has firmly rejoined the party as well. And uh, I think, again, that is a sign that these GT3 cars would be quicker if they could just find a way by, but that is far easier said than done. One thing that is good to see is that Eagle Klyer is still out there and racing. Of course, he was the car that caused the red flag earlier in the day, and he's actually having a good scrap further back in the pack uh, with Morton Stromstead. So we didn't lose a car courtesy of that red flag earlier in the day. That's always good to see. I'm just being told now that Pierre Ellett will stay in the car for the duration of this 55-minute uh, enduro. So I guess Christian Hook may have headed home early or something like that. Uh, I don't know the details, but I know that the Rinaldi racing car is apparently now a solo for this race. Christian Hook was due to take it over. That's a shame that Christian uh, won't be there come the chequered flag. But Pierre Ellis uh, getting some running in here. 
and uh, very much enjoying the Ferrari 296 GT3. We are just over seven minutes from the pit window opening with 30 minutes to go. The window flies open. And they've got 10 minutes before it slams shut. Piotr Vera hoping that a door opens for him here as they run down towards the first corner uh, for the 11th time in this 55 minute race. Again, better on the brakes is the Mercedes AMG, but not close enough for a move by the time they get down to turn one. What about turn three, though? He's very close. Doesn't quite get to the inside in time to try and capitalize, though. Of course, the frustration is only going to build as Piotr Vera continues to get a great look at the uh, rear end of a Porsche 992 GT3 Cup car. And that could be a dangerous thing as this... Uh, as this battle continues on. Pierre Ellett is now uh, looking more of the uh, aggressor in this battle as uh, Vera loses a little bit of time through the opening sector of the lap. Wiebelhaus has crossed the line again in that lead. Almost 20 seconds to the good now in the Haupt Racing Team Mercedes AMG GT3, which is an incredible performance. Uh, less than 20 minutes into this race. Through turn 10 and 11 go the battle uh, for 5th, 6th and 7th places. Still no move to be made here. Every time we go through that uh, final corner, it looks like a move might be on. Vera having a little look to the inside there at turn 14, but he couldn't make that work for him. Now watch how the AMG GT3 closes on the run through the apex of the final corner. He does close nicely. I don't think again he's going to be able to make a move. He's very close to the back of the portion though. If he can maybe just jink to the inside, he is very close. He's got better brakes in that GT3 car. Can he finally get it done into the first corner? Yes, he can. Piotr Lavira gets it done at turn one, but firing back now comes Marco Dedlov. Can't quite get it done. Pierre Ellett uh, with the best seat in the house for that, but finally through is Piotr Vera, and now we get to see whether my theory holds any weight. Always scary for me, of course, uh, but the Mercedes AMG GT3 Evo is through. Will it now break clear of the uh, number two car? Maybe not, uh, because uh, already trying to get away back through is Marco Dedlov. The 115 of Pierre Ellett. Uh, just watching on as these two continue to scrap Jotla Vera uh, in fifth place in this race then and uh, doing a great job of holding off the number two car for the time being. Just over four minutes before the pit window opens then in this 55 minute enduro. And uh, for the solo drivers it doesn't really matter when and where they stop but for those uh, anticipating a pro waiting for them in the garage. I suspect that they will pit early doors. And uh, for Pierre Ellett, who is a solo driver against our initial forecasts, uh, he will get to uh, just stay in the car, hop back out there and see what he can do across the race distance. There is our race leader. First we've seen of him for quite a long time. Uh, Finn Wiebelhaus, he's making his way through the lap traffic. Meanwhile, uh, Motohiko Isozaki has found a Lamborghini to play with. Uh, that is the Alessi uh, Rafini driven autosport racing car, which will be handed over to Milos Pavlovich in a short while. John didn't look like he was going to dive bomb our leader momentarily there. That would have been, uh, that would have been a moment. Uh, but uh, he continues on in the Cup 1 lead, John Dillon, just ahead of uh, Isozaki in the sister AF Corsa car. But there is the Haupt Racing Team, Mercedes AMG GT3. Out of the final turn, or the penultimate turn, he goes. Uh, next target in terms of lapping uh, is Morton Stromstead. So already uh, putting a lap on close to half the field. Uh, Morton Stromstead running in 14th place right now. But uh, Weibelhaus, is, uh, Weibelhaus is doing an incredible job of uh, holding on and uh, just building that lead each and every lap. 
Uh, there is the 151 car. We've also seen uh, Isasaki has gotten through on that lap. So Alessio Ruffini got overtaken there by the Japanese uh, Motohiko Isasaki. Uwe Lauer through shot. Hubert Darmetko following him. 12th and 13th place. And then our race leader comes across the hill. Uh, this is... Again, almost a, a demonstration run, a rolling advertisement for the abilities of uh, Finn Wiebelhaus right now. Very, very impressive driving from Wiebelhaus here. You see him going across those curves, shake, rattle and a roll uh, for the Haupt Racing Team car. Uwe Lauer just closing in on some lap traffic there in, in P12. Everybody over the crest of that hill then. There's Isosaki past Alessi Ruffini, as we alluded to. Blue flags are waving as the race leader goes through. In just one minute and 20 seconds, the pit window will open. We'll start to see uh, some lapping then as... Uh, we'll start to see some pit stopping as a result of that then. And of course, for Wiebelhaus as a solo driver, it doesn't particularly matter uh, when he does it. Just pursuing Uwe Lauer over the crest of the hill on the start finish straight now. And Lauer exits stage right to allow him through. Hubert Tarmetko flashing the headlights as if to say, can I also get a free pass? And I'm sure the answer will be no. Uh, he is fighting Hubert Dimeco for position, and he knows that uh, Uwe Lauer in the cockpit of this Ferrari 488. Uh, GTE 3, I should say. There was a GTE variant that looks broadly similar, but uh, it's not that car. Uh, Darmetko, though, getting past Lauer, and Lauer looked uh, like he was allowing him through. So maybe he did think that uh, Darmetko was a lap ahead of him. That's a big shame, actually, because Uwe's been doing well so far in this race, and that position... Uh, for Hubert Darmetko isn't... Uh, isn't his it's uh, it's uh, not a lap ahead at all in fact that's Igor Klyer my apologies Igor Klyer in the number seven car of course Hubert Darmetko races solo in that car uh, throughout the weekend until the endurance race and it caught me out in Estoril it's caught me out again in this race uh, messages board has a few nuggets of information the number seven car with a five second penalty uh, added to the end of his race uh, so the seven car uh, being PTT Racing Seagull Klyer. So Klyer uh, in trouble, potentially. Uh, a five-second penalty also added to John Dillon for track limits. So two track limits penalties, five seconds apiece. The 151 and the number seven. Cars coming into the pit lane. Piotr Rovira is in. Marco Didlock is in. Uh, as is Leandro Martin, who hands over to Dieter Spets at the first opportunity. We are now seeing uh, cars coming into pit lane as the window has opened. Finn Wiebelhaus is in. Your race leader comes into pit lane. Meanwhile, uh, the battle for what is now going to be uh, second in Cup 2 as the pit cycle goes on. Uh, this is the 951 versus the 20. This is Pablo Brass versus Demir Hot. And of course, Demir has the secret weapon of Stefan Radzinski waiting in, waiting in the wings. And let's see when uh, that secret weapon is deployed. Also into the pits has come Kenneth Heyer. He's uh, handing the car over to young Jamo Hartling then. Uh, Hartling, uh, who of course... Uh, along with Kenneth Heyer, won the endurance race uh, last time out in Estoril. It's going to take a mighty effort for anyone to best Finn Wiebelhaus here today. Uh, Pietro Vera is back out on the circuit then. That was the uh, uh, good speed racing car back out there, although it will now be Dan Arrow at the wheel. So that car is going to be uh, a hunk quicker, I would suggest, uh, now that uh, the pro Dutch racer has taken over. There is Adrian Lewandowski as well. Lewandowski is yet to pit from third overall. The bare carbon of the Autosport Racing by Benaldi car. Look at that uh, tyre deg as well on the uh, on the left rear. You can see the uh, textures on that uh, on that tyre, picking up a lot of marbles. 
Francesco Lopez has now taken over to Biermarker Racing's Ferrari 488 GT3 as well. Out onto the circuit goes Jamo Hartling behind the Lamborghini. So the second place car back out onto the circuit. You see the, uh, the brakes uh, smoking away on the number 20 lap time performance car, which will now be the possession of Stefan Radzinski for the race. He uh, was quietly added to the entry list during the week, I think. He wasn't initially there, but uh, Radzinski uh, will take the car over. Of course, Lukas Gajewski spoke to both of them in the 20 lap time performance garage a little earlier on. Some great insight uh, from the paddock all day long here on the Winter Series broadcast. And uh, it has been very interesting to hear everyone's various different reasons for being here, whether they're fighting for the full championship, whether they're here preparing for something else. Uh, everyone is taking these races seriously. Everyone wants to get good results, get podiums, shake hands with Chris McCarthy as well, I suppose, um, up on the podium. Uh, there is uh, Jamo Hartling then still behind uh, ref uh, the number uh, 30, Lamborghini, never mind, the red flags have been adhered to, but that Lamborghini is going to get a lot quicker now with Milos Pavlovich at the wheel. Uh, Rafini is effectively a novice racer uh, who took the start in that car, but uh, Pavlovich is a, uh, a very well-seasoned pro, particularly in Huracan Super Trofeo machinery. So while the car is a lap down on second place right now, I suspect that Pavlovich is going to pick off a few places before the end of this race. However, a five-second penalty has just been added to that car's time for track limits, so it's not all rosy um, down at the Autosport Racing uh, pit wall. Your race leader at this stage of the race is Adrian Lewandowski of GT3 Poland. Uh, the Lamborghini Huracan Super Trofeo car, the number six. However, that car has, of course, not served its pit stop just yet. And it's got another five minutes and 15 seconds to do so. Rinaldi Racing have brought Pierre Ellett in. Vileco Motorsport have brought in Pablo Brass. Igor Klaia will hand over to... Uh, Hubert Dometko in the PTT Racing Porsche and Matthias Lizowski uh, has already pitted in his uh, 992 GT3 Cup Cup. Drivers heading out onto the circuit, then the 128 MS Racing car uh, going back out there now with Benedict Seidt at the wheel. That car though is a lap down on the 951 Porsche that follows it, so I expect blue flags will be waving away uh, for Benedict. And sure enough, he does rather easily uh, allow Pablo Brass through. The 951 car is solo car, so Pablo Brass will stay out there. Brass who uh, He's a pretty successful GT racer here in Iberia, as I've alluded to already this weekend, a champion uh, in the CR GT Championship, the Spanish uh, GT Championship, as it's uh, colloquially known. Just putting a lap on his uh, Vileco teammate there uh, in the 953 Pedro Silvero. So then everybody finding their way back into their battles out on the circuit. Now there you see uh, Stefan Radzinski just ahead uh, of the number two car. So the 20 and the two, the two lap time performance cars are having a great scrap just at the back of this little queue of cars. And that of course is an all pro battle because Stefan Radzinski and Alex Hart are in those cars. There they are side by side, the two lap time performance cars Everybody loving this, with the potential exception of uh, Moritz Kranz, uh, as these two uh, also closing in on Pierre Ellett as well. I think those two are on the same lap as well. We'll have to see whether that is the case as the field shakes itself back out of the pit window. So they're both closing in on the, four, uh, on the Ferrari 296 GT3 car for on-track position. They're also fighting each other uh, for class honours as well. Alex Hart looking to the inside then of Radzinski. 
But Radzinski continues to hold off Alex Hart for the time being. Alex Hart, who uh, has quite the YouTube following, some great onboards, including of this very circuit, uh, in a 992 GT3 Cup car such as this. Stefan Radzinski, of course, uh, running in Porsche Carrera Cup North America last year. He's the chosen coach for Demir Hot. And what a great battle this is proving to be as Alex Hart goes to the inside line. But the uh, Canadian racer, Radzinski, just about holding on to it for the time being. Wiebelhaus and Hartling, your top two, 32 seconds apart. So Finn Wiebelhaus is having a very, very good race. In fact, here he comes uh, just behind this battle now. So the race leader uh, having to try and navigate a hard fought Cup 2 battle here. I don't think he's going to get too much uh, leniency uh, from these Cup cars as he tries to navigate his way through. These two guys are far too... Uh, invested in their own fight right now. It looks like Wiebelhaus is maybe between the two of them. Yes, indeed he is, as they run through 12 and 13. Wiebelhaus, oh, goodness me, Alex Hart had a look to the inside there of Stefan Radzinski. This is a battle for 10th overall and 5th in the Cup 2 class, according to my timing screen. Things still shaking out on my timing screen, but I will run you through the order. Uh, as we, well, actually, I won't just yet because I think Alex Hart has got a very good run uh, down the main straight here on Stefan Radzinski. This could be a move for position. Alex Hart in the slipstream. He's got a couple of extra kilometers an hour on Radzinski, I believe. Radzinski has done very limited driving at this circuit in the dry. And Alex Hart, no, yes, just the inside line. It's very close between the lap time performance teammates. But just holding on for now is Radzinski who has a lot less mileage here at Portimao relative to Alex Hart behind him. This could be one of the more fraught Germany. Oh, uh, one, two, eight car in a spin. Benedict Seipt having a moment out there on circuit as we rejoin this battle. Last time I saw a German and a Canadian racing driver going at it uh, in Iberia, it was Jack Villeneuve and Michael Schumacher. I do tell a lie because I wasn't born when they were fighting each other for the World Championship. However, uh, the point still stands. Great to see, uh, again, this international lay of the land that we've got here in GT Winter Series. Two pro drivers going hammer and tongs here uh, for what is uh, ninth and 10th overall, uh, fourth and fifth in the Cup 2 category. Here's your top 10 then as it stands. I dare to try and give it as this battle continues on. It is Finn Wiebelhaus, your race leader, ahead of Jamo Hartling in second place. Leader of Cup 2 is Matthias Lizowski, third overall. Uh, then it is Adrian Lewandowski in P4 uh, in fifth place. And in fact, probably now through into fourth. Uh, is Dan Arrow uh, in the Mercedes AMG GT3. That's now confirmed on the timing screen that Dan Arrow has got through into fourth overall. Dieter Sveps second uh, in the Cup 2 class uh, in sixth overall ahead of Pablo Brass. Then it is Pierre Ellett in the blue and yellow Ferrari you see on screen there. Then it's Radzinski and Hart having this fabulous battle for ninth and tenth overall right now. Your leader in Cup 1 is Matt Griffin uh, in the Ferrari 488 Challenge Evo and that car, of course, herring away. Matt Griffin, I think the only pro uh, assigned to a car in Cup 1. So Matt, uh, Matt Griffin taking the car over from John Dillon, who got the car into the leading class anyway, is always going to disappear up the road in those circumstances. Great battle between Radzinski and Hart then, and this time Alex Hart has surely got it done, but does he get the car stopped? Yes, just about. Stefan Radzinski then has to yield uh, to the number two, but I'm sure he's gonna try and find his way back past if he possibly can. This has been a very entertaining scrap over the last few laps, but uh, Stefan Radzinski, you may remember uh, telling uh, Lukas Gajewski down in the pits during lunch break that uh, he's only done two or three dry laps of Portimao. So uh, going into this endurance race, he's definitely at a deficit. And uh, I know Alex Hart has done many a lap around here in a 992 Cup car. So uh, there is definitely a deficit in terms of performance uh, just because of the circumstances of each driver. And I think now that Alex Hart has gotten through, as you can see, uh, Radzinski 
uh, just doesn't have the, the, the track knowledge, frankly, to, uh, to string together the laps to keep up. But he is trying uh, to maybe study those lines, figure out what's going on, and uh, get some uh, invaluable data uh, from uh, Alex Hart as he follows him along. Of course, uh, Hart will now be pursuing Pierre Ellis, who's just ahead of them in the GT3 uh, Ferrari 296. There's Francesco Lopez making his way through the order in the 72 De Biermacher racing Ferrari, but he is going to go a lap down on the number 11 SR Motorsport Mercedes AMG GT3, the car that sits in second place. Of course, Jamo Hartling uh, had a brilliant fight with Finn Wiebelhaus yesterday in the sprint race but he started the race at a 32 second deficit uh well he is at a 32 second deficit at the moment with finn wiebelhaus and i think that uh, that is obviously quite unassailable uh for him we ride on board with francesco lopez then uh, in the number 72 de biermarker racing machine and uh, while he is a lap down he will continue to see what he can do to make up some more positions. He's got to make up some 22 seconds, though, uh, to catch up to the back of Stefan Radzinski. And I don't know how plausible that is before the end of the race. He is, yes, in a faster GT3 car, but that is also quite a lot of time. Uh, here is the battle for second and third in Cup two, uh, Cup 4, I should say, and the move has already been made because Milos Pavlovic has gotten past uh, Alfredo Hernandez, so the pro driver uh, Alfred, uh, uh, Milos Pavlovich has gotten past there. Now, what is the gap actually between Pavlovich and Lewandowski? It's probably something in the range of 40 seconds, so I don't see that being made up in the time that we've got left. But nonetheless, uh, Pavlovich really setting a searing pace in the all carbon Lamborghini Huracan Super Trofeo. All of our Super Trofeo cars in the Evo 2 spec, that's the very latest iteration of the Lamborghini Huracan. Uh, Super Trofeo machine, a car that's been active uh, in racing in the uh, in the single make series, I believe, since 2015. I think that was the first year of the Huracan after the Gallardo was superseded. Your top three, all Mercedes AMG GT3 Evos then, because uh, obviously our race leader, Finn Wiebelhaus, Leads the way, SR Motorsports, J-Mo Hartling in second. As we see uh, the Francesco Lopez car continuing to put some laps on others. And Dan Arrow is a distant third place, about 34 seconds back from second uh, in the good speed racing. A Mercedes AMG GT3. Of course, Finn Wiebelhaus uh, with this nice cushion that he's uh, built for himself. He would uh, dearly love to, uh, to continue on uh, unabated. The one thing that would be uh, a real fly in his ointment would be a safety car at this stage because there's two pro drivers behind him in the form of Dan Arrow uh, and J-Mo Hartling and uh, that would suddenly get things very, very interesting indeed if there were a pause but everyone minding their P's and Q's in this race right now. A 142.297 uh, is the current uh, fastest lap of the race belonging to Finn Wiebelhaus uh, in the Mercedes AMG GT3. So he is really on it. Uh, we have had another penalty applied, another five seconds added uh, to the track limits uh, or to the uh, to the time of the number 30 car. So uh, Milos Pavlovich, while he's going very quickly uh, in the Lamborghini Huracan, the bare carbon fiber car. He is also apparently exceeding track limits, which is getting him in some trouble. Uh, Lewandowski has been relatively clean so far in this race. Don't think there's anything applied to him. He does have a warning flag for track limits, but uh, warning flags for track limits are frankly part and parcel at uh, grade one circuits like this uh, with lots of tarmac runoff. He runs fourth overall. Where's Matthias Lizowski? Very close behind him is the answer. So the battle for fourth overall. Also the battle between the Cup 4 and Cup 2 leaders uh, is getting very close indeed. Lewandowski and Lizowski, uh, fourth and fifth place. There's the Lamborghini. Just behind is the Porsche. Uh, so they've got another Porsche just ahead of them. But there is fourth and fifth place. Uh, the striped white Porsche pursuing 
uh, the Lamborghini Huracan. Now, what was the relative pace between them last time? Actually, it was slightly quicker as a lap for uh, Lewandowski. So Matthias Lewandowski uh, a little bit slower right now uh, than Adrian Lewandowski, but it is a very close scrap for fourth and fifth place nonetheless. And obviously, uh, Matthias Lewandowski is a pro driver. He knows what he's doing. He's won championships in GT3s. He's won championships in single make saloon car racing. Uh, Adrian Lewandowski is a quick driver, but he's certainly not a professional driver. And, uh, well, it's going to be compelling to see whether Lewandowski can uh, maybe reel in the Lamborghini, which is probably a second or two quicker on paper uh, over the course of uh, the remaining distance in this race. Last lap across the line for Jamo Hartling was a 142.665. That's his quickest lap of the race so far. Uh, within half a second, the fastest lap we've seen from Finn Wiebelhaus in this one. So those two looking fairly evenly matched. And that's great to see Jamo Hartling proving just how quick he can be. And uh, not losing much time at all to Finn Wiebelhaus over the course of this stint. And obviously there's a lot of... Uh, uh, eyes on Wiebelhaus. You saw Manuel Reuter down there uh, mentoring the youngster. Haupt Racing Team have put their backing behind him as well. That's a driver uh, with a lot of promise and a lot of backing. And uh, Jamo Hartling is doing a great job of showing why he too is a GT Racing star of the future. Looks as though Lewandowski, though, uh, has control over this battle for fourth and fifth place, doesn't it? Then Lewandowski not quite able to... Uh, string together the same pace, although lap traffic not helping. I wonder if now that he's in a bit more clear air for the next lap or so, he might just uh, start to reel in the Lambo once again. Your order then with just over 10 minutes to go. Hout Racing Team's Finn Wiebelhaus ahead by a little under 35 seconds, Dan Arrow in third place overall in that Mercedes-AMG GT3 Evo. Then it's Adrian Lewandowski, Matthias Lizowski in fifth place, Rakar Motorsports, Dieter Sveps in sixth place and second within the Cup 2 class. Then it's Pablo Brass, then it's Alex Hart, uh, Pierre Ellett in ninth overall, fourth among the GT3s. Then it's Radzinski in tenth position and the uh, next car is Francesco Lopez in the fifth place car within GT3, running 11th overall ahead of Milos Pavlovich. In fact, that's a good little scrap going on at the moment uh, through the first couple of corners of the lap. Uh, Milos Pavlovich, uh, along with Francesco Lopez. I think Lopez has just gotten past him out on the circuit. There is Dan Arrow in the number 14 Mercedes-AMG GT3. Matt Griffin just ahead of him on the road. And Matt Griffin is Lamborghini hunting at the moment because Alfredo Hernandez is just ahead of him. This is for 13th and 14th positions in the overall standings. This is the Cup 1 leading car, the fastest of the Ferrari 488 Challenge Evo machines. Matt Griffin setting a great pace at the wheel of this car. Of course, Griffin, a British GT champ, a driver that has been a uh, vastly deployed Ferrari driver uh, over the course of the last 20 or so years, although I don't think his Ferrari team quite started 20 years ago, but uh, regardless, he has been uh, a hugely uh, strong component in the Ferrari GT arsenal for a very long time and uh, has also been around John Dillon for a very long time as well. And uh, Certainly Matt Griffin looking here for a way past the Lamborghini and surges up through the hill. Turn eight, turn nine, Dan Arrow behind them. And that's the car in third place. So of course, they are also lap traffic while they are battling. Matt Griffin goes one side of the gold Lamborghini and uh, Dan Arrow goes the other side of the gold Lamborghini. So uh, everyone gets their way, uh, except for perhaps uh, the Lamborghini driver, uh, Alfredo Hernandez. Nonetheless, Matt Griffin through uh, into 13th overall. So Griffin doing a great job in the 151. Dan Arrow also doing very well uh, in that Mercedes AMG GT3 Evo, the spectacularly liveried purple and pink car uh, that has been uh, the apple of many a photographer's eye this weekend. Uh, Flashbulbs seem to follow it <laughs> uh, around this circuit. 
Finn Wiebelhaus a 142.070 last time by. So fastest lap of the race. Uh, only driver currently in the 42s out there on the circuit as it stands. We have had 42s from both Dan Arrow uh, and Jamo Hartling though. But as in terms of current lap times, Wiebelhaus by far the fastest out there. Seven minutes and 20 seconds left to run. And uh, certainly Wiebelhaus is not uncontested, but uh, well clear. Uh, very much being contested though is the battle for third in Cup 2. Uh, having dispatched Pierre Ellett in the GT3 Ferrari, uh, Alex Hart is now trying to find a way past Pablo Brass. He's really on the move. Pablo uh, sideways there uh, through turn 14 as well. That was some rather lovely car control out of the 951, but uh, Alex Hart won't be minding any of that. He says, go, by all means, cook your rear tyres. I'm going to find a way past, if I possibly can, this for the Cup 2 class podium, which you would certainly be keen to stand on, along with co-driver Marco Dedelov, of course. 951 car, a solo-driven entry. Pablo Brass alone at the wheel of this car. They power through turn four. GT3 car just behind them. I'm sure Pierre Ellett, if given half an opportunity, uh, will uh, have a look to the inside and have a go as well. But here comes Alex Hart. He's got the inside line once again into turn five. And in what was almost a carbon copy of the move he made on Stefan Radzinski, he is now through into third in class. Very good move then by the number two driver, Alex Hart, up to P3 in class. He's got uh, some 20 seconds between himself and Dieter Sveps in second. And uh, Dieter actually lapping nominally quicker uh, than the number two as well, so I don't expect that to change. Uh, meanwhile, we saw their two DT3 cars line astern, but that is uh, Pierre Ellett going a lap down potentially here on Jamo Hartling, who presses on hard uh, in the... Uh, Mercedes AMG GT3. Just having a look to the inside there, and Pierre Ellis, I think, realizing that isn't actually his battle to fight and uh, allows the number 11 car through. Powering then through turn 15 is the AMG GT3. And uh, again, Jamo Hartling looking almost as impressive as Finn Wiebelhaus, of course. Hartling with uh, a lot more GT experience in general, but his first races in a GT3 car came last weekend here in the GT Winter Series at Estoril. And here comes Pierre Ellett up the inside there, potentially of Pablo Brass. And oh, there was a moment there, Pablo Brass in a spin. And was that a forced error or an unforced error, if you catch my drift? Uh, the 951 car, Pablo Brass, in a spin there. Pierre Ellett was having a look to the inside. Meanwhile, the 11 car puts a lap on the number two. Alex Hart goes a lap down on Jamo Hartling. But, uh, well, Pierre Ellett is through into uh, eighth place. However, was that, uh, was that uh, without contact? Maybe it was. I mean, it's quite possible uh, that uh, Pablo Brass just lost the rear end at turn one. Pierre Ellett's car doesn't look like it's carrying damage, so perhaps it was just an overcook uh, from the 951 driver. There he is, he's rejoined just ahead of the 72, actually. Uh, so Francesco Lopez, I think has gained some company there in the 72 De Biermarker Racing Ferrari 488 GT3. Uh, so let's wait and see that battle, see where they've come out. Uh, we're just about to see that, but uh, uh, there is the number uh, 72 car. It's a little bit further back on the track, but uh, I think probably Francesco Lopez has made strides towards the top 10. I think he'll be running 11th at the moment. Uh, nonetheless, here comes Alex Hart, uh, but he's losing a drag race to Motohiko Isasaki at the moment down the main straight. Isasaki is a lap down uh, on the number two car, but uh, Isasaki on his last attempt to go up and down here at the uh, Autodrome International Algarve uh, in this GT Win Series weekend, giving it everything he can. 
So Lopez has gotten past Pablo Brass. His next target uh, is Milos uh, Pavlovic. There is Lopez, and actually just a few seconds ahead of him as well is a great battle between Pavlovic and Radzinski. They'll be heading down to turn five, the hairpin at the moment. Pavlovic all uh, getting ever closer to Radzinski, who of course again for lap time performance is running uh, fourth in class right now. Here is Pierre Elliott. And then just behind them is the battle for uh, position between Radzinski and Milos Pavlovich. We'll see them come over the hill now. There they are. Uh, so the all-carbon Lamborghini in the hands of Pavlovich is maybe going to make a move for P9. However, he does have a 10-second penalty looming over his head. Nonetheless, Radzinski is overtaken there. The Lamborghini usually a little bit quicker than a Porsche 992 Cup car uh, with pro, pro drivers at the wheel, and that's proving to be true. Pavlovich, probably the quickest non-GT3 out there at the moment, albeit while exploring the track limits a little excessively uh, in the eyes of the stewards. It's going to be the penultimate lap of the race then. Uh, for Finn Wiebelhaus in the Mercedes AMG GT3. Uh, he's not got too much time to savour Portimao before the end of this race. And just ahead of him is Adrian Lewandowski uh, in the fourth place car overall. So that shows you really just how fast uh, Finn Wiebelhaus has been across this race distance. Wiebelhaus has been exemplary at the wheel of the Haupt Racing Team. Mercedes AMG. He has been contending with the traffic very well indeed, and there's a lot of it for a, a fast GT3 driver in the GT Winter Series, and he has been uh, just carving his way through without any real hassle. He's got another 45 seconds left to go. That means one more rotation of the 4.665 kilometer Autodromo Internationale do Algarve. It will be a second win in two days as long as he can complete this one last lap uh, of the Autodromo Internationale do Algarve. Here he comes then towards the first corner for what will be the final time. Just scanning up and down the timing screen to see if there's any other close battles out there. No, I think it has pretty much all calmed down uh, at this stage. So we'll follow Finn Wiebelhaus on this final lap of the race. He has been exemplary. Uh, in this one. And I'm sure Manuel Reuter is going to uh, put some uh, ticks on his report card as he reports back to uh, uh, Mr. Haupt and the uh, the rest of the team as they prepare this young man, Finn Wiebelhaus, for the uh, for the ADAC GT Masters program that we understand he'll be competing in in 2024. Up and over the crest at turn eight, he goes for the final time. Still setting scintillating pace out there on circuit. As it must be said, is J-Mo Hartling, who uh, just set a 42-3 last time by. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of impressive stuff from our youngsters in the GT3s at the sharp end of the pack. We're also seeing the odd penalty, uh, car two, track limits. So unfortunately, Alex Hart has gained himself a penalty that will most likely put him back behind Pierre Ellett in the overall order right at the end of the race. However, none of that concerns Finn Wiebelhaus. He's kept it within the white lines. He's kept driving at a sensational rate using that Mercedes AMG GT3 like the very sharp tool that it is. A race win for Finn Wiebelhaus for the second time today in the GT Winter Series. He laps everyone from fourth place back on his way to victory, including some big names and some fast cars. Uh, second place, J-Mo Hartling will be running through the last couple of corners of the lap and Hartling and higher. Uh, I believe will continue to be championship leaders uh, in, or will come out as championship leaders in the GT Winter Series after this weekend. Uh, if my maths is serving me correctly, very provisional commentator maps, uh, maths there. Uh, Lizovsky has crossed the line to win Cup 2 ahead of Dieter Sveps. Uh, and there is the second place car across the line. Good effort from Jamo Hartling and uh, Kenneth Heyer who started the race. 
Third place will go to Dan Arrow. He's due across the line in about 37 seconds. Alex Hart will round out the rostrum in Cup 2, albeit I think he'll lose a couple of overall positions because of his time penalties. Uh, the Autosport racing car of Milos Pavlovich is due to lose a couple of places as well, but he takes second in the Cup 4 class. Matahiko Isazaki crosses the line. Pablo Brass crosses the line just ahead of our third place car, uh, Dan Arrow. Matt Griffin, one of the last cars to uh, cross the line then. He will win the Cup 1 class. He'll be the only car uh, on the same lap as himself. So uh, uh, the car in second in Cup 1, uh, Motohiko Isazaki, will be timed a lap down. So Griffin doing his job, pulling away and building upon the lead that John Dillon gave him. Uh, John Dillon, as he said to me, you know what, I'm here for fun, and I'm sure he's had fun this weekend. Maybe not during the week when the conditions were a little less uh, photogenic here at uh, Portimao. However, the sun has shone on this racing weekend. It'll be the top step for Griffin and Dillon uh, in Cup 1 for the Ferrari Challenge cars. So then, Finn Wiebelhaus soaks in the applause from our spectators here uh, in the stands at the Autodroma Internacional del Algarve. Make sure you stay on for the podium ceremonies and cheer this young man onto the podium. He has had a fabulous day in the sun here at the Autodroma Internacional del Algarve and uh, he has uh, taken two wins in the same day on his first weekend in GT3 and that is certainly something worth celebrating for he, for the Haupt Motorsport, uh, for the Haupt Racing team. Uh, the marshal there realising, oh, that's the race winner, lets him through uh, towards the Weybridge. Of course, uh, our esteemed colleague Lukas Gajewski will be there uh, and waiting for him. I see our... Gielik Racing Physiotherapist in the back of shot as well. Thank you for fixing my back earlier in the week, sir. Thumbs up, he gives, as, uh, as he can clearly hear me. Uh, but uh, there you go. Finn Wiebelhaus pulls up to the uh, front of our shot, to the P1 sign. And uh, certainly, he has been number one this weekend in the GT Winter Series. However... This man, Jamo Hartling, has proven to be every bit as promising at the wheel of a GT3 car as he gets used to the ultimate GT racing machines of the current era. And I suspect that both of these youngsters are going to be forces to be reckoned with indefinitely uh, in the future within GT racing. Jamo Hartling uh, is a little bit older, 21 years of age. Uh, but uh, still a lot of time for his career to blossom, and I'm sure it's going to uh, in the years to come. Finn Wiebelhaus celebrating along with Haupt Racing Team. Another flawless performance for him. Uh, there is Lukas Gajewski getting a handshake as well. Everyone at Haupt getting their plaudits from Finn Wiebelhaus, who seems like a genuinely respectful young man for his team as well. And... Uh, having a little discussion here with his team in German. And uh, of course we will get a discussion with Finn Wiebelhaus in English with Lukas Gajewski. And I'm sure Lukas will sprinkle a little bit of German in there as well for those of you watching uh, from Finn Wiebelhaus's neck of the woods. 32 laps completed then for our race winner uh, in that one. And uh, a 36 second deficit to second place uh, in the overall standings. An all GT3 podium then overall with Dan Arrow in third place. Adrian Lewandowski winning the Cup 4 class for the Lamborghinis in fourth overall. Matthias Lizowski finishing fifth ahead of Dieter Spetz and Alex Hart in the Cup 2 category. Uh, well, Autosport Racing demoted to 10th place eventually because of the track limits penalties. Eighth on the road at least. Uh, a few other penalties further down the order. Uh, Pierre Ellett in the 115 Ferrari 296 uh, will have finished in ninth place, eighth place in the final classifications, and he'll be ahead of Francesco Lopez in the 488 GT3. Stefan Radzinski getting to grips at long last with Dry Portimao after not really getting the chance to do so. Uh, he finished ahead of Pablo Brass. Matt Griffin, of course, winning in Cup 1. Alfredo Hernandez, uh, third of the Lamborghinis. Uh, he got uh, a few... Uh, fights in there during the race as well. Hubert Dometko taking the 7 PTT racing car across the line in 15th. Morton Stromstead 
Motohiko Isasaki, Talal Shir, Pedro Miguel Gras, Benedict Seipt, and Pedro Silvero rounding out our finishing order. 21 cars taking the start, 21 cars finishing the race in the GT Winter Series. Nice, consistent driving from all parties then, albeit sometimes slightly without, uh, slightly without their track limits in check. But Lukas Gajewski is down, and we can go and talk to him now with Finn Wiebelhaus. Your winner in race three here in Portimao, just as well, Finn Wiebelhaus. Congratulations, herzlichen Glückwunsch once again. What a day for you there, Finn. Yeah, it was a quite a good day, considering P1 and P1. It was very nice. The car was brilliant. The guys made a great job on setting the car up and it's perfect. It was just fun to drive. You spent almost an hour in a GT3 car. You don't even look sweaty. Nah, it's it's fine. Like We have a, like, a fan to like air, but I forgot to turn it on, so it was even hotter, but I guess it's fine. Yeah, you have to be fit, so it's fine. And Manuel Reuter told us earlier that we might see you for uh, some remaining rounds in GT Winter Series. Can you already tell us about the circuits of your choice? I'm not sure if I can, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 I can, but I, I'm not telling you yet, but I will be here again, it's true. That's good news for us and uh, bad news for the competition, I'm afraid. Your two-time winner here in Portimao, Finn Wiebelhaus. Thank you very much. Thank you. So then, Finn Wiebelhaus there, keeping a little bit um, close-guarded there saying, uh, no, I, uh, I think I'm going to keep my cards close to chest for the time being. Um, so that's uh, great to see uh, that he'll be back anyway. We just don't know where, we don't know when uh, as of yet. Um, We'll have to wait and see. Uh, answers on a postcard. Which circuit do you think would be the, the closest for data uh, to ADAC GT Masters calendar events in terms of the Spanish circuits we go to next, of course. Still four rounds of the season to come. Two in Feb, two in March. Uh, those being uh, Jerez and Valencia in February. Then Aragon and Barcelona to complete the Spanish tour for the Winter Series paddocks, of course. Next time we join you with Racing Action, we'll have the Formula cars in place of the prototypes, and all four championships will uh, conclude their season at uh, Barcelona in just a few weeks' time. Ultimately, we're not too far away. Uh, this season goes through thick and fast, uh, as do the podiums with our uh, Master of Ceremonies, Chris McCarthy at the helm. Of course, uh, I'm sure Chris is currently in the process of, uh, once again, uh, getting drivers to the podium, which is uh, an inordinate task at times. Uh, that's even when you've got one podium. He's got how many? One, two, three, four, five to contend with? Yeah, good luck, Chris. <laughs> Stefan Lehner and uh, Mart Hilgenberg and the rest of uh, the... Gidlik Racing crew are probably helping him with that process, though, um, I'm sure, as, uh, as they make their way up to the podium for the final time. The celebrations will kick off in earnest in the paddock before our teams and our drivers regroup ahead of the racing that is to come. It has been uh, another brilliant day of action in the Winter Series categories. I'm sure you can agree. Uh, and with a category like the GT Winter Series, there's always a battle on track. There's uh, so much going on with all these different types of race car on the go at one time. Uh, an interesting note to say that uh, the number two, that's Alex Hart, his track limits penalty was cancelled ultimately. So uh, he will retain is uh, third in the Cup 2 class. So uh, that will be a, a positive note uh, for Alex Hart to go home on uh, sharing that car, of course, with Marco Dedelov, the uh, number two uh, lap time performance Porsche Cup car, the 992 spec cup machine. Good to see a 991 back out there as well in the hands of Morten Stromstead, who really did pedal it well uh, for Sunder Motorworks. Uh, Morton Stromstead uh, sounds like he's going to be back. It sounds like he might bring his uh, talented son along as well. So that could be another compelling addition to the Winter Series grid. The GT Winter Series grid always uh, seems to grow, ebb and flow. And uh, one thing we never lack on the grid is talent. And it's always so exciting uh, to come to the circuit, get the entry list and see what we've got in store this coming weekend. 
And, uh, of course, we will be doing it all again in just two or three weeks. Still a celebration to come uh, for the podiums, though. And uh, we look forward to uh, bringing you that. I think myself and Lucas are set to join Chris McCarthy up there as well to wrap up the weekend. And uh, we'll talk about... Uh, I guess I think I think Chris is going to do it again. Ask me who I think my driver of the day is. I haven't thought about it again. We'll we'll, uh, we'll, we'll freestyle it. We'll see what happens. <laughs> and of course, I've got to worry about Lucas taking my answers this time too. Uh, but uh, the, the racing today in the GT4s especially was fabulous once again. That GT4 Wind Series is a fabulous addition uh, to our paddock. The GT Wind Series always prov proving itself to be. Uh, a smorgasbord of GT machinery as well. And uh, then, of course, the prototypes with that handicap system uh, in the pit stops always sees exciting moves, lots of overtaking, lots of bedlam uh, in the second phase of the race. And as the sun sets on Portimao, I'm sure our fans here in this crowd uh, are going to be very happy with the action they saw, all free of charge, of course. And if you do live near Jerez, Valencia, Aragon, or Barcelona. Don't forget, there's plentiful opportunity to come along for free, see these cars up close and personal, meet some drivers, have some conversations, and generally get up close and personal with motorsport at a time of year where usually it's fairly scarce in this part of the world. And that is uh, one of the modus operandi of the Winter Series package, certainly. Uh, the fact that we do go racing at this time of year. Um, if you were here earlier in the week, you can agree that maybe it didn't look quite as summery as we we're all hoping. But uh, across Saturday and Sunday, we have had nothing but sunshine, nothing but dry weather. And uh, that has been absolutely fabulous for drivers, for fans, for personnel alike. And uh, it really is a reminder of why this Winter Series concept works so well. Uh, the fact that we get this gorgeous weather even so early in the calendar year uh, when we come to somewhere like Port Tamau. Of course, about as far south of, in Portugal as you can get here uh, on the Algarve. And uh, we are not going to stray too far north, at least in terms of the main European map, saying within Spain from here on out in the Winter Series calendar. Lots of other Giedlich Racing events for the crew to contend with between now and the next racing in Jerez, be it endless summer track days, be it race tests at uh, various circuits as well. However, it's time to focus on the Winter Series one more time as we now have our podiums. Thank you, Adam. Yes, uh, we have got one more podium to do uh, here at Portimao, that the GT Winter Series Endurance Race. Uh, the final race of the day, and I think it delivered in action. Thank you to those of you around the grandstand uh, who have stayed uh, to uh, watch the celebrations. Thanks to those of you uh, in the pit lane as well. Uh, before we begin the celebrations, and we're going to do so very quickly, starting with our Cup 1 drivers, as a couple of them have a flight to catch very quickly. Uh, I think it's... Uh, important uh, we've uh, had a big team uh, of marshals safety team around the circuit uh, who have uh, been hard at work at times this weekend a big crew uh, of Giedlick racing team uh, the alpha life crew have been out there filming it all for us i think it's important we give a, a big round of applause to all the marshals uh, all the safety team everyone here at portimao uh, who's made this meeting happen so uh, can we put our hands together for everyone uh, who's put this meeting together Round of applause to all the team here at Portimao who's helped put the meeting together. All the crew here. All the team at Portimao who've put the meeting together. Can we have a round of applause for them? Thank you. Thank you. I know you can't hear me down there too well. I'll, I'll try my best. And I, I, I want that going off as much as possible as well. <laughs> Right, okay, uh, let's uh, let's get this going then. All right, cup one coming out. First of all, we're going to move through this one quickly, uh, starting with third place, number 220, Talal Sher. All three teams from AF Corsa, who had a very successful day, finishing just up the road, was number 105, Motohiko Isosaki.
and winning in the Cup 1 at Ferrari class was number 151, John Dillon and Matt Griffin. Well done, guys. We'll get the trophies in, the pictures taken, and I know the guys need to rush off, so we will speak to them at the next round. I'm sure we will have plenty more opportunities to do that. They have a flight to catch. We will see them at Hereth, the next round, uh, coming up very, very shortly in just a few weeks' time, the 10th and 11th. Uh, of February is when we go racing for that. Thank you very much, guys. I know you have to shoot, so uh, we will let you uh, shoot off, uh, get a safe trip home and a safe trip back to the next round. Congratulations, guys. Uh, okay, let's go uh, to uh, GT3 uh, then next. Uh, we had a fantastic racing. Well done, Motohiko. <laughs> Loving the celebrations. Okay, let's get the champagne in. Uh, we're going to go to GT3 now. Uh, finishing in third place uh, was the number 14, Piotr Vera and Dan Arrow. Good speed racing drivers finishing in third place. Well done. And they've had a fantastic day and a fantastic weekend across the classes. Finishing in second was number 11, Jamo Hartling and Kenneth Heyer. Well done, guys. We're taking the win for the Haupt Racing Team was number four, Finn Wiebelhaus. Well done, Finn. Great job. Let's get the trophies uh, presented. We'll get some pictures taken. We are against the clock, so we can only grab a very quick word with our winner, and then we're going to have to move on to our next category. So, Finn, we'll grab one very quick word for you, and then we'll let you guys celebrate. You can start prepping for that. Uh, I'm sure you spoke a little bit about the race down there, but looking forward to the next round now. Uh, Hereth, have you driven there much before? Uh, I'm not sure if I drive the whole season, but uh, we will see. You're going to drive. Just say you're going to drive, aren't you? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, you are. You are, really. Okay, guys, you can celebrate now. Let's go for it. Let's get the champagne spade in the GT Winter Series here at Portimao. Who's going to be out first? It's going to be the Good Speed Racing Team who make all the mess first here at Portimao. <laughs> Team Schnitzel Ham also going for it. A <laughs> winner just a little bit behind. Congratulations, guys. Thank you to all of you for staying for celebrations. Plenty more still to come. We're going to go Cup 2 uh, next. <laughs> Finn Wiebelhaus getting revenge. <laughs> save, save it for the team. Save it for the team. <laughs> They've been doing the hard work. Well done, guys. Well done. We'll leave you to celebrate with your team. Very well deserved, a hard uh, endurance race. It was a fantastic one to watch. Well done to all of you. Let's reset and go again uh, because we have Cup 2 uh, now uh, coming up uh, next. We're going to go to uh, uh, the top three in Cup 2. Uh, finishing in third place was number two, Marco Dadlow and Alex Hart. The lap time performance team finishing in third place. Let's get them out. The Porsche is always putting on a fantastic show for us. They've been brilliant to watch all weekend. Finishing in second was the Rakar drivers, number 911, Leandro Martins and Dieter Sveps. Well done, guys. We spoke to them earlier. Brilliant to have them with us and now on the top step. And they've been busy this weekend. Plenty of cars with us racing. And they finished the weekend on the top step. Our winners, number 13, PTT Racing, Mateusz Lizowski. <laughs> Did it on his own. No teammates needed. But he had a big team behind him, as you can hear. We're going to get the trophies in. And we're going to speak to Mateusz. Hopefully, you guys can hear us. Sorry if you can't hear us too much down there. We don't have much speakers down now, I don't think so. Well, we will speak to you. Let's get in, guys, and get some pictures taken. And we're going to speak to our winners before we go to Cup 3. 
Okay, Mateus, Mateus, you guys get ready to you guys get ready to make a mess. Uh, Mateus, do you want to say a few words to your team? Yeah, my team is amazing. All the time we are doing a really good job. It is my second family. So thank you for the car. Thank you guys. You are amazing. Make some noise, guys. And on that, make some mess, guys. Go for it. Let's go. Cup two celebrating on the podium. <laughs> That's it. Come on, Mateus. Come on, Mateus. This is it's going to go on, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying. We can do it. Have you actually have you broke the bottle? <laughs> you can take it with you. You can take it with you still. More, more to have with the team. More to have it. Wait till you get down there and then just spray those guys. Well done, guys. Well done, guys. Well done, Cup 2. Okay, let's get straight on to Cup 3. Another Porsche driver. Uh, great to have him with us this round. We saw him on the top step earlier. He's back again. Winning in Cup 3, number 32, Morton Stromstead. Come on, Morton. Yes. Well done, Morton. Give a round of applause, everyone. Straight on the top step, and you got some champagne this time. Let's get a trophy in. Gielig Racing. Mark's going to come and present the trophy to Morton Stromstead. Great to have him uh, with us here at racing. Are we going to are we going to celebrate now with the champagne? Are we going to celebrate with the champagne, Morton? Yeah, we we deserve it, I think. Let's see. Let's do it. You, you can. You, I tell you, you can spray some of the crowd down there. I think we got some, we got some of the got some of the marshals down there. Let's properly go for it. Here we go. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> Bro, that was great work, Morton. Now I hope we see you come back. I hope we see you come back with Noah as well later in the season. That'll be absolutely fantastic. Really great to have you. You're back next round. I hope so. Barcelona, Barcelona, back for Barcelona. Perfect. That's a great track to choose as well. Well done, Morton Stromstead. Okay, let's finish with our Lamborghini drivers, our Cup Four uh, drivers. Finishing in third place in that one was number one seven seven, Alfredo Hernandez. BDR competition driver Alfredo uh, Hernandez is on his way. He's being directed out by Adam Weller. Well done, Alfredo. Great drive all, all weekend. It's been great to have him out on the podium, and they sound absolutely fabulous, don't they, those cars? Uh, finishing in second place was the number 30 of Alessio Ruffini and Milos Pavlovich. Well, the guys loving the shades. They look absolutely fabulous, by the way. Well done. And on, on the drive as well. The drive was also good. Uh, but taking the win once again, just like he did earlier, was number six GT3 Poland driver, Adrian Lewandowski. <laughs> Going to be running out of things to say now. Well done, guys. Let's get the trophies in. I'm, I'm going to speak to Alfredo this time uh, because I think I was informed it might be. It, I think we'll, I think Adam told me about. about we'll, we'll speak to we'll speak to Alfredo uh, this time. Ah, but well, well done, guys. We've we've. Uh, let's make a mess, guys. I mean, we spoke to Adrian a few times already, so let's just let him get on with it. <laughs> they're gonna, they're gonna absolutely go for it. <laughs> well done, guys. Well done. The uh, <laughs> Cup Four drivers have probably made the biggest mess of anyone. Well done. Well done, Adrian. Uh, we're, uh, we're gonna see you back next round. Sorry. We're gonna see you back again next round. Yeah, in Harris. Yeah, I will come back with my father. So yeah, for sure. We're gonna spray some more champagne. There. I hope so. <laughs> Good stuff. Well done. Well done, guys. That's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, thanks to everyone who, uh, who joined us here for this round. Thanks to all of you uh, down in the pit lane as well. Uh, and thanks to these two gentlemen uh, here who are now going to join me on the podium. Uh, I, I would say jump up on here, but it's a, a tad slippy. Uh, oh, uh, there we go. Uh, we've got... Uh, don't forget the trophy. Don't forget the trophy. It's quite important. Uh, people uh, forget the <laughs> often take the champagne uh let's uh, ju jump in guys jump in uh, uh i'm gonna oh, oh what's that you've got there my spice cookies from this morning 
It's not very Christmassy weather anymore, but I think it's time, isn't it, after a long day? <laughs> Guys, so, but, uh, as, as a, a way to wrap this up, I'm going to put one question to you both, and then we're going to, we, we, I think this is a way to conclude it. I think I'm putting you on the spot here, Lucas. <laughs> Adam knows what's coming. Uh, I want you both to give me uh, a driver that stood out to you most I in each category. Uh, let's start. Let's start with GT4 first, shall we? Okay. okay. okay well, that's going to be tricky for me. GT4. Oh, you know what? I'm going to give it to Mikey Porter. Uh, his first win in a GT4 car uh, just earlier on, and uh, that is a big deal for him. Uh, obviously sharing with Jamie Day once again, Fassetti doing a great job, and yeah, I'll give it to Mikey. Mikey Porter. Uh, what about yourself, Lucas? I'm going to give it to Franz Linden, uh, because there is a huge amount of respect, I think, uh, for... I mean, he's been in racing cars for quite some time, but it's something entirely new to do it in a competitive way, and with so many other cars around him, with so much at stake, I mean, we're fighting for a championship title, for championship points. Hats off to him. Well done. Uh, let's go. Well, let's go. Prototypes next, uh, shall we? Uh, we'll go to prototypes next. Um, what about prototypes? Okay, I think uh, for this one, has to be Pedro Perino, really, doesn't it? After the day that he had on Saturday, uh, qualifying accident, going to hospital, getting checked, doing blood work and everything else, coming back, being the quickest car out there towards the end of the race, finishing second. I don't think it gets any better than that. That's a true pro's pro, where you can jump back in after that and go, okay, I can do it. In agreement? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 think, I, I, I don't think you cannot disagree. Uh, okay, GT Winter Series, uh, GTs. Oh, this is the one I haven't given the least thought to. That's a bad sign, isn't it? Uh, okay, I am gonna have to. I'm gonna have to go with Finn, aren't I? I mean, Finn Wiebelhaus in his first weekend uh, in a GT3 car. I don't like to go for the front runners as much as I am on these kind of questions, um, but yeah, you know, he did amazing. Uh, first weekend doesn't get any better than what he was doing, and we know he's gonna come back for a couple of races, and I think we're gonna see a lot of progression there. And yourself, Lucas? Uh, well, from a competitive point of view, of course, I'm with that. However, I think it's uh, quite subjective as well, isn't it? And I'm going to go for uh, Piotr Vera. Vera because uh, in race two, we went to their pit box uh, after he DNF'd because of the loose wheel nut. And although he had just, he, he just retired, he was incredibly happy. Uh, smiles, shaking hands with everybody in the pit box because he was just enjoying his time so much in this car, on this circuit, in this package and I think that's fantastic to see isn't it? I think a nice way to summarise oh, yeah. can, we, can we get an additional award in? Can, go we, for it. can we have broadcaster of the day and it has to go to Lukas Gajewski for his incredible prop budget. He had an umbrella yesterday, he had cookies this morning uh, he had some green and blue stuff as well, I'll eat the cookie too yeah sure, I mean I mean, he's dedicated man, it's crazy Absolutely, but I, I, will, take, I will take one and on that note because uh, we uh, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny wants to have one as well, he had a slight <laughs> race he had a slight racing incident earlier which I won't say any more of <laughs> <laughs> I see a cover ringer. Right, uh, next time out at Jerez, we're also going to have this here as well, the Formula Winter Series. Uh, so make sure you join us 10th and 11th of February. Until then, from all of us here, it's goodbye. Cheers. <laughs>